Yeah, the defending champion Alex Barthes is taking the start. And uh, if you look at the uh, list of riders on him, you see the most prolific winner of a recent time is Lizzie Armistead, as was Lizzie Dining, as she is now. And uh, she, of course, uh, put in uh, some uh, great performances. And we've just seen her win the very first Harry Roubaix for women. That's uh, our own form of rider in the women's bunch at the moment is Henderson. She's shown she can climb in the past, so she is a uh, real fit. The moment that has a whole season of riding uh, top continental level, really is a rider on the up and up, taking that win in Tilby. And uh, it'd be a great first new bet because it may well be that the uh, Cobble Boys final will just see who's going to take on. Uh, we saw uh, a couple of riders at Liz Dixon. Uh, in particular, choosing not to ride a uh, rider who may well have uh, got one of the tricks, choosing to focus on uh, the race this time round. We've got lots of riders in there. So, plenty of uh, riders on that. If you go back far enough, uh, there are lots of uh, really big names going right the way back. People like uh, Sarah Burton and Val Rushworth back in the 50s and 60s. A blast from the past. So the uh, runners on the way to convoy on its way. A quick reminder, please, you're just joining us somewhere up on the hill up in the square. Uh, out on the, it's going to go out on the circuit. Please make sure you stay out of the way for riders and the team cars as they come through. That's particularly true if you've got a brolly or a selfie stick. They are the prime candidates to get caught up in a bike wheel and of course uh, problems will get caught on a roof rack. So when the vehicles come in, just please be very careful, guys, as uh, they make their way in to the circuit. Our lap board showing eight laps go to that is exactly how many laps our riders are doing in the women's race. Eight to seven laps of the eight of the mile circuit so it's uh, going to uh, be the circuit you <laughs> so if you are beyond the finishing line please guys make sure you stay well clear uh, first of our vehicles on the way of our uh, group So our uh, riders of the race are convoy up and rolling. They are confirmed on the way to get you know, uh, double check on that confirmation. So the riders are rolling the way and down to the stairs. Big thank you to all of our race HQ throughout the course of the four days of competition from Kilby Vigil right the way out to today. We're over at the school on the east side of Lincoln. So our riders of the race convoy now up and rolling. They're all in order hopefully there'll be a little bit of shuffling as they make their way out on the neutralized section so nobody's allowed to race nobody's allowed to attack nobody's allowed to get uh, any advantage until the riders actually have left the square and gone out on circuit right the way over until they cross the bypass and head out over the bridge and out towards Burton. I give you an indication of uh, just how frantic it should be because nobody wants them out of racing uh, when they're coming out on the initial start. So it's give the riders time to get uh, themselves sorted to find out where the teammates are. The same is true of the convoy cars. All of our team cars have a number uh, stuck on them. That is their uh, allocation. So if they have a number one, that means there's a number one car in the convoy from the team, then two, three, four, five, and so on. Uh, for example, the Prognosti squad, they are the fifth car in the convoy, so they are the sticker, the number five sticker on the car, and they have to get into and stay in number order. If they want to move up and help the riders, they actually have to ask permission of the commissaire, the chief commissaire, who will be riding in the convoy immediately behind the most active riders in the bunch. So it is all about making sure that they get permission to move up, that it's safe to do so that they're not going to hinder other riders on the way. So the riders 
Do you want a bag? Hey, do you need a bag or are you, are you all right? I've just zipped it shut. Yeah, that's like a good idea. Yeah. coming out the bottom. That, that, uh, yeah. I think it's good. Yeah. 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 Welcome to the British Men's Elite and Under-23 National Road Race Championships here in the city of Lincoln. The end to several days of racing, and these today will be the final two iconic British Championships jersey that are going to be awarded. We had a wonderful race earlier on today in the Women's Championships, won by Pfeiffer Georgie. The women covered eight laps. The men, well, they'll be covering 13 laps of this iconic circuit, the Lincoln Grand Prix is incorporated into this race for the second time. Back in 2015, we had the championships on at the same circuit. Slight variation, they went out into the country before doing six, six laps. On that occasion, it was Peter Kenyak that won in front of Mark Cavendish. Cavendish, the former champion, of course, himself. He's here today on the start line. And alongside me for the ride today on uh, what's going to be a... It's going to be a brilliant race, there's no doubt about it. It is a blue ribboned event. National championships is special. Wonderful to have it back. But Adam... You're a former British champion. Um, you know how special it is to win this jersey, and this is going to be um, this is going to be the same after two years' absence. It's just so good to have it back, isn't it? It is, and let's not forget, Matt, that you are also an ex-national champion as well. Not yes, just indeed. myself. Thank we you. Both are. Um, but yeah, it is brilliant to have it back, and I think you know, watching this whole week of racing up here in Lincoln, it's been brilliant to see it all under one roof, almost at the the Crit Nationals involved the same week everything here within these five days so it has been brilliant to watch and this is the i'm not going to say the main event they're all just as important as each other but the last event of the day um of the week sorry so yeah i'm looking forward to it brutal circuit brutal circuit and not the greatest weather conditions as well um especially the far side of the circuit that descent through burton village we saw um, the women's field really spread out on that technical wet descent it's quite windy as well today We've got around uh, 20, 22 kilometre an hour wind blowing from the southwest. So there'll be a cross, a cross wind on uh, the leg of the circuit that moves back into Lincoln. We head out to Burton Village, drop down that technical descent where we lose all our altitude that we gained on the climb of the Michael Gate. Here is uh, the uh, circuit itself. Let's have a close look. We start in Castle Square in the shadow of Lincoln Cathedral. They will then head north up Burton Road, Middle Street, before swinging left and down a technical descent through Burton Village and then left onto the flat, exposed A57. Just there, we then take another left on Long Keys Road, which takes us back towards the city centre and the iconic cobble climb of the Michael Gate with its 20% slopes to the finish in Castle Square. 13 laps, totaling 166. Very, very tough kilometres. And uh, it's also worth mentioning the distance. I mean, a lot of people might look at this race, 166 Ks, for elite plot pros isn't very long but the lincoln grand prix the british championships incorporating the same race it doesn't need to be super super long this race is so attritional so so hard so specialized and so specific there's no point in having any more laps on the top of it it's kind of perfect the way it is really isn't it yeah it is indeed and i think there's a lot of there will be a few people in there that do complain about saying oh it should be longer you know it's not it's not fair that it's not longer i'm better after a longer race but 
the circuit, as you said, Matt, is, is hard enough as it is. And this climb, and although this climb is probably the hardest part on paper, the way the race is ridden, it's always just over the top of this climb and that sort of long, horrible road before we drop down that descent there. So there's many, many places on this circuit where the race can be won and more importantly lost. Um, and we saw in the women's race there, attacks always go and it did come down to that final climb. But if you do have the legs to get away and you're a rider that is a little bit under the radar, there is an opportunity there as we see the, the riders to watch. Yeah, talk through them and a lot of them we know. Just have a quick whiz uh, through for us, Adam. Yeah, we've got Ben Swift there, the, the reigning champ. Ben Swift had the jersey for two years, pretty much, so he's, he's had a good run of it. Ethan Hayter, as we know, one of the best, best years that we've seen for a long time from any British rider, not alone British rider, but any rider. Won the Crit Champs, the Time Trial Champs, so he's looking to, to top it off and get the triple with the jerseys this week. Stevie Williams, rider for Bahrain, he's, um, he's been coming into form, won a race recently, the overall in the, I think it was a Croatia race. Fred Wright being a, a fantastic um, domestic throughout this year, rode the, the Tour de France. Matt Walls also run a race, uh, a couple of, couple of races this year on the road, Olympic champion as well. Um, Jacob Scott obviously won the, the tour of the Britain uh, King of the Mountains points. Mark Cavendish needs no introduction whatsoever, we all know who he is. Jake Stewart, uh, a man that's been up there throughout this year, at the start of the year in, uh, in some of the classics, Hep Volk, getting right up there. Um, so a rider to watch. Matt Holmes, um, he won the, the Wollonga climb and tore down, down, down under the famous Wollonga climb. And he did that from a breakaway and then being able to hang on. Um, and then the last rider on that list there was James Shaw, a rider that is um, he's riding for a pro tour, a world tour team next year. Made his way back into there through through hard work. Came third in the national time trial championships this Wednesday. So on fine form and a rider to watch today, I think. And I think people that are we always look towards the World Tour teams, but James is definitely that rider that can get in amongst it. He will be with the World Tour boys next year, so he's, um, he's definitely one rider to watch as we can see the riders finally. Underway, the neutral zone. The neutral zone will come up through. This is basically part of the crit circuit they're coming in now. This is the run into the line where we saw Ethan Hayter take that sensational victory in the Elite Circuit Race Championships just a couple of days ago. And it really is a uh, stacked field we have here, a real mix of uh, experienced world tour professionals and there's a lot of young burgeoning talent as well just knocking on the door and um, and this is a course which could spring a few surprises but i'm expecting it to be very very attritional it always is and you know this race very well you can just see mark cavendish first glimpse just on the front there with his little gabba top on jake stewart on the right hand side charlie quartermain there as well riding for trek Segafredo, another young talent um, Strange to see Ben Swift there, isn't it? Just on the right of Mark Cavendish in the Indian in normal kit. kit. Yeah. In normal kit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, who's that? Oh, it's, 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 uh, it's Ben. But yeah, it's Cav the... never wears arm warmers in the rain, ever. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, and he's a man who uh, knows at this Lincoln circuit very well. The last time we had the championships on here, he was only beaten. In fact, you were racing on that particular day. He was only beaten by Pete Kenyak. So, Mark Cavendish, um, what an amazing season Mark Cavendish has had. Ten wins on the road. And his last one pretty recently in fact but uh, no a stacked field and I'm expecting and this I think it's worth saying because of this unique finish up the Michael Gate climb um, we've got 13 laps so basically what we've got essentially kind of 13 intervals obviously there's the course is got a lot of other elements to it but it really is I think the most stress one of the most stressful races on the domestic calendar purely because of the fight for the bottom of the climb yeah I think this race as the women's did it will be a huge fight for the to get in the breakaway and with that wet descent there risk being taken by a lot of riders but that first fight into that first time up the climb um, it will massively string things out no doubt we'll see splits come back a little bit and go again so I think the first sort of two or three laps of that will be the main the main stress of this whole race, I think once it settles down a little bit, the groups are formed. That's when you get into that group of 10 or 15, 20 riders where you can sort of look and back off a little bit and go, I don't need to stress anymore. And then, then it's the difference between the riders that are stressing, still fighting for position. If you can sit back a little bit and go, I can save a little bit of energy here. I'm laughing for the rest of the day. I'm in the good group already. I just need to be aware of my contenders around them. I believe they are going to start. Indeed. Well, you can just see uh, Alexander Richardson just on, on um the left hand side there. He's wearing a black, oh, he's wearing a jilly, rides for Alpes and Phoenix. Um, had a really nasty incident the other day in Richmond Park where he was, uh, well, attacked and his bike taken from him. So we could see Richardson actually here, uh, unable to ride. That was a shocking incident. 
Victor to Richardson, second from the left. In the centre, as you can see, uh, Mark Cavanagh's 3 2 1. And we'll be off very, very shortly indeed for the 2021 Men's Elite British Road Race Championships. And they are underway in the shadow of Lincoln Cathedral, just outside this beautiful castle, the castle into the centre. So the cowbells, the atmosphere. This is um, a really, really special race, not just because of the British Championships and there's that uh, jersey up for grabs for another 12 months. Um, it's just, it's one of the very rare British races that um, feels like you're actually riding on the confident, uh, the, the, com the, the, the com sorry, the, the continent, should I say. Um, it has a kind of bit of a Belgian kind of comes feel about it and the crowd really do get behind it, don't they? Yeah, the rider at the back there as well, in leg warmers. I'm not sure that's the right decision to, <laughs> to be no, making. It's going to hot up pretty quickly, that is for sure. It's just the faff of taking them off as well. I don't think this race is going to have an easy point throughout this race where you're going to have a chance to, to be able to, um, to get rid of them in the best moment. So I'd have, I'd have definitely got rid of them before the start there. The lad from Group Armour. You know, there were a few riders actually uh, blowing, their, blowing their hands. I mean, it's, the women's race started in about uh, 10 or 11 degrees. So pretty chilly. But again, it is October. And we are commencing the first of our 11 laps. So uh, we are still neutralised at the moment. It's a couple of Ks. We actually don't denutralise the race until we get out onto Burton Road. So we need to head through Newport, left on to Yarborough Crescent, right again onto Burton Road. And uh, this is a, a course that both of us know very, very well. I, don't, I can't remember how many times I've ridden this in, in the past, but it's, um, it's one of my favourite races. Um, but it's a race that, Adam, you talked about it briefly at the top. You don't want to be in the back foot chasing in this one, do you? If you, if you, you can bizarrely by getting in the breakaway. It's oh, well, that's hard getting the break. That's, you get the easiest race, although it's hard to get there. But that's, yeah. that's the that's the place you want to ride. This one is from the front. Yeah, it definitely is indeed, and more so with this weather as well. I think, you know, we saw in the women's race there how technical. It's not too much of a technical descent, but how much it strings it out each time. So you want to be near the front. You obviously don't want to be sat on the front in these early laps, but you need to be aware. You need to be cautious um, you need to have good visibility of what's happening around you the other riders around you how they're tackling the course who's suffering who's not but ultimately i think this this first couple of laps there going into michael gate and michael gate on the first couple of laps it's a hard part but it's through the feed zone that slowly drags up there before they drop down right to michael gate that's one of the hardest parts on the circuit because you've got to really make a big effort and then to stay at the front on that descent that is it's not the hardest bit, but it's very, very hard because you have to make a, a big effort to stay at the front before Michael Gate and then make the effort up Michael Gate again. So it's, it's a tough race and it's tough to stay in that position the whole time. And I think, you know, at the end of this race, the riders that are able to position themselves a little bit more, keep out the wind, that's who we will see at the fall later on. Yeah, you think there, I mean, there'll be a little bit of a hierarchy as well. A lot of the World Tour riders will want to try and um, kind of uh, exact their authority a little bit, but some of the British teams, the domestic British teams, have been uh, riding exceptionally well uh, over the last last year or so because the the domestic calendar, let's be let's be blunt, was decimated, wasn't it? Uh, as were a lot of other sports by COVID-19. So this is the first full season that the domestic pros have had, and it is a very very important race indeed. This is indeed. I was just looking at the Group Armour rider there, it looks to be the the brother of uh, Tom Pidcock. Very similar shape, similar style. So. A rider, if he's anything like his brother, this will suit love him. This today, circuit, yeah. won't he? <laughs> he will love this yeah. circuit. Only 1,200 metres of climbing on today's race in total. So even though they've got that one steep climb throughout this whole race, it's not that much really. No. So it just shows how important it is. If you want to make the difference on the climb, there's not a lot of time to do it. No, it's a, the thing is the climb itself is only measured at about 250 metres, but it feels like you're on it for an eternity, doesn't it? I know they'll be <laughs> yeah. ripping up it in about 55 seconds, something like that. But when you're climbing the Michael Gate, um, it does feel like an eternity because you're just in the red, aren't you? I mean, you, you really are in the red. And then, as you said, there's no descent over the top to kind of recuperate. It's just uh, that horrible bit through the, through the feed that you described. That's where um, generally the stronger riders, that's where they'll start to really open up these gaps pretty quickly. And I think we'll see that without a shadow of a doubt first time through. And many editions of the Lincoln Grand Prix in the past, 
the big break's gone um, within the first three laps, quite often on lap number one, as we saw in the, the women's championships today. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me, and especially with this weather as well, that really adds to it, and it adds to the, the stress we spoke about, but it will definitely uh, make things hard. As we can see, all the riders coming to the front, you've got Mark Cavendish there, took behind the car, James Shaw with the orange helmet just next to him, Connor Swift, a previous champion, far right-hand side, so the names that we're expecting to be up there, already towards the front, um, trying to stay in that that better position and you know there might have been a chat throughout the world tour riders saying right let's just make this hard at the start let's go flat out up the up michael gate the first time and get in a select group and and then almost work together as a collective and then once they get into the deeper of the race race against each other but and you never know indeed and the race is on the race has technically started the uh the kilometres have already counted, but that first part of the race was neutralised just to get us out of the built-up area. We're now heading uh, along Burton Road. We've just gone over the bridge for the A46, and soon we'll be dropping down for the very first time Burton Village, and that will be the first time when this bunch really does start to line out. Because it's pretty technical, isn't it? That uh, it's and you lose height very, very quickly. If you're going to come up the other way, it'd be a brutal little climb, wouldn't it? Yeah, it definitely will, and it's. Just watching this now and just thinking back to the Nationals when I rode them, it's there's never a breakaway that goes at the start. It's not like a typical race where the breakaway goes, a team brings it back. That's that's not how previously, it might be this time, but that's not how the Nationals are generally ridden. In these Nationals where there's not a lot of teammates involved, the, the riders that are in teams, in World Tour teams, they almost race separately, um, even though they're in the same team, but you don't see the usual coming together at the front trying to bring it back. Um, so we saw Mark Cavendish following a break there, and it's all about just trying to pick that move that goes away and be able to be in it and get yourself into that move with as little energy as possible. And that is normally the one for the rest of the day that sticks. It's never the, the breakaway that goes the early break, because there never really is one. It's the, generally the, the first big group that goes, or the breakaway that goes. Riders might come across to it, but that is generally it. Yeah. Unless you can get in there, you, you're going to have, have to have brilliant legs to be able to get yourself across to it. Yeah, it's a, it, this race evolves you know, very, very differently. But as you said, the, then you've got the national championships element as well. And there's always a bit of a pattern for national championships. And it's, uh, but you don't want to be caught on the back foot. Um, sorry about the picture break up there. We do tend to lose a little bit of break up at this far end of the circuit before things pick up again. It's uh, been run on 4G this race. But uh, there is the Michael Gate. 13 times up this fearsome climb. The Lincoln Grand Prix, of course, has been going for a long time. One of the longest races uh, in existence on the British calendar. It started back in 1956. And it really is uh, massively prestigious as uh, Mark Cavendish on the right-hand side. Uh, just starts to accelerate away, just from maybe keeping himself out of trouble. He's in great form, isn't he? So, so confident. Uh, Jake Stewart just uh, moving back there, but uh, he knows where he wants to ride, doesn't he? He doesn't want to get caught behind on this technical part. He just want to, on the opening couple of laps, these technical parts, you just want to get a bit of a feel for them, don't you, as well? Yeah, it's strange that Cav's attacking on, not attacking, but just trying to increase the pace a little bit. I think Mark obviously wants that group to go get, get things strung out a little bit. You can see him very attentive, following moves a little bit, but I think he just needs to sit back a little bit, relax a little bit, not panic too much about breathing this breakaway. He needs to have... I think the thing is with him, he's got confidence in his ability at the minute. He's flying, he won a race in Germany recently, which was from a select group, which we don't normally see from yeah, Mark. Yeah, split to bits that race, yeah. wasn't it? the Munster Enduro, wasn't it? Yeah. Exactly, so I think with Mark uh, within this race, he can afford to sit back a little bit and play devil's advocate a little bit, you know, wait until it gets really hard and then use his legs. I believe that, you know, even though there's a number of, number of riders that can win this race, Mark is definitely one of the hot favourites that can win it. Oh, it has to be. Well, there's a Harry Tanfield just attacking on the left-hand side. Very, very good time trialist and a medalist the, the other night in the, the circuit race championship. So Tanfield, the only rider from his World Tour team, or Quebec and next hash. And that's drawn uh, the interest from the Canyon and DHB team. They're the most numerous team in terms of uh, representatives. The Canyon DHB Sun God team have 12 riders in this field. In this field. So they'll be trying to cover and at least get in um, as many moves as they can. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? These these attacks that are going and people following the attacks, it's it's very difficult. You have to think if they're following these attacks now, nothing is going to go this early on just because it it won't. Everyone wants to be in that breakaway. Everyone will be wanting to follow the breakaway. So they, these early attacks, it's not going to go. It's not hard up at the minute and there's no big teams riding. So attacking at the minute, it's almost pointless. 
I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's just a waste of energy. They need to wait until they go up Michael Gate the first time, save your energy about get, trying to get into position there. But you see two of the riders there. You've got a Canyon DHB rider, a couple of riders following again. So each move is generally being followed the whole time. Each rider wants to get into that move. So as soon as, especially as soon as um, a World Tour rider, maybe, let's say, or one of the favourites that's not in a World Tour team moves, riders will respond to it directly. So the World Tour guys need to wait until it's got harder to be able to make that move and then, yeah, definitely. then go from there because attacking in these early moments, as I said, in my opinion, it's a little bit pointless and a waste of energy. And, and also in my previous experience of the Lincoln Grand Prix itself, although it was many years ago, generally there is a, there's a distinct pattern to it. It races from the front and it's very rare. I can't remember actually a breakaway succeeding uh, and actually going clear on the approach on the first lap. It just uh, it just doesn't happen. Everybody's too attentive. There's so many uh, fresh legs. Looks like Damien Clayton on the front there. That's Thomas Glogue in second wheel for Trinity Racing. Uh, Charlie Quartermain there in for Trek Segafredo sat in a third or fourth wheel. Ben Swift just moving smoothly across that gap on that rather fetching Pinarello, silver colours. And he went out training for the last time, posted on Instagram that he's uh, enjoyed his tenure uh, in that uh, jersey nearly two and a half years because he won it in June 2019 so he's had a long long time as Quartermain tries to go clear and um, just like uh, Glogue is going to try and bring him back but uh, this is more um, trying to get I think a lot of riders go here early because they know how stressful the approach first time up quite often it's lap number one that's the most stressful of them all isn't it yeah uh, get it getting it out of the way uh, and some riders will not like that kind of nervy approach to the bottom of the Michael Gate. Yeah, they won't indeed. And just going off on your own now, it's, it's a great move to be, to be there and able to do that. You could just see Ben Swift just moving around in the background, just trying to get things going a bit, not stressing too much. But I think what Quarterman has to realise here is that he's solo. He's got quite a long way until the bottom of the climb the first time. So when he approaches that, he has to remember that the group behind him is going to speed up incredibly going into the bottom of it. So even though, excuse me, even though he's off the front at the minute he might come into the climb first it's going to take so much more out of him than it will do in the peloton and the speed that he'll go into it will possibly be half the speed that the other guys go into it but you can see now not committing fully a couple of riders coming across um, and these are the the moves really where the the bigger riders sort of let go a little bit and then the other riders are going well if Ben Swift's not chasing it if Mark Cavish isn't chasing it I'm not going to chase it exactly exactly so uh one of the riders from St. Piran on the front. St. Piran, uh, one of the teams, the, the Cornish squad, you know, had a very uh, solid Tour of Britain. We've got nine riders here. Just swings off. This is more just uh, early kind of salvos that are being played. No gaps have been opened up. And this is the section that they turn. They pick up a little bit of a tailwind here. This is heading on to uh, Long Lays Road. And then this section here is Arrow Straight. They go under the bridge and they turn right and uh, they go through the feed, but it's, it's a horrible little drag. I was talking to Hannah Walker about it. It's, um, when you, if you're just out on your bike doing the ride, you wouldn't really notice it, but after three or four laps, that drag, really, it's really hard to get into a rhythm that's comfortable. It's horrible, isn't it? And then yeah. it kicks up before the drop down. Yeah, and ultimately it's through the feed zone as well, so later on in the race when you're trying to get a bottle or it's something. It's horrible, isn't it? You're on the limit, aren't you? <laughs> you've got a rider that's pushing on a little bit and you're trying to get a bottle, so you ease off a little bit maybe, and it's just awful. It's not, it's probably a problem then Un, I'm going to say unnicest place I'll, I'll on the course. I'll take that, I'll yeah. take that. An unorthodox uh, choice of phrase, Adam, but one I understand very well. <laughs> it is very unnice, that is for sure. Um, just see Alex Richardson in that black jersey. Um, former winner of this race, actually, Alex Richardson, I think it was three or four years ago, won the Lincoln uh, Grand Prix solo. He was in a breakaway. He was riding as an unsponsored individual rider after spending a couple of years in a couple of pro teams. Had a few issues, which he's uh, written about, but now applies his trade for Alpson Phoenix is in a super domestic basically very talented bike rider but knows what it takes to win on this circuit as a little break now starts to go clear Canyon DHB represented another rider in red there just jumping across the gap but uh, Canyon are going to be under a lot of pressure to at least okay they might not win this race but um, because they've got 12 riders here the, the team management the DS is going to say we need to cover pretty much everything there's no excuse for not having at least one or two rides in every single move today so they they do have the luxury of 12 riders but the pressure of making sure they're represented all the time i think so and i think that's the thing almost with with this with the canyon team it's almost like you you have to race individually don't race against each other don't bring any big moves back on the front but i don't think they're going to look at something and go oh we need to bring this back we need to get all of them on the front because i don't think it's going to happen i no. think they've got 
you know, very, very good riders and capable riders in there, but they almost have to race individually um, and not against each other to give themselves that opportunity, as drops did basically in the in the women's race. Exactly. No, definitely. Um, it was an interesting, uh, very, very interesting race that we saw earlier on in the women's. As we look a little bit further down, and the rider taking off their rain cap, that's Oliver Richardson, one of the under 23s for the L Viv cycling team. This is going to start to get hard now. Yeah. Just this, this drag up through the feeds, and you can see riders trying to move up, get in position a little bit. This will be when it starts to get. This will be the first hardest point, I'd say, of the race. Yeah, this is a through the feed zone, as you can see. No feeding on the first lap, not we any need, I'd imagine. Um, but uh, this race, I, because of the the climb, the, 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 although there's only 143 metres of climbing every lap, it is one of those races where you can just do a one bottle strategy. As we see, Mark Cavendish hit in the front. Dan, uh, Dan, Dan Bigham. Oh, oh there's been a crash. Wow, straight into that, well, very, very well marked to Traffic Island. Uh, clearly unsighted for one rider as Jake Stewart accelerates clear. This is a real indication of how hard this little climb is. And look how spread out the bunches on this horrible drag. Ben Swift on the right-hand side, Glogue in the centre there as well for Trinity Racing. Ooh. And um, again, this bunch is 25 seconds long already, just over the top of this drag. Yeah, I think as well with the crash there, stringing things out a little bit more. You can see Ben Swift on the front there on the right-hand side, still in rain jacket, Fred right on the far left with those red sleeves and the black gilet on. So a lot of the riders, Connor Swift tucked in behind him, his teammate Dan McClay on the far left as well in that red helmet moving up. So all these riders are coming to the front. They know what is ahead of them. And they know they need to be in that sort of top 10, 15 positions up Michael Gate the first time to make sure that they don't have to waste any energy chasing something down. Indeed, well, that was uh, Fraser Carr from the Spirit Bontrager team. And it's dropping down. This is where they pick up a lot of pace heading into the first left-hander there. There's also a traffic island on the left. Some riders might actually end up going around that one, but uh, Ben Swift ch takes a little look over his shoulder. You see Dan Bigham in third place, Jake Stewart there also in the mix. Mark Cavendish sat in about fifth or sixth wheel, looking pretty comfortable. No need to him for go to, to the front, but the position he's in now is a pretty decent one. Ben just needs to cool his, cool his beans here, I think, a little bit. It's very important. He's going to get excited, isn't he? Yeah. I think if you look at his teammates, the likes of Ethan Hayter, Owain Dool, we've not seen them yet. They've been tucked in nicely, hidden hidden slightly. You see the first attack going on to Michael Gate. I think, actually, this is the rider who was in the breakaway the other day. I think this is Lewis Askey. It looks like yeah, Askey from the other day, Askey, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's uh, certainly not Jake Stewart. Oof! But Askey is going to be riding at World Tour level next year, stamping on the pedals, using that uh, little gully on the left-hand side, the smoother cobbles, flicks round, but the risk is you either collect a member of the crowd or you hit your pedals, and we saw a couple of riders in the women's race do that. So it's, um, it's not only just a hard climb, it's, it's kind of, there's a real technical nature to that first bit, getting it right, because you want to save energy, but also you, you have to be laser-focused not to make the smallest mistake. Yeah, and I think especially in the wet, a lot of riders like to climb out of the saddle, especially on a steep climb, getting out of the saddle, really putting the power down. So for a lot of these riders being wet, they won't be able to get out of the saddle, so it's making sure you select the right gear. But I think what the peloton's done here, they've got onto this climb, they're in position, and they're just going up it easy. There's no stress. We don't need to go over this hard. There's no point in going hard the first time and ASCII going over the top alone. I think for him, he just needs to ride really easy, just sort of let the, let the race come back to him a little bit. This is a big, big effort to make with a lot of the race to go already um, and you can just see the peloton how, how relaxed they are and Swift just unzipping his jacket probably take off his rain jacket yeah that was a quite a, a relatively um i wouldn't call it a sedate ascension of uh, of the climb that is indeed lewis askey uh, under 23 he was in the breakaway the other day in the circuit race championships but when he looked round over the top of the climb he kind of shook his head i think he expected to take a little group clear so that was quite interesting. That was a relatively steady first ascent. As we look at Ethan Hayter, who's uh, riding in a really relaxed place. That's not the kind of place you'd expect a rider of his caliber. But this is, we've talked about this. We know is the undoubted class of Hayter. But sometimes his positioning is interesting, to say the least, isn't it, in the bunch? Yeah, I think, but I think with Ethan, it's, um, we can criticize him and look at him in, in the way that he's too far back. He's if it was anyone else and you're thinking like Cavendish, oh, he's too far back, Ben Swift, oh, he's too far back. You see one of the GB riders there just at the, the back, the GB riders, apologies. All of them are British riders. Um, but yeah, with Ethan there, he's probably thought about this and gone, I know it's going to be stressful going into this climb. I know it's probably a big amount of energy and ultimately maybe nothing will happen on this first time up the climb. So I'm just going to sit back, relax a little bit. Don't 
do these big efforts coming into the climb. I'm just going to sit in the wheels, relax a little bit longer and wait until the second lap, the third lap, where things might open up a little bit, the fourth lap maybe. Um, and just, just relax, basically, and take the pressure off and almost be, be forgotten about. Yeah. Definitely. Which sounds ridiculous, but I think when you're not visible for a lot of the race and then suddenly you pop up, it's like, oh, where's he been for the last 20k? Exactly. And then he's been hiding, he's been resting, he's been saving his energy. Well, clearly, and also he's, he's got that, that such immense form. This is it. Uh, another little move just coming off the front. The front's moving very, very quickly. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if there's any. There are a couple of splits just towards the back as ASCII is going to be shut down very, very quickly indeed. Only 20 years of age, but has signed, as I mentioned, uh, with Groupama F. He currently rides for the Keep Continental Groupama F. to give them their full name, which ride at continental level. But a very impressive season so far. One of the standout rides uh, will, of course, be fifth place in the world under 23 road race championships in Leuven. And that's like, that's like Dan, Bingham. Dan Bingham has gone clear as well. So Bingham, consummate time trial. It's pretty and decent Tanfield road. as well. Yeah, so this is a good little group. Very interesting group. So Tanfield there in third position on the wheel of Aski. He's really pushing it around that corner. You could see he almost 50 pence at that last little bit, didn't he? He yeah. kind of drifted a little bit too wide. Um, a little bit of uh, incredu incredulity then. Yeah, sort of saying, come on, guys, hurry up a little bit. Wow. It's very difficult in that situation, isn't it, where he wants them to be joined and he's asking, asking them to hurry up a little bit. But at the same time, we don't want to go around that corner as fast. If you do, you carry on with it. Yeah, this is it. You, you could just see, rather than letting the bike drift, look at the little micro movements of the front wheel that you shouldn't really need to make just to get, readjust the trajectory of the bike banked over on those on those yellow lines as well. I mean, he kept it upright, so fair play to the lad, but he took that at pace. They've opened up a bit of a gap. James Shaw coming um, across from uh, that. Well, he's not happy with that. Bigham is not happy with James Shaw coming across the move there. Um, very, very early. Um, that's very interesting. You do get this, though. You do get the frustration sometimes in, within teams, especially in the British Championships. Everybody wants to win that jersey, but Bigham showing his frustration early on. Um, a little bit of that, of that was directed at his teammate as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, you know, when we, if you throw back to the World Championships, we had Remco, who was always shouting at people, always trying to get them to go through and trying to get them to help a little bit. But you just have to look and assess the situation. Each rider is riding their own race and each rider is doing what they know is best for them. Um, and I think just the, the shouting, the sort of the aggression and the frustration, as you said, Matt, is it's sort of uncalled for a little bit. If you want to make these moves off the front, if you want to go on the attack, if you want to do this, that or the other, it's your choice. You have to accept it. You can't then get angry at other riders for their decision. Exactly. If, and, uh, you need to keep a bit of a cool head. Um, again, that kind of... Th this race is nervous enough, isn't it? Just by its very nature with that technical descent, the fact that... Look at, look at the splits we've got already. Yep. I mean, it didn't help with that crash that we saw earlier on. That clearly put a big split. This is one of the St. Piran riders uh, a little bit out the back chasing on. That is uh, Tristan Davis, uh, another under 23. As Tanfield continues to apply the pressure on, at the front here. So there's a big, big split. Still around 60 or 70 riders. Ethan we hater as well. Sorry, Matthew. Matthew. Was <laughs> I've, I've been naughty. I've, I've been naughty. <laughs> when you call me Matthew, I'll get worried. Yeah, it was just as we talked about Ethan Hater there, sitting back a little bit and saving his energy. We can see these things happen. So that is the importance of staying in the front. He's having to make this effort to come across. It won't be too hard an effort for him, but an effort you won't want to make. Any big effort like this where you've missed a group or something, it all adds up. And luckily for Ethan, he's absolutely flying at the minute, so it won't affect him too much. But it's still ultimately an effort for him that he won't want to won't want to have made no, just through lack of positioning exactly um and it's kind of panic stations a little bit we we quite often see big groups get um taken out the back in the lincoln grand prix and never seeing the front again it, it this race will the size of the field will reduce very very quickly indeed and you i think if you're about five minutes down you get removed anyway yeah uh, you get taken out but 131 riders took the start but 140. 130, sorry, I had an update from Ooh. Tim Kenyuk there from Bahrain Victorious and Steve Williams hasn't started today. Oh, that's a big shame. Big shame that Steve Williams hasn't started. As you said, won the, won the, the Croatian Tour quite recently, so I shall cross Stephen Williams off my list. We've only got one rider then from Bahrain. Oh, no, we've got two, Scott Davis. He's had a really injury-plagued year. It's big, big shame, yeah. a, a massive talent, but has hardly raced because of his, uh, because of his injury. But uh, Scott Davis, the other rider then for uh, Bahrain Victorious. 
I think what's interesting, just meant, just about to mention Dan Bingham there, he's obviously up for taking a lot of risks, and just as we came down that descent, I saw him scuttling off the front, and this is why he knows that he can, he's willing to take those risks coming down the hills and open up that gap a little bit. He's got a, another rider with him, but you can just see through every corner, pedalling through that one. He knows his limits, he knows what he can do. He's got the big, big deep sections on, so he's, um, he's looking for all his aero gains, he's got his his levers tucked right in, he's in that aero position. So this is what he wanted to do today, get out in front. We saw the frustration earlier. Um, he's just doing what he needs to do and looking around to the, to the rider behind him and sort of asking him for help, but he's happy to just follow, I think. He's, there's yeah. no need for him to commit too much. There's only two of them at the front, a very long way to go. So don't commit too hard to this at the minute. Exactly, I think that's one of the riders from Team Inspired who's just rolling through now. Um, so it's essentially the kind of GB, uh, the GB feeder team, the endurance team. So these are two riders now. We'll get confirmation of his number shortly. But uh, yeah, after uh, by the way Bigham was riding there, he says, "Well, let's do a long, do a long turn on the front. You certainly won't want to be when there's just two of you, Adam. You don't swap turns quickly. You do like 30, 40, even a minute on the front. Sometimes a long, hard turn to give yourself plenty of rest. There's a little flick of the elbow. There's the Manx flag amongst." Uh, uh, the Scottish flag there, the St George Welsh flag as well. This is, of course, the British Road Race Championships. It is a very, very important uh, race indeed. Bigham now absolutely flying on the front as a couple of other riders detached earlier on. They've suffered a few problems. They're trying to get back in contact, but this is one of the fastest parts of the course as we see a, a big flag, or a big uh, plaque, shall I say, supporting uh, Mark Cavendish. Uh, win another title that will cap off a, tr a quite remarkable year for the Manx missile. Again, Bigham takes a little look round. The medalist in the uh, well, silver medalist he was in fact in the uh, national time trial championships just the other day, and they've opened up a really, really solid gap here. I remember when I did the nationals with uh, Dan Bingham when Connor Swift when we got in a breakaway with him, and he was one of the the really keen riders within that breakaway, and it. It was brilliant at the time, but he was sort of, um, I sort of said to him, I said, slow down, you don't need to start pulling so hard on the front. And, and he, uh, he gracefully said to me, I'm only doing 300 watts. Um, and I just said, all right, you're only doing 300 watts, but you can ride at 250, save your energy. He really wanted to keep pushing on. And I was trying to encourage, slow down a little bit when you're rolling through, get everyone collectively yeah. going through and save your energy. I was trying to help him. And later on in the race, he kept doing his watts and everyone sort of took a longer time to get round. And then the deeper we got into it, um, we got into like the thicker bit, really, as we see Joe Peacock on the right, like his brother on the gravel a little bit. But when we got into the, the thick end of the actual racing, he was starting to pull less turns. And I, I politely replied, I'm only doing 310 watts. And um, he it's, didn't it's... quite like it, but it's just a case of you need to monitor your whole situation at the time. And especially within these groups, I think this is one of the key things as a rider who's wanting to learn about bike racing. For me especially, if you're in a breakaway, you have to look at it in terms of what's my best situation in this and how am I going to get the best out of myself? And for me, you have to get the best out of everyone else in that breakaway before you get the best out of yourself. Definitely, definitely. And, and ultimately, you can give advice to riders in a breakaway, but quite often, if they, if they won't listen, you just let them ride longer on the front and go a bit harder, but you just sit on their wheels for longer. Um, exactly. Um, but, but as you said, it's a... But you need to be able to, to communicate, you know, you, you, if you have that kind of experience, uh, riders will look to you, but quite often riders will do their own thing. And, and from experience as well, you know that certain riders cannot maintain the, the, ever, the level of effort that they're putting out. Um, you know, when they're sprinting for preems or they're, they're doing these long, long hard turns on the front, you know at some point they, they're going to start to capitulate, and that generally happens when, you, when you're experienced. And, um, but here we go, first real look. Look at who is there. Number 115, that is uh, Sam Watson from Team Inspired, looking pretty smooth on that bike. So Sam Watson in a long turn on the front with Dan Bigham. So Team Inspired and River World Tight have representation in this front group. There is Bigham, sat behind. A real um, expert on aerodynamics, advises several teams, in fact, several World Tour teams he offers advice to. He's a, a qualified aerodynamic. Uh, Aerodynamicist, one of the hardest words it's ever to say, really. I always <laughs> struggle with the word um, aerodynamicist. But yeah, no, Dan uh, Bigham, he, he knows his CDAs, doesn't he? Yeah, he's, um, he's a brilliant rider, actually, and I think I've publicly had discussions with Dan about things online, about the aerodynamics, and 
this, that and the other. And Dan is very clever and gets the most out of himself in terms of, as you just said, Matt, CDA, which is all about your aero gains, um, this, that and the other. So he knows his numbers. He knows what he's capable of. He knows how aero he can get. And if you look at his bike, he's got those the narrow handlebars, the, the arms tilted in. He is, he's built his bike so he can go and do this exactly. Um, get out in front, get as aero as he can, ride as at little watts as he can possible um, with going as fast as possible. You can see that by the big deep section wheels he's got in, the overshoes, the bars tilted in. Um, so, yeah, he's a, he's a very clever man. Yep. Like you say, he's uh, and also he's um, really helped uh, teams, including Canyon Tram. I know he worked with Canyon Tram when Canyon Tram, the women's team, won the World Time Trial Championships, an event that has now uh, been kicked into touch, isn't it? It's not an, a, no longer an event. Um, but it, and he just looked at how best they combine um, to win, and uh, it was just the order of riders, the turns they're on the front, obviously tweaked their positions, but as a collective riding aerodynamically. So it's not just the way one rider interacts with. The, his environment and the bike, but the way a collective of riders interact as well. So it's like kind of added level to the to the whole science of it all, and yeah. um, you know, to uh, to amazing effect. And they invited him onto the podium. I remember back in the day. Yeah, he's um, as we said, he's a very very clever man indeed, and he's got all the the knowledge about aerodynamics and aero gains and this that and the other. So yeah, he's um, he's a clever. A clever man indeed, and as you say, been employed by many teams. Uh, recently employed for next year by a very, very big team indeed. Um, I don't know if I can say who it is. So Best not then. Yeah, we could say what it rhymes with maybe. Maybe not. That'll give it away, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> I think I think I know what road you're heading down anyway at the moment. But uh, but no, there's a great shot, side on shot of him on his Ribble. Um, Ribble, of course, uh, key sponsor of Ribble World Tight uh, Bike Shop up in the north of England. Up in Lancashire. In fact, I rode a Ribble back in 1993, Adam. Um, 753 frames. Still frame, um, but the gap 102 to our two leaders out in front. Samuel Watson of Team Inspired, looking pretty inspired at the moment um, because they are opening up a pretty nice lead and uh, I'd say a pretty uh, relaxed feeling in the bunch here, but that will soon change in about 2K's time because there'll be another bun fight for the bottom of this climb. Um, and, oh, first attack. A little bit of a counter-attack that was kind of telegraphed, so a couple of riders have gone with him. Yeah, this is just trying to get ahead of it, doing the climb once, so knowing that they have to be at the front. We saw that split on the first lap, um, just through riders going up a climb, being a narrow climb, so just these riders probably wanting to get ahead of it a little bit, not wanting to be caught out and in that chasing group as they were before, but notable as well that Ethan Hayter was on the left-hand side there, right towards the front again, so he's probably not going to make that mistake again. Um, just getting himself in that right position. So this second climb up the time, up the climb, sorry. It will be interesting to see how how much time they take out of these guys, because ultimately these guys are still relatively fresh. Um, but it's maybe the difference next time up the climb, how fast the riders are going to ride, because last time we saw the bench just tootle up there, really. They didn't go too hard at all. It, it was, was over the top. It surprised me a little. I thought they yeah. would have gone a little bit harder, but um, the thing is, the advantage of being out in front in this race, uh, the, the numerous advantages, um, the one disadvantage is you, you're eating pretty quickly into your energy reserves, but you're in front and we know how often uh, this kind of, this tactic could play dividends. Let's assume it does go really hard the next time up the Michael Gate and there's a big split. The two riders out in front now will end up in front. So there is, there's a kind of, it's a double-edged sword here, isn't it? I mean, um, there, are, there are benefits to it. There's, um, there's a cost and that cost is the fact they're having to ride really, really hard. But if there is a split in the Lincoln Grand Prix, it, the place to be is out in front. And we often see this little tactic employed. So, uh, but yeah, I didn't expect the bunch to go quite as steady last time. But, uh, but saying that, if we do get a few steady laps, they're going to go super, super hard yeah. very, very shortly. Because you, you can sense the kind of tension building yeah. for something pretty special. Yeah, exactly that. And I think it's, as we've discussed throughout the show, really, that when they get onto this climb, it's the climb is very, very difficult indeed. It's not an easy climb, but it's generally over the top of it. There's only, well, it's two riders wide, really, going up over the top through that finish line, through the corners there. So that will naturally string it out massively. Um, so over the top of the climb, if someone decides to drop the hammer, the peloton will just string out like a massive elastic band. And it's then when it snaps and how long for the riders that are going to pursue it, keep trying with it, keep pushing with it, how long the riders at the front want to keep it going hard for us. We can see the riders just coming through that 
that right hand turn before they drop down now. The fast descent into Michael Gate. We see Ben Swift towards the front again. Mark Cavendish on his wheel, and it's like polar opposites, isn't it? As Mark Christian right towards the back, which I didn't expect. It's a real pinch point at the top of that climb as we get to the Michael Gate again. Look at the crowd here, urging on our two riders out in front. It's uh, Sam Watson on the back for Team Inspired. Sat on the wheel of Dan Bigham. Both of these riders using the inside as best they can. Sometimes they'll just flick the bike to the right-hand side, and there's a little bit of an overlap here for uh, Samuel Watson. So he's opting to ride uh, on the cobbles. It's a slightly harder ride. It looks pretty fluid here, and um, setting in the saddle is the way to ride this one, isn't it? Without a shadow of a doubt. But um, Watson looks pretty fluid there, doesn't he? Bigham using uh, that uh, left-hand side. And of course, we've got the barriers left which means you cannot ride there any longer, keeping the crowd at bay, but a great atmosphere. This is the final left-hander, and this is cut, doesn't look it, this is actually quite steep here, isn't it? But traction, a real issue with this moss and this grass in yeah. the centre of the road. Yeah, it's a very difficult climb indeed, this part of it especially, just as you come around the corner, it kicks up ever so slightly, and when you're sprinting up here the last time before the finish, it's getting onto this part here and then being able to accelerate again towards that last little bit of the finish line. So a very difficult climb from the top to the bottom. Um, it's not an easy one whatsoever, but as we talked about, Matt, when they get through this corner here, it gets onto the, the the nicer section of cobbles. That's when it really starts to get quick. As you see, Mark Cavendish now pushing on a little bit more than what they did last time. The last time up it, sorry. Yeah, Mark Cavendish opting for the centre of the road. And then we've got uh, Matt Walls also in the centre as well. Not taking any risks at all. Ben Swift also there. And this is the danger of uh, riding behind. You know, it's... Uh, Getting your gear changed right here. I know that the gears have changed a lot since, since I was racing, but if you leave your gear... Oh, it looks like there's another touch of wheels on the climb there. Um, let's just see if there's going to be a little bit of a split. So, for multiple reasons, being at or near the front in this race is absolutely vital, because I think there was another touch of wheels, and you can just see a little bit of a split. It's just getting going as well. Oh, like it's almost guys. impossible, yeah, it's... isn't it? Yeah, and this is why it's so crucial. This is what we spoke about. This is why we're seeing the likes of Mark Cavendish at the front, so this does not happen. We saw um, Mark Christian there at the back. He rides for Alberto Contador's team. And you can see again just in front, still riders being stopped halfway up. So these riders about to come through the finish and the riders behind just stopped. Yeah, that's Jacob Scott in second uh, position. Come off the back on a very successful tour of Britain where he took the mountains and the points. But uh, also, did, here, also did some mountain biking as well. But Cavs are uh, uh, certainly going to press on a little bit as we look towards the back. These are the riders that are probably going to lose contact maybe permanently with this race because the way this field strings out, they're at least, by the time they actually go across the start-finish line, as we head way back up to our leaders, who have taken their first left back onto Yarborough Crescent. They come straight back on to uh, the tops on those hoods with those bars that you just described earlier on, doing a long turn. Both of these riders are pretty stylish. Two very, very different-looking riders on the bike, but both... I've got really nice position. See how uh, how low Watson was trying to get there. Because the uh, thing is, if you're behind a rider that is very, very aero, you yourself need to get even lower to make sure you get in their slipstream, don't you? Unless you've got a big rider standing up like a big sail. When somebody's super aero, you need to work that a little bit harder. Yeah, you definitely do. And this is a bit, you can see how strong out is still. Ben Swift on the front and now another attack coming from the right hand side. Fred Wright by the looks of things. Just trying to keep things moving a little bit. And you can see the the splinters of that peloton behind all just in one line riders just not really fighting to get back on but wanting to get back in contention and this is right at the back so we saw before at the climb riders stopping him this is what sadly happens if you're at the back and what happened was the stopping of the of the riders then you're just going to end up coming to a halt and losing 30 seconds before you know it yeah look at the big splits here a couple of those as a result of the, uh, the crash on the climb the touching the coming together of wheels is only because you've got this little bottleneck Everything slows down, and ultimately, the, the, the longer you are, the further back you are, the more you slow, and ultimately, you actually you grind to a halt, and then riders have leave the gear selection very late. So when they swing left off the main road, I remember I used to change, get it onto the small ring really, really early. Although with the gearing these days, you could probably ride it on the big ring right at the top of the block, but no, uh, most riders I've seen, as Mark Cavendish tried to get across this move. Yeah, Dan McClay like behind him as well. I don't want to give Mark Cavendish too much leave with Fred right there. I think that's Thomas Glogue on the left-hand side for Trinity. This is interesting. Cavendish looking fresh here. I think this is what will be the nature of this race now, is that you'll have the two riders off the front, then you've got another two riders and my just coming across to it, and that will slowly form a group, then another group, and then a large group will all come back together. It's just making sure you don't miss that boat, because when it's 20 riders, 15 riders, 
when it's five or four, it's not too much of a worry. But when it gets more and more and more, that's when you have to start to panic and go, I need to be in this now. This is starting, the race is going away from me. And the, the longer you leave it, the bigger effort you have to make. And then it's a, when you do it on this course, if you do it on that bottom road and you get on at the bottom of the climb, those riders will be aware of that. They'll push on a hard up the climb, try and distance you again. So it's, it is really about judging your effort and when you do make that, that, that effort ultimately as well. Well, Mark Cavendish is clearly feeling good as we get back to um, the front. One minute and six seconds it is uh, for Dan Bigham of Rivel Well Tight. Just going across the bridge over the uh, A46. And this is a little chase group behind. I don't think it's actually a group now. I think the bunch have actually got back onto the coattails of that little splinter. And as you said, interestingly, you know, the, the way to ride this race, I mean, because Mark Cavendish, despite you know, him being uh, an exceptionally gifted rider. Well, this is interesting. Ben Swift has started to go clear now. Big, big move for the rider from the Ineos Grenadiers. He certainly knows how to win this bike race. It was a, a kind of revelation in his career, wasn't it, when he finally won. He's been so, so consistent over the years. And that's a big, big move. Sat down attack. And he's uh, drawing one rider clear. He's actually waiting for him to get in contact because a two is better than one in this situation. This is brilliant now. You can see the riders behind. You've got Cavendish on the front. A couple of other riders that are looking at those. Fred Wright as well, looking at those to do the chasing. This is helping Swifty. He's got one of the riders from Trinity Sports with him. And he's trying to get come through a little bit, but Ben has to remember the strength of, of himself is sometimes you forget how strong they are and always flicking your arm saying, come on, come on. You're like, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it is very difficult indeed, but a good move off the front here by Ben, and he's just um, pacing it now, still with only two rides. If those two bridge across to those other two in front, that's four, so that's even better, but just with two in this circuit, it's going to take a... I don't think they're necessarily going to take too much out of him on the flat part of the circuit. It'll be more on the climb that he's able to do so. But, yeah, Ben Swift off the front again. Again, he's still off the front, sorry, and... It's going to be interesting, I think, as we just spoke about, Matt, is that the way this race can be won um, or lost, for me, it is going to... <clears throat> oh, my God, pardon me. The way this race is going to be won that... <clears throat> Do you want to clear your throat, mate? And I'll, I'll just take over for a minute. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> we are um, enjoying some refreshments ourselves um, just to make sure we're fuel fully fueled for this race as we look at Ben Swift with one of the riders as yet unidentified from Trinity Racing, but they've stolen um, quite a few seconds there as we look a little bit further back down to some of the riders who were detached and have now just managed to get back onto the group after that very difficult uh, second ascent of the Michael Gate. Last time through, they would have seen 11 laps to go. Swift goes straight past the Trinity rider heading into this little chicane. And believe you me, this uh, surface isn't great. There's lots of little drains and grates and stuff and when you turn right, the, the, to the apex of that corner, there's a really nasty drain cover as well. So a very technical descent. Isn't it back. funny what you remember as a rider? I, I remember it like I, mean, I remember it like the back of my hand. <laughs> yeah, just there every single lap, but you still remember it ingrained in your memory. Yeah, it's, it, it's really. I, I, it, it feels like I'm not in the race, but I, I, I can just recall every single, virtually every single meter of this yeah. course. I've ridden but, it that many times. But isn't know. it funny when they do this course so many times? Each rider will have their own little bit of memory where they can move up where the holes are where not to move up and even on michael gate the right side the left side where's a good line to take so you learn each time where you can save more energy throughout that race so these two will have even a better view of it because they're out the front on their own they can decide where they want to ride more but for the riders behind you don't get that that choice really but i think the way this race is being ridden as i was just about to spoke, uh, talk about before i just started choking to death um that i think it's just going to be a collective group of one or twos or threes or fours that will eventually all start to come together. So it's, as Ben's doing now, he's getting ahead of those sort of big attacks that are coming and getting in front before, you know, the, the expecteds almost happen. People are going to be waiting now for that next big attack to come. They'll be more vigilant. So it's it's more about now where when it's going to be hard again and then being able to respond to that. And it's, it's tricky, it's difficult to do. No, it certainly is, but these two relay very, very well indeed. You just see the direction of the wind there, the Union flag uh, being blown. It's a cross headwind on this particular section, and they'll pick up a bit of a cross tailwind uh, when they get back on to the A57, which takes them back towards the centre of Lincoln. These laps coming very, very quickly. It's Ben Turner um, on the back there. So Ben Turner and Ben Swift, two Bens in the pursuit of our riders out in front. And it's time for some grub. 
So uh, Samuel Watson making sure he's fully fueled, and that looked like it was a quite a nice bit of rice cake there. Big, big mouthful as well, yeah, it was wasn't straight it? Straight in, Crikey. wasn't it? No messing around. Wow. I'm worrying about choking here just while I'm just sat on a chair. Never mind riding my bike and putting that amount of food in Do you it. remember, though, back in, the, back in the day racing, Adam, as we just look at our breakaway moving very, very uh, swiftly. Um, 50 seconds to the chase. They've only got so to the, the, the two bends. have only got six seconds or eight seconds, shall I say, on the bunch behind. But do you remember eating in races and then somebody attacking you? When you're in a small break, sometimes I would look at riders here having a mouthful of food and attack at that moment. Awful, uh, man. Which is a, awful, Which man. is not good. But then... <laughs> Yeah, I was on the back foot and quite often I'd have to spit my food out um, and then or it would go over my bike. I mean, um, or you're eating and then somebody just does a big turn on the front and you're, you're suffering. And um, so strategic eating, another another skill. Yeah, but it's, um, it is massively important eating on your bike and picking when to do it. Is uh, very, especially very on a circuit like this. Yeah. yeah. I've, um, I remember I used to get go to back I didn't go back that much to the car really because I struggled to get back on but when you go um, go back to get bottles a few times I didn't have that written in my contract so I felt like I didn't have to do it um, but when I come back for bottles sometimes I remember um, a race in Italy that I did where it started going uphill a little bit and I was like I cannot carry these these bottles anymore so I just got rid of all of them I just threw them all away because I was like no way am I getting dropped now this is I'm literally 20k into the race and about an hour later Cadell Evans said to me, he's like, have you got my bottle? I was like, no, I'm really sorry, mate. And then just, just left him. I couldn't look at him in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> Say, lovey, these things happen. But, yeah, the two Bens there behind, Ben Swift and Ben Turner, they look to be getting caught. So that... Yeah, they did. The riders, as we spoke about, trying to jump across to that, being aware of that nice shot of Moto Commissaire there, Clive. Yeah, just giving them uh, their time checks. Very stylish rider uh, is uh, Sam Watson. And... Uh, this is Ben Turner and Ben Swift. Turner now taking his his shift on the front with the current or defending national road race champion in his slipstream. Uh, ben Swift had some pretty good form. Um, best placing recently was uh, third in the Grand Prix de Dinant, um, a race uh, in France. It's been around for a long time, 200 kilometer classic. So, but um, Ben, such a likable character. I think everybody was pleased when he finally pulled on that national champs jersey after years of knocking on the door. But uh, you know Ben very well, I mean, we both know Ben very well, but he's um, apparently he's um, one of the, the riders in Ineos and Team Sky who puts out the most amazing training files. He trains so, so hard the Swift did, isn't he? Yeah, he's one of the reasons, really, if, you know, people ask me, oh, would you ever be able to come back as a cyclist? And I always say no, because I know how much how much training Ben does and I know the level it takes, and I just couldn't do that. But, yeah, Ben, he's... Um, I started racing with Ben when I was five years old, so he's like a like a brother to me. Um, so it was great to see him win that that nationals jersey finally and putting himself at the minute in um, in the best place possible to do so again, which is brilliant to see. Ben Turner, the rider that's with Ben Swift, excellent time trials. Was second the other day in the under 23 individual time trial championship so clearly in good form and looking good good wheel for uh, ben swift to ride on as well he's a tall lad his turn but swift takes his turn on the front rolling through i think that extra bit of motivation for ben as well he doesn't live too far away from here his home where he's from um he'll have his his partner here lizzie and his two kids harry and arthur so a little bit more motivation that than normal that his uh, his family will probably be at the finish line they're cheering him on Indeed, it's nice to have the family round at the national championships as our motor commissaire again goes over to uh, Dan Bigham, gives him the information that he needs. He's still working really well. They opened up a nice little lead here and still hovering it around a minute, though. Still lots of firepower behind. And next time up the Michael Gate with a third ascent. And generally, from, from experience, Adam, even if you're going well, it's fifth sixth time up you just start to feel it a little bit don't you it's just you think mm, this is actually starting to bite a little bit i mean because it's only a short climb it's over but um even though you're only on it for a climb when you look at 13 laps that's 13 minutes flat out on a cobbled climb that's what it equates to and then there's the, the, all the other bits the accumulated fatigue so it's a relatively short race but a lot of riding pretty much in, in the red zone. And there's only so much tolerance that people have, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. And I think when we, we look at these two riders out the front and, and the two Bens chasing here behind, that 
it is they've only been out the front for just over a, a lap and a little bit now so although it might seem to us because we're commentating on it and we're watching it live it seems like a long time but here's Alex Richardson a winner of this race not the national championships but the um, the Lincoln Grand Prix coming across to this breakaway now so Mark Cavendish seemingly to have a bike problem as well so just on the back of the car maybe a, a crash on the descent there. I can't see any cuts and bruises on him but just well, coming puncher, back yeah slowly uh, slowly back up to the peloton so he'll want to get back quickly for the bottom of this climb knowing that the the chaos that happened last time up it he didn't yeah. want to be involved in that well that's the thing he'll want to when he when and if he does get back on uh, he'll want to try and move to the front straight away because we saw um, if you badly play even if you've got good legs on a race like this particularly the, the Lincoln Grand Prix you cannot race it at the back because you would just not end up in the front yeah. um, and if you do have a mechanical problem you need to get back to the front as soon as you can but the gap's coming down now only 28 seconds from our two leaders to these three Richardson's done a heck of a ride here to get across these we've yeah. not got the shots of the peloton how far they're behind but you can see that they're obviously wanting to bring the two bends back and naturally through doing that they're bringing these guys back as well yeah good ride by Richardson there nice uh, capture of their rather fluorescent bead on there by Dan Bigham straight back into his bottle cage and back on to the wheel of Samuel Watson a couple of fans at the side of the road this is that other little drag there you go Mark Cavendish uh, gently wending his way back so the toots so we're generally in a race like this because Mark Cavendish works on a full team car here. Yeah, he's so. got on his spare bike. The number you can see on that bike there on the top left has got his race number on. So he's something, a mechanical has happened, he's had to get yeah. on his spare bike. Well, they've just crested now Yarborough Road. Well, they've gone into Yarborough Road, should I say. And now they will uh, begin at the descent. This is around 1,200 metres to go. Um, but the lead has been slashed in the last half a lap. It might even close up on this climb. It is amazing, though. Even, even if you hit, we saw it in the women's race, and the deeper we get into the race, the easier it is to shut down time gaps if you're feeling fresh on the climb. And you can start the bottom of this climb with 30 seconds. And although it's two, only 250, 300 metres long, you can lose easily half a minute on this climb, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's astonishing how gaps can open or close up on this climb. Yeah, I think if we were to go through there now and we raced up there with these guys, I think we'd, we'd quite easily lose five minutes, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very difficult climb, and if you've got the legs to go up there very quickly indeed, then I think that's one of the key points of this race as well, is although we look at this climb as being the key point of the race to make it hard, although it's quite short, you can go way too hard on the climb, and when you get to the top of it and attacks start to come, you can put yourself in the red, so even though this climb's hard and it's short and sweet and you can do it fairly quickly, you don't want to get on the top of there in the red. If you've you got do, to leave a little bit yeah, under the hood, yeah. Because it's always... As with anything, short, steep climbs, it's it's never the climb that's the hardest bit. It's when you get over the top and someone attacks and you have to respond and you're like, <gasps> can't do it. No, totally. You, need, you do need, although it's a, it's pretty explosive, an effort. It's a relatively sustained effort. And um, by the time we get through the feed area, it's around a minute. Um, great to see so many people out supporting this race. Uh, thankfully, the rain has abated, making it a little bit nicer for our crowds here. Dan Bigham on the front there. Samuel Watson, the under-23 rider for Team Inspired, on his wheel. Very shortly, I think, with that same camera angle, we might actually see the chase behind. The gap for shortened by this brutal gradient. Average of 11% over the 250 metres. And Ben Swift uh, accelerating here, really putting in a big dig, perhaps sensing something's going to happen behind here, Adam. Yeah, I think with just that peloton right on the back of him there, he knew that it was there. So he wants to, to go up here, make it hard for the peloton as well. So you can see Fred Wright just coming across to him. And when Ben will get on the top of this climb, he'll carry on his effort. But I think with this now, when they get over the top, this will be the split start to make a little bit. The riders at the back still a little bit further back position. So when Ben gets on the top, he'll carry on this effort. He'll have the help from Fred White as well. Lewis Askey, I believe, was there. So I think this is the point now where we're going to start seeing a group, maybe 20 riders, 30 riders, start to move clear a little bit. Yeah, the pace that uh, Ben Swift is riding up the climb is not going to be that many riders that can, can uh, stay with it. The big key is, in terms of uh, favourites in this field, where how much ground did Mark Cavendish um, manage to make up to get back? Can't see him at the moment. Jacob Scott there. Connor Swift is also there. We saw Matt Holmes from Lotto Sudal as well. Swift just easing up a little bit. Matt Walls also in the mix there for Bora Hansgrohe. So most of the uh, World Tour riders up in the mix. But yeah, you get a sense this is starting to hot up. Also there as well for SEG Racing um, was uh, Bradley Simmons as well. So uh, again, 
just back to the two riders in front. It's the place to be, isn't it? Even though there's a clear energy investment, it is the place to be because they split. Yeah, it definitely is indeed. I'm just trying to see if we can see Mark Cavendish. He's not at the back there, so there he is now. He's he's just coming through the finish line. He's um, he's still in an intention. He just needs to get himself back up to the front a little bit and try and move himself. Hopefully for him, the rounds in the front might back off a little bit, might be stalemate, attacks going, not coming back, coming back, and then they're going again, coming back. No one wants to just keep attacking aimlessly when they're all getting followed. So for Mark's hope and for himself, he will hope that will happen. It'll sort of back off a little bit. But the way that these guys are riding... They're moving quick here. They know what they're doing. Yeah, they're moving very, very quickly. And there's some big, big splits, because Mark Cavendish, I'd say he's probably around 45 seconds down just from the front of the group, because he was rounding just the top of the Michael gate before they hit the second set of cobbles, hadn't even gone through the finish line. So that timely mechanical, um, whatever it was, mechanical or puncture, we're not too sure, has meant that he's got a lot of work to do. But uh, things can change. We see this race close up again quite often. It really does ebb and flow. It's never kind of flat stick all the way, but um, that big acceleration by Ben Swift on the climb has narrowed the gap to our two leaders now to only 20 seconds. So he's still Samuel Watson of Team Inspired and Dan Bigham of River Well Type Pro Cycling out in front. Yeah, you can just see that there's a slight gap around 30 riders, 25 riders back. So <clears throat> riders trying to get back on and close it all down. And that's when you get that situation again of an attack's going to go. But we know it's going to be harder at Michael Gate. We'll probably know it's going to split. So we don't want to respond for too many. And the riders that go off the front like we saw Ben Swift there, very, very capable rider, the, the reigning champion almost, going off the front but getting caught right at the bottom of it. So you have to be be able to respond then with the effort before you make for the climb to be able to respond to any attacks on the climb if you get caught. Well, Ben Swift is determined to try and get a little group going clearly. He goes again. Remember, this is only on lap number three, so we've got ten laps to go. So uh, three laps down of the 13. And Swift using a little bit of the uh, aero gains uh, with the draft, should I say, from the moto. Meanwhile, back up in front. So it's interesting the way Swift's riding this. He clearly wants to put himself in a position that makes the race less stressful for him. And, and he is one of the riders in this field. When you look at the how he rides, his resilience, he can take that sort of punishment as well, can't he? Yep, he can indeed. And I think Ben, he sort of got into his rhythm a little bit there, hasn't he? And, and getting off the front a little bit, finding his, his rhythm, as I pointed out. And just probably wanting to stay in it a little bit. He knows it's been hard. He knows a lot of riders will be wanting to have a little bit of rest, try and recover a little bit. So Ben was, will be trying to take advantage of that and put himself clear again. I think going away alone before Michael Gay, unless he gets a good at least 30 second gap will be a big effort. But we can see now riders, groups starting to form, riders coming across to it, Askey again, bringing him back. Connor Swift, his cousin, and that's Dan McClay on his wheel. Char Harry Tamfield behind him as well. Jake Scott as well there, the, the jersey sprint jersey and climbers jersey at the Tour of Britain, so a very capable rider. Yeah, he's just done a bit of mountain bike as well, just rode the uh, World Enduro uh, yeah. Championships as well, so a real versatile rider. Came from mountain bike in the first place, didn't he? Rode for GB a fair bit, but uh, very, very versatile rider indeed. Really explosive rider. Um, we certainly like a course like this, and uh, actually Canyon DHB, it looks as if they've got two, yeah, definitely two riders yeah. in this group. This will be a tough one to get back now with this many riders rotating through and all committing to it. You have to have that commitment behind of a few riders, not just one or two, but ultimately the riders behind won't want to, I'm not doing that big turn, I'm not doing that, but collectively they can do it together, but if they try to do it as one or two, they might struggle, but these guys at the front, this seems to be a good group and a one that looks like it's trying to be brought back and not being brought back that close, which is a good sign. Yeah, that means the pace is really, really high. Very interesting move here. It is Dan McClay. As you said, he's taken off that jelly. Uh, Swift just moves to the back. Lots of furtive glances around. I think that might be Pidcock in that group as well from uh, Group Armour. So uh, Joe Pidcock, the brother of Tom, looking good. Meanwhile, up in front, unaware, well, not so much unaware, but under, undisturbed by what's going on behind. They've just got their own race to ride at the moment, but the gap is coming down as uh, Jacob Scott moves to the front. 18 seconds it is. Tanfield takes a drink, has a little un little look underneath his shoulders, and you'll see that the bunch Fred is Wright. moving at pace, and uh, Matt Sorry. Walls as well trying to get across the gap. Yeah, Fred right there, just coming across that gap, doing what he needs to do. He realised this is a, a dangerous move that he needs to be a part of, so instead of dragging riders along with him and causing more stress, he's, he's decided to try and jump across alone, put the, the stress back on the guys in the peloton, and if he can make it there alone, the other riders will be happier as well in the breakaway that he's not dragged riders across from the whole bunch back, neutralise the situation again. So 
it's almost a, a win-win for both situations for Fred himself and that group in front. That's if he makes it. Well, we're now on this descent through Burton Village as we head back to our static camera on the finish line on the Michael Gate. Plenty of opportunities. Uh, it's such a great race to watch, though. You come out and watch this one. Pop to the pub, pop to a coffee shop, loads of places to get some food, and uh, pop your head out, watch the lap come through. Um, and then go back. It's just one of the best races because um, it kind of keeps your attention. You have 20, only about 20 minutes between each um, between each lap, so plenty of opportunity to use the local amenities. Um, and when I mean local amenities, I mean local pubs on a day like this. Yeah, I think getting in a nice local pub today, even though it's raining and cold, be nice to to go in and warm up and refresh yourself, keep hydrated. Indeed, especially on a well on a day like this. Show about the picture break up just a little bit. Soon it's sharp enough as we get uh, at around this point. <laughs> as if by magic. So this group is still persistent. I think the, a couple of riders there on the descent might have pushed on a little bit, taken a few risks to try and bring it back. But Ben Swift's still on the front, still trying to get things going. Stan Bingham there, we can see he hasn't got any pockets on. He's got his time trials, you can see it on. So taking food out from under his shorts. It seemed to be this lap last time where his compatriot there also had a, a bite to eat, so this is seemingly the place to be to eat food. Definitely. Well, it's um, one of the least technical sections. You had that uh, series of, of nasty corners. There's uh, three or four corners, all been taken at speed, but all in the wet as well. And there's quite a lot of mud on the road as well here. Although the roads are slowly drying out, the rain isn't now falling, um, it's way too technical to actually eat anything. So this is one of the these stretches before things get a little bit fruity on the approach to the Michael Gate climb to make sure that you are fueled up and interestingly he didn't use his pockets he just put the other half of that uh, energy gel down his top which you don't see very often yeah and i think that motorbike there just moving up signals to me and dan bingham looking behind that the riders behind are close unless bingham's trying to ask for information but i think that last time check we had of 20 seconds that they're not going to be too far off behind and i think just two against five now and the race seems to to be on a little bit more, the, the pace has come on a little bit, the, the attacks have started to come proper from behind, so I think these riders are probably got them just breathing down the next maybe 15 seconds, around 20 second mark still. Yeah, that little counter-attack was moving very, very quickly indeed, but long turns on the front here from Sammy Watson. When there's only two of you, you just need to make sure that um, to, keep effect to keep the speed effective, um, you just need to do a longer turn so the rider behind has enough rest to then do something meaningful on the front. But this group is going to get across, and the bunch aren't too far behind. I think this uh, couple of laps tenure out in front for the duo of uh, Watson and Bigham is going to come to an end very, very shortly. It looks like it's Tanfield, actually, uh, driving hard. A rider that we know is always very eager to do some work, rode very well in the Crit Champs, the Circuit Race Championships the other day. But the bunch, in turn, aren't too far behind that little splinter group as well. So a lot of riders wanted to try and close this up now. Yeah, and I think this is the point, isn't it, where a lot of riders wanted to close that gap. It's up to a few riders maybe on the front rotating, but this will ultimately take more out of them for, for Michael Gate going onto that climb again. So we've seen before that, you know, when it's when the when they go onto this circuit, it's almost like the, the riders save something for Michael Gate and then they get on there, they're explosive. But this will make it even harder now, which will benefit the likes of Ben Swift. The riders that like this race to be harder, the ones that we've seen attacking already. So it will make it more open, the race, I think now. All back together then. Well, not all back together, but the two riders at the front after pretty much two laps off the front of um, being brought back. Bingham there and show the, the lovely town, actually, of, um, of Lincolnshire. Indeed. Castle Mill Club. Lincolnshire, Lincoln, apologies. Well, it's, it's Lincoln within Lincolnshire, I think it's fair I mean, to yeah, say. Thanks, and uh, it's a beautiful castle um, built uh, by William the Conqueror back in the day. Ooh. And, of course, the beautiful cathedral as well. But, um, well, that's interesting. That group with Tanfield has splintered. And um, it looks to be, apologies, Matt, that Fred Wright has not made it across and that group has got even smaller. So maybe on the descent they're splitting up and the Trek Segafredo around there just trying to come across. Just trying to see where Mark Cavendish is still. Yeah, I'm wondering if he... The group looks pretty big. I mean, it has certainly swelled. There's still some little groups trying to get back in contact. But if he, uh, if he is towards the back of that group, I think it's Charlie Quartermain trying to get across the gap there, the Trek Segafredo. But uh, this is a very, very strong group indeed. Some real rulers. Is that... I think that might actually be Jake Stewart who's managed to get in this group, in fact. 
and looks like the face of Stewart. Uh, also in there, Dan McClay sat uh, with the second from last and chomping on some food and making sure he is uh, uh, fed is uh, Tanfield, Harry Tanfield, just at the back of that group. Look at the face, well, not the face, look at the body language of Quartermain trying to get across, picking his own line in this uh, this really difficult crosswind because these, these rods are moving very, very quickly indeed. As a few more it's rods... A reduced just, peloton, isn't it? Yeah, massively reduced here. It really, really is. Can't, I can see Alexander Richardson just on the, on the outside there. So, th again, proves the point, doesn't it? I mean, we don't know what's going to happen to this break, but they're at the sharp end, the bunch is reduced, so that little bit of investment by the two riders that are out in front has kind of paid dividends because this is a really solid move. Yeah, very solid indeed, and they did the right thing of, of going on the attack. We saw our um, sort of um, angry Bingham was getting there, Dan Bingham on the back in the orange helmet, at the other riders want, not wanting to pull through a little bit. He wanted to get off the front, and he did that, and it, it's resulted in a, in a great thing for both these riders of being caught but still being off the front with more riders with with great attributes really. Two riders we've not really seen since the start there as well is the other team in Eos Rhymes of Owen Duhl and Ethan Hayter. Yes. Yeah, the, the favourite for today, Hayter really maybe. I think Hayter has to be the favourite, doesn't he? The way he rode that circuit race championships the other day was nothing short of magnificent. He made it look easy, didn't he? And then off the back of the form that we've seen him carry through the whole year, his form has been very, very consistent. I think it's ten wins now, as well as taking the uh, the National Time Trial Championships, just get confirmation that is indeed Jake, uh, Jake Stewart who took second place, as you said, at the top of your uh, top of the show in Het Newsblad. Really likeable fellow, actually. Quite outspoken as well, in, in a good way on social media. He's, got, he's, he's quite happy to use his position as somebody that people look up to to say um, what he thinks are, are right, especially in terms of equality and stuff. He's a really interesting lad, isn't he? Yeah, very interesting indeed. And there's three riders in between now as well. Quarterman there from Trek Segafredo and two other riders, a rider from Ribble, and I couldn't quite make out who the other one was. So those riders, that is a tough place to be. These riders can get onto Michael Gate without any stress of being in the, the right position, whereas the peloton is going to speed up for that position again. And those three riders will get reeled in ever so slightly. So a big effort to make for those riders just to to try and be a little bit at the minute in no man's land really great shot of this little group rolling through Harry Tanfield uh, has just taken off his gilet because things have hotted up very very quickly indeed this is the back of uh, the remnants of the peloton it's certainly thinned out it's a good 60 or 70 riders there but uh, to answer your question I Again, although we're looking at the back, can't see Mark Cavendish unless he's moved to the front. We might get another camera shot. Maybe I just saw him on. there. Maybe, but I think what's happened, Matt, is as we saw at the top of the at the at the race. No, it's not Cavendish that I thought I saw, but I think the groups just split. So he's probably in a group, maybe even further behind that. That is him there up the right hand side. Good spot, Matt. Yep. So he has uh, managed to get back in. Brilliant effort to so be able to get back in there. Yeah, that was a good effort. So six riders out in front, and they are relaying very, very well indeed. Ben Watson and uh, Dan Bigham are there from the original breakaway. Jake Stewart has joined them. There he is. The Groupama FD Jerp signed an extension to his contract. He's had a sensational debut season at World Tour level. Harry Tanfield, one of the riders from uh, Quebec and Next Hash, looking for a contract. Still no confirmation of uh, the future of that team. Although we understand they are Doug Ryder, the team principal, is in conversation. And then we've got Dan McClay, really, really good rider, Dan McClay, exceptionally explosive. He's one of those riders that um, you kind of don't hear from him, then he comes back with a, a really exceptional win, doesn't he? He's the kind of rider that can thread his way through the, the bunch in a, in a bunch kick, I mean, uh, with almost like supernatural powers. Yeah, I think Dan's, he's one of the... Um He's one of the fast sprinters that just has to go right for him, but he's been up there on the podium in Tour de France stages as well. He's, he's got a brilliant CV, not any really big, big wins to his name, but one of the riders who is one of the fast men in sprinting, and when he gets it right and it is his day, he is he's almost unstoppable when it's his day. He's, he's a fantastic sprinter and a rider, not just a sprinter, obviously, but to put himself in that position where he's in now, it's not any old person can do it, you know. Even with the biggest engine in the world, it's, it's still very difficult. You have to have a a good head on you and he has definitely got that he certainly has well there you go 26 seconds is the lead for our six riders out in the in front being led at present by dan bigham silver medalist in the individual time trial championships back on thursday so clearly in very very good form with the mixed relay at the uh, the world championships and in fact he was picked for the, the tt as well i think he was 18th in the time trial at the world championships a few uh, weeks ago in leuven 
big turns as well by him as well still. I think yeah. in this group he can afford to do maybe 10 or 15 seconds less than what he's doing. But I think, as we spoke about, when you get into your rhythm of this race a little bit, it becomes, becomes oh, his back wheel just went there ever so slightly around that corner on the grate and just onto the bottom of Michael Gate now. And I think, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily swap off turns. And it's interesting within a breakaway in in this part now, unless you're trying to push the pace on a little bit more, you almost don't want to be on the front because you you can be unaware that you're pushing on maybe too harder than you need to be or because you, you might be suffering, you're pushing on more to try and sort of contribute a little bit more so other riders don't think you're suffering. It's hard to judge. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost it's really better to be second or third wheel so you can just let the other riders do it and let them dictate the pace as Tamfield just... It can almost be a waste of energy what Tanfield's doing right now. He's fighting for that inside line and taking himself a few metres off the back. Yeah. As we see the rider here, just just riding too hard up the climb for no reason, really. I've seen that so many times in, yeah. in this race. I mean, it, because he's, he's a young rider, he's clearly going well, he's in the breakaway, but um, he's gone just a little bit too hard. And uh, there's only so many efforts like that you can make. And these, uh, Dan McClay, very experienced, will know that. Tanfield will know that as well, as will Ben Swift. There's no need to react to that. Yeah. There's no threat. Um, so that's, again, I think that's just the exuberance of youth and a little bit of an experience there. Feeling good, adrenaline as well. Definitely. I just saw Ben there just looking back over his shoulder and just ta uh, chatting to the other guys, just saying, go easy, go easy. They they had a little bit, tiny bit of distance and they could probably see that Tanfield and um, Bingham there was was suffering a little bit, so he probably just said to him, just back off, we need these guys, let's keep them yeah, for as long as we can. They'll probably be the most willingest participants of the break, where they love a turn on the front those exactly. lads, don't they? so just back off a little bit and let's let's let these riders come back to us. Let's let, get them in and let's help us again, as we see Hayter moving up to the front, Fred White on his wheel, Matt Walls, James Shaw moving up there as well, Cavendish on the front of this group, Gruff Lewis just at the front of that peloton. So I think these three riders we see here were the three riders we talked about, Matt, that were just in a little bit of no man's land but they managed to get to the top of the climb of these riders which for them is a huge huge benefit yeah definitely that wall's at the back of the, at the back of this group a few riders really starting to suffer now back onto the main road and young sam watson has eased off a little bit it's clearly going well but this is a race where you do need to measure effort it's a really important um point that you made there that quite often the way to ride the michael gate climb is to sit back and and just follow the other riders and even back off a little bit. You can gauge it because you know, unless they get a big, big lead, even if they get 10 or 15 metres with 10 laps to go, they're not going to ride off the front. So you just drop off yep. um, and just use other riders as a kind of benchmark. There you go. Ben there just chatting to chatting to the riders, talking to them and about it. And let's, he's probably just saying, let's stick together, let's do equal turns and let's just keep rotating. He's, they need each other in this situation. As I mentioned before, at the start when we were chatting about the breakaway and a rider individually in a breakaway what ben's doing here is is using these riders to his advantage he's getting the best out of these riders he's he's keeping them all together he's keeping them motivated he's keeping them rotating and by doing that he's just increasing his advantage throughout this whole race so very clever riding from it and it's it's a kind of rider where you need in that situation like ben just to say we don't need to go too hard here, be aware of the gap behind, we need to push on a little bit, they're coming closer, they're not coming closer, rather than just looking down at your watts and going, I need to do 400 watts on the front because I know I'm <laughs> capable of that for 25 minutes. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we, we know we know the answer to that one. It's, um, it's a, there's a lot of craft, isn't there? And it's not quite as simple uh, as FTP and riding for the power because uh, once you, you get into hour number three and deep into hour four, um, can you do that after four or five hours of racing? And that's the difference, isn't it? That um, FTP, we understand, is a great measure, isn't it? An important measure of your fitness. But the crucial measure of fitness is what, what numbers can you do at the back end of a race, not at the start so much. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think as we spoke about, for youngsters, maybe watching and looking and trying to learn a little bit, I think... Um, I think looking at numbers this day and age, it's great for training, but if you get to the end of a race and you say, oh, brilliant, I've done a, a five-minute PB power, and you go, okay, but what position did you come in? Oh, well, I was 58, and it's kind of like, okay, um, so your PB that you've done is brilliant for you, but you need to not worry about that and worry about your position in the race. That's, that's what you're trying to achieve. You're not trying to achieve number personal best. You're trying to achieve results. So, and I think that is... It's lost from... It's a disparity, isn't it, between yeah. what, what's important? It's a really interesting yeah. point you make. But I think it's, it's lost in between the riders who are at the top of their game and the riders that are at lower level as well. You just look at what you can do rather looking at, well, if, if he can do that for 400 bots for 25 minutes, I can't do that. I'm so, right, well, how else are you going to win this race if you know you can't do that? You need to look at your disadvantages and make them your advantages. Yeah, it is fascinating. 
it really is. Harry Tanfield now gets to the front. Another rider who uh, is an exceptionally gifted time trialist. Um, focuses a lot on the aerodynamics. Another one of the riders, like Dan Bigham, who's gone for these uh, very modern aero bars. So it's a narrower gauge bar that twists, that flares outwards, and you, so you get the hoods twisting inwards. You don't... It's not massively adopted in the pro peloton, and uh, quite a few riders are frowned upon because it does give you... Although you clearly get used to it, um, in terms of... There's kind of questions marks raised in, to the, in relation to its safety because the narrower your bars, the less responsive your bars are, you know, and that's why in mountain bike downhill and the, the bars are, like, really, really wide. They've got micro-adjustments. So if you have narrow bars in a road race, is it, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a yeah. difficult one, isn't it? But clearly, um, they're not dangerous, but there's a perception that they may be it, that they may be are. Yeah, I think going that super narrowness and having a levers turn, as we've seen Dan Bingham and, um, and Harry Tamfield as well, the, the position that they adopt when they're in that position, they can hold it for... A, seven minutes eight minutes nine minutes but you can't hold it the whole time and then if you look at it when they're relaxed maybe or they're not in that aero position because they can't hold it they almost become less aero than they would be in a normal position so it's for me it's all it's about being as aero as you can and as efficient as you can on the bike and your position definitely helps that but ultimately you're going to spend longer not in that aero position than you are in it so the position that you're aero and as we see ben swift just with normal handlebars, levers, all that jazz. It's just a normal thing. And I think when you're... This looks to be the group that maybe Mark Cavendish is in. Um, no, it's not. Sorry, it's split up a little that bit. That like the third group. or fourth yeah, group yeah, on the road, apologies. isn't it? But I think when you look at... It's aeroness and all that stuff is, is looked upon in so much detail that a lot of riders see it as the be-all and end-all. When you look at... I think the, the best example for me is Julian Alaphilippe. So Julian Alaphilippe won the Worlds in shorts and jersey, not even a skin suit or a time trial skin suit, no aero helmet, no aero socks, no aero handlebars, just on normal, just a bike basically. And ultimately it always comes down to your legs. You can have these little gains that help massively, but as we all know, the important part of bike riding is your legs. And I think Alaphilippe is the, the best example of that. Yeah, and he's, he's um, as you um, would have, I think it was a phrase, I don't know if you coined the phrase, I think it was a phrase um, from Belgium, wasn't it? Diamond legs, he certainly had those but at the, the World Champions. But the diamonds in the legs, yeah. <laughs> they certainly had diamond legs in Leuven, didn't he? But uh, no, he's a, a good example of uh, a modern rider who rides in a very traditional way, um, with that flair, that flamboyance. Um, but it's an interesting discussion, isn't it? Because the sport's moved on, technology is massively important. We all know the importance of aerodynamics, but there is a balance to be struck, isn't there? But uh, Bigham's cornering well today, isn't he? He really is. I don't know if he's taking risks, but I tell you what, he's carrying a lot of pace into the corners and making a couple of these riders just a little bit nervous. And you often see that riders backing off, just making sure they're giving, uh, they've got a little bit of sliding space before they then slot back onto the wheel um, right into the slipstream. And uh, this is a really, really fast section of the course, but uh, this is a really, really strong breakaway. They're totally unified. Adam. Uh, nobody's sitting on at the moment, and they're gradually carving themselves out a, uh, a lead because there's a couple of big, big motors in this group. Massive motors indeed, really, really big motors and riders that can make the difference on these flatter sections like the man on the front, Charlie Tam uh, Harry Tamfield, now, and I think that's the reason, you know, why um, we saw Ben Swift chatting to the riders and almost on Michael Gates was saying, easy, let's keep it together so they can utilise these riders' attributes, which are riding fast on the flats, being aero and doing all that stuff. So it's, um, for those guys, it's, it's so important to keep them within the race and look after them almost for as long as they can until they see they're suffering too much. Now we can go on the attack and get rid of them, but use them before they use too much of their, yeah. their own energy. And, and when you look at the, if you break down this course, um, you look at, let's say, conservatively, uh, a minute and ten and ten seconds on, on the mark and get climbing, including that a little bit over the top. It's a twenty-minute lap. You know, it's worth slowing down a few seconds to get those guys back on because for the other nineteen minutes they're going to be helping you. Yeah. So you really have to think, break it down. You know, almost scientifically look at why you wouldn't want to make it too hard on a rider. Uh, it's worth shipping a little bit of time elsewhere because you'll gain it um, um, on other parts of the course. It's a really and when you look at a group, you look at the composition of the riders, you think, OK, how can we get, how, collectively, how can we go the quickest? How, how can we best go the quickest? And sometimes it means you, e e you ease off in places where ordinarily you wouldn't want to. To go quicker, you go slower. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's strange. Words it's, of wisdom from Matt and Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. But then later, and you just use those riders, use them and use them. And then when you need to, the hammer blow, you, 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 it's, um, there's, a, there's a real purity of kind of 
ruthlessness to cycling, which are like you use, you manipulate others, and then ultimately you, you let them go. You, you've used them and then you attack them. And I, I love that. I love that interplay that like you just use them up and spit them out. Brilliant. Yeah, literally. It, <laughs> I mean, that's that so true. Yeah, 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 that's what you do. I think that is the best way to do it. And it's, it's like what we talked about earlier, Matt, is to get your best out of yourself in this breakaway, you've got to get the best out of them lot before. Of course you have. Um, so, yeah, it's a great example of chew them up and spit them out. I like that. <laughs> Brilliant. It's a little bit brutal. And they won't be doing that just yet because we've still got next time through uh, will be eight laps to go. Um, so not quite half distance just yet. But this group out in front are doing very, very well indeed. I'll be uh, intrigued to see which team's behind Leon the chase. And so the one team that actually has missed this move um, with the most uh, riders in the field, our team are Canyon DHB. But as you touched on earlier on, I don't think they're the sort of team that will just put everyone in the front to bring this back. They'll try and get riders in, uh, in counter-attacks rather than use that uh, numer numerical superiority just to drag everybody back again. They're just going to have to think a little bit more strategically about how they try and get back into the race. Yep, definitely indeed. But it's only 22 seconds, so it's, it's still within touching distance, but that gap, you know, if these guys are riding at 40k, at 50k an hour, they're going to have to ride at 52, 53, 54, which requires a lot more effort. Um, and it's not just going to be one person that is able to do that. It's going to take a few of them to be able to do that. And if they do do that, that's their race over. So as we saw the last lap at Michael Gate, um, you know, riders attacking to try and get across to it, making it hard, the group coming back together, Swift then going on the attack again, like drawing out this group that we see now on the road. Um, so I'm sure that riders are probably thinking, the group's still too big. I can't start going on the attack on the flat parts of the, of the course. We need to wait again until Michael Gate. So. 18 seconds, it's close, chances, isn't it? 28 seconds. It's all within touching distance still. I mean, well, when you look at them and when we've got the camera angle here, it's easy to forget how closely packed this race still is. I mean, it's still wide open, isn't it? But we get a kind of real uh, a sense of isolation that this group actually are far more in front. But this race is run at a relentless pace. Um, and there's just too much, there's too many still relative, there's too many fresh legs in, in, in this race still and too many teams that haven't got anything out of it. And a lot of riders still, who are still, still feeling reasonably good that want to get back into contention. Look at this chase group. This, I think, will be group maybe number group number three or four on the road yeah, who are trying to get back in contact uh, with the bunch. I'm not sure if that's the 18 seconds, the chasers that we saw, and that's the group at 30 seconds, which if it is, and that all comes back together, it's a, a good group of maybe what, 50 riders, maybe. But we've not seen yet anyone go over the top of the climb. We've seen them go up the climb hard. We've seen them bridge across graps, but we've not seen them go hard all the way across. We've seen it all come back together and attack start to go again, but we've not seen that one constant. Yeah, and I think that'll be the difference. And for me, I'm still waiting for Hater to make his move. I, I, have, a, I have a feeling based on what we've seen um, over the last few months, actually the whole year, the, the remarkable versatility, he can time trial, he can climb, um, he can sprint, he can, he can handle his bike ridiculously well. And the, the sense I've got over the last few days with Hayter is that he's just kind of waiting and, and could, not easily, but you know, it wouldn't take too much problem for him to, on his own, jump across a gap of 20 odd seconds, 25 seconds over the top of the climb. And you get the feeling that he's pretty happy, he's got somebody in front, so just needs to float around in the wheels. For the three Ineos Grenadiers riders in this race, to have Swifty in front is great, they can sit back. Yeah. But, um, it's this counter-attack and jumping over the top. I've got a sense that um, in the next few laps, Hayter might try something like that. Yeah, I think, it, I think he has to as well. If it, if it keeps going on like this, this gap is only going to grow. The emphasis from the peloton will, will go ever so slightly. So for, for Hayter, he has to do that. But ultimately, if he's going to do that and he takes someone with him, he needs to have someone that is not going to be an issue towards the end. Taking someone across that he isn't going to be worried about, brilliant, he can help him get across. But if it's someone that is going to maybe challenge him towards the end maybe and he's worried about it he'll go nope it's all right i've got swifty there as well i don't need to do it so he's either gonna have to do it solo which is a big effort which i believe he can do but it's a big effort or someone that he's not too concerned about um which he's able to do so but which rider is that who is strong enough then to go with him well, that was uh, charlie tanfield at the back of the group for canyon at dhb sun god the brother of the man who's in front harry tanfield and also was uh, in the breakaway in the elite circuit race championships uh, just a few days ago and was riding very well but sat at the back of this group now and i think this is the main bunch because there's a group just in front that's the that's the counter attack that are trying to get across to our leaders uh, containing ben swift harry tanfield and the other four riders so what we're looking at i believe 
is um, the remnants of the bunch, and that group are just dangling just in front. It's a small group of around about six or seven riders by the looks of things, and there is confirmation. With the rather long socks on, it's uh, uh, Charlie Tanfield. 27 miles an hour, 25 up, miles an slightly hour. Slightly uphill. Slightly <laughs> uphill, so they're not <laughs> hanging around, are they? They're not, they're not. They're not hanging around at all. And it's a crosswind up here. So through the feed again they go. Pennant man doing a very good job making sure the riders keep to the left of that traffic island. Ben Swift just on the back. And just uh, taking his turn on the front at the moment. Here's a Dan Bigham. And then just rolling through behind him is uh, Sam Watson. He's riding in really esteemed company here. So we've got uh, three riders from the World Tour. Uh, one from the second division, and then two riders uh, at uh, Conti level, uh, Conti level effect effectively. Well, that wasn't a good uh, change there by Jake Stewart. Sometimes happens. So he has a look behind. He can always drop back. Uh, although I don't think they've got many vehicles because the gap is so narrow. They certainly won't have a full complement of team cars behind them at the moment. No, they definitely won't indeed. And sometimes for these riders, you know, they, they're coming across individually. They don't have that big team that they have there so he might just have his, his mum and dad in the feed and you know they might not be used to feeding it, totally <laughs> so it oh no so that's a really really good point the the, the national championships uh, generally in a lot of countries are, i mean the trouble although this is uphill they're traveling at speed and uh, maybe the bottles are a little bit wet as well so that was another rider just uh, fudging that but this is actually a far bigger group this is kind of swifts in this group in second second place as well cavendish in there as well i just saw matt walls as well so there's there's all the riders in there and I think through that they'll have been trying to, to get that rolling a little bit to try and reduce this gap, but ultimately try and save a little bit to maybe light it up at Michael Gate, go over the top, be able to maybe bridge across to this group. I don't think with the quality in that group they'll be able to do it solo. They'll need to do it collectively as a two or three, maybe a four. Yeah, Fred right now up. moves to the front, keeping that pace high. Oh, and Ethan Hater. Hater. Hater's just moving round. Yeah, there is Hater looking good, just floating around the wheels. I don't think you'll need to... Uh, if you he can does. see, sorry, Matt, you can see Fred Wright just on the front, not going too hard now. So just sort of, I want to be at the front, but I don't want to ride too hard into this because I know what's coming. Yeah, because <laughs> even going quick down that descent, if you're the rider on the front, you're pushing into the wind, you're using energy and you want to try and hit, as you say, striking the balance of hitting hitting the bottom of the climb in a good position, but not being gassed at the same time. And, and often that's a really hard balance to take. If you move up too late, you can really put yourself into the red and go back very, very quickly on this time. It's a really, it's one of the hardest climbs of, you know, we both raced all over the world, but it's one of the hardest climbs, I think, to get right. It really is a tough yeah, one, isn't it? it There's is. a sweet spot and you rarely hit it uh, every lap, do you? No, you definitely don't indeed. And I think the main thing with this climb is not to go too hard at the bottom. You can really get carried away, but when you take that left hander at the top, it kicks up even more again and if you've not got anything in the legs really there to be able to accelerate again that's when it becomes very difficult as we see Tamfield just riding that path again all the riders but you can see how how much steadier they're going this time up I'm sure we're going to see the the group come into view in a minute here we go the peloton behind yes Matt Holmes on the left hand side Cavendish right towards the front Fred Wright Ethan Hayter there as well so all the riders in the same straight now in the same view that's it. great to hear the crowd banging the bells Rattling the bell, should I say, banging the boards and cheering these uh, riders on. Next time through, they will see eight laps to go. So this was the uh, the fifth ascent of the Michael Gate. So they're going to start to hurt a little bit now. They'll be starting to feel the pain of this climb. Dan Bigham struggling to stay with Jake Stewart up this climb. He's certainly not panicking. Ben Swift, the defending champion at the back there. A second from the back, wearing number one. The atmosphere starts to build and Jake Stewart there. He doesn't need to go off the front. He's got nothing to prove here. So uh, he's in a good position and just, just afford actually just to ease it off. So if you do manage to go clear on the climb, you can always save a little bit of energy by just waiting for the group behind. But yeah. I'm keen on seeing uh, what the reaction is from the bunch. And they're closing, aren't they? Yeah, they are closing. They're right on the back of them. So only 10 seconds roughly. But Ben Swift up that climb there as well, following what he thinks are the weaker riders. Um, so he rides at their pace, which is might be easier for him. So he's just doing that to save his own legs a little bit, not not putting the pressure on them, um, just letting them ride up at their pace and then getting over the top. And as we spoke about, using them again on the flat parts where they're stronger and being able to use the strength in numbers. Definitely straight uh, through the arch, the uh, old city walls there. As we look a little bit further down, these riders are going to really struggle to get back in. That, that is for sure. They're just going to drop further and further back. But it does look as if that group uh, with Mark Cavendish, or the remnants of the peloton are possibly going to get back in uh, contact with that front group. But again, what we often see, Adam, especially in this race, is 
you can almost reach out and touch them. The, the gap comes down to five or ten seconds, and then how many times does it just drift away and the group just goes away because you think, well, I've done this big effort, I don't want to be the last one to take him across in case somebody goes over the top. So you've got this kind of brinkmanship that happens every single lap, and time and time again, you don't quite catch the group in front. It's quite fascinating the way this part of the course evolves. Yeah, I mean, you can just see now what what they were doing up that climb, not going too hard, Ben Swift getting on the front, you can just see by his, his body position, just sort of rocking his shoulders a little bit, pushing on a little bit more. So they've gone easy up the climb, got on the top and they say, right guys, come on, we need to start going hard again because it's getting within touching distance. Two riders just off the front, and that's Charlie Quarterman from Trek Segafredo, these riders. So there is a group in front by the looks of things. Oh, this is what's happened. It's split up a little bit. I can't make out if that is trees in front or riders. I think it's riders. It yeah, is riders. They, those riders have been uh, been punted, haven't they? This is uh, There's the big group of the bunch containing the likes of Cavendish, etc. Matt Walls. They um, are just on the back of them, aren't they? Yeah. 10 seconds, 15 seconds, if that. You yeah, can look. see now swift the effort he's putting in. I oh, know, just to get me. He's, he's got a, a very distinctive style, Ben. He sits quite forward on the saddle. A lot of riders do when you're on the edge, but even when Ben kind of isn't on the edge, he's very forward on the saddle, sits quite low. But uh, amazingly strong rider. Bigham on the front, though. Being in front, uh, that was the, he was the one of two riders in that very early breakaway. Sam Watson, the rider in second position there, also in that early move. And uh, the way the race has unfolded so far, that certainly was the right thing to do because they are in a good position, but expending a lot of energy. And the group behind, the time check was suggesting, is 19 seconds. But they're moving quick. Um, again, on this long stretch of road, so, so easy to see them in front, but it's a difficult, it's a different matter trying to shut the gaps because they're moving quickly here. They are moving quickly indeed. You can see the gears, and this road is deceptive as well. It's a very, very difficult road. It sort of drops down ever so slightly until they cross the bridge there, and then it slowly just ramps up before they turn left towards the corner. And we saw on the previous lap Fred Wright trying to jump across to that group that we see now in front, and he wasn't able to make it. So although this road looks relatively easy, I'm going to say, it's definitely not. And you can just see Alex, Alexander Richardson on the front there from Swift Carbon Racing, Fred Wright behind him. That's Peters, isn't it? Alex Peters, sorry, sorry. So two Alexes, a few two Alexes. Alexes. It's like the Bens before, two Bens <laughs> in a break. Two Bens, two Alexes, no, Alex Peters. Good to see Alex Peters back in the midst. Connor Swift on the left-hand side, accelerates away. Again, one of those stealth Peter following now. Yeah, he knows Connor Swift is a very dangerous rider. He really has found his niche, hasn't he? Um, it's, it's, although the, he rides for a pro-continental team, essentially he's a world tour rider, really, isn't he? He's a real class, former national road champion. Yeah. And you can just see as well, he's ridden a Tour de France two times, he's a very strong rider, and just see hated the reaction. As soon as he moved there, it's just riders straight on him, like, right, here we go, we need to follow this quickly. <laughs> as you can just see the peloton lining out and out behind, and I think this is where you'll, we'll see this gap come down. If it still carries on like this, you can see just splits in the peloton, just being made ever so slightly. The riders will be aware of that and want to push on a little bit, string it out, the descent at the bottom again, if it's strung out at the bottom, push on, and it's, that's when the elastic starts to, to snap a little bit. You see Hayter committed now finally, the first time we've really seen him at the front so far this race. This is very interesting. Hayter, happy to ride. Also Swift, happy to ride. And also that rider from Ribble. But then what they're not going to do, because they've got a rider each in front, they're not just going to drag them along. They'll make a move if there's going to be a counter-attack, but what they won't do, they'll completely shut the door once they know who's behind them. So they're not going to drag a big group across. They will try and get across a little splinter move as Matt Walls of Border Hansgrove, the Olympic Omnium champion, no less, had, uh, now moves clear. Yeah, you can just see that they will be close behind. And it's interesting what Connor Swift did there. He's just trying to open up the gap a little bit with a teammate in the front still. He's also in the same boat as Hater that he has to, you know, if he's going to make that move across, he can't careful, take yeah. anyone with him. Yeah, he's got to be really careful about the way he does it. Unless it is the likes of, if he, if he was to go across with just Hater, maybe, brilliant. So it's just oh, two definitely. of them. And it's, it's just making sure whoever, you, if you do go on the attack and you get clear, it's just making sure who you're with is the right one. You can just see Fred Wright again on attack, Hater following him immediately, shutting it down. He doesn't want the likes of Fred Wright to get across. If he gets across, that's firepower out of this attacking group, which he's in. He wants to be able to go with that, but on these flat roads, he, he isn't going to be able to do it necessarily on his own. No, definitely. It's a really interesting one, though. Teamwork in the national championships is kind of different than, than any other race, really. Like the world, it's a kind of a different dynamic at play. Uh, everybody wants to win that jersey. Um, and they'll be hated with thinking, OK, this is an interesting situation, but what he can't be seen to do, and what he won't do, is a drag anybody dangerous across, but he will still try and make sure he's at the front of the race, but he's got to be very careful and mindful of the way 
that he does it as we head on to the descent again of Burton Village. Just lose our images briefly before we emerge out of the other side. This seems to be our little signal, a dead spot. It's that, cat, it's that little grid, that grate in the road that it does must it, be. I think, Matt. It must be that little grid. Here we go. Not only for the riders, but for the for the 4G as well. I got this corner wrong once. Just see where they went round. I went, I got caught the wrong side of somebody's wheel. Got took into the grit on the right hand side, straight over the bars. Um, but it was one of those really weird crashes where you just land on your feet, and somehow you, you, I was back on my bike before. Like a cat, so, yeah, cat I, 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 I was back on my bike, got in the line, and because the line was that long from the descent, I was in a reasonably like fifth or sixth wheel, and I was still in the, in, in the bunch. Brilliant. Amazing crash. Back before we had uh, <laughs> one of my favourite crashes when no, I wasn't injured. Brilliant. I crashed so many times in this race, mate. Brilliant. <laughs> all or nothing. All, all, or, nothing. all or nothing, mate. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant race. Great to have it back after a couple of years' absence. And I think we should, like we did earlier on in the, uh, the women's race, is give a nod and uh, some thanks to the organisers of this race and to Rafa and, Lincoln, and the Lincoln Grand Prix um, for combining both races and getting the national championships back up and running because it's an important massively important uh, championships and if you're just joining us for the very first time we've had the elite circuit race championships the time trial championships and the road championships held in the same location all centered around these beautiful rolling roads of lincolnshire looks to me as the gap's gone back out a little bit has a bit like i said well, before yeah. it got to like 10 seconds and now it's just gone out a little bit yeah it seems to be we've not we've not quite had the shots right over the top of michael gate yet but it seems to be that oh no there is a breakaway gone clear from the peloton so james shaw in there in the orange helmet so a riders fred wright as well looks to be bostock there or gibson as well from ribble well tight so these guys committing to this, and this is a good group that's going to chase across. Matt this Wall's in there as well. Laver Joe Laverick. Hater in there. Joe Laverick as well from Action uh, Bergens Harmon in the mix as well. So these guys will all commit to this now. Hater will do a little bit smaller turns. He'll contribute ever so slightly, but this is an opportunity for him to have a rest in a great position now, closing this gap ever so slightly with that group he's in, but able to just put his feet up again and go, you know what? I've got Ben Swift in here. I don't need to chase. If you guys want to bring him back, always you bring him back. It always amazes me when I've uh, commentated on this race before when it's been a Premier calendar and having ridden it, how in the space of a lap, because it's ridden so quickly across the board, even the bunch that get left, they're still moving at a kind of similar speed, how much it can change in a short period of time. We pan back, there was only a couple of attacks. In the space of 3K, we've got a big split off the front. It's amazing, isn't it, how quickly this, this race can change shape. Yeah, massively quick. And I think... You know, these riders that are in the front, they're all committed to it as well. We've seen how hard it is for break for breakaways to form. And it's always, we always talk about Michael Gate over the top of Michael Gate, but it's when riders are unaware and the descent seems to be playing a huge part in this race totally. massively. And they get to the bottom of it, if they can accelerate out of the corners, you can see how big that gap is there. And the speed that that, I know the camera angle makes it look very different, but the speed that that chasing group's going compared to this group is it's noticeable. It certainly is. Sam Watson takes them round that bend again for Team Inspired. The only problem is when this all comes back together, that group's too big. Oh, way mm. too big. Mm. Uh, they'll the be happy with it. That they'll, there'll be attacks left, right and centre. This yeah. group is optimum, isn't it? Yeah. The group behind, slightly unwieldy. Combine the two, no, no way is that going, is get that going forward. In fact, uh, there's a chance that the bunch behind might get back in contact yeah. again. And uh, as you quite rightly say, the size of group is crucial. But, like, again, it's, it's, you said before, it's ones and twos getting across this and swelling the size. Yeah, and it's full of big riders. All the favourites are in this chasing group, so it's not like it's a few riders won't be bothered about. It's the riders that, necessarily those riders in that front group, they don't want that group coming across because it's full of the riders who are the other favourites, the bigger names, the riders that they wanted to put distance in between to try and get rid of them. So they will not really want this to come back. And if it does, there's going to be a lot of stalemate in between it. As you said, Matt, you see Matt Holmes just right on the back there from Lotto Sedal just getting in contact as well. So a dangerous group that is going to come across to it and a group that can neutralise the race almost if they make contact. Yeah, this is a big group. Cavendish in there, Hater in there. Yeah, Alexander Richardson's at the back. We've seen Connor Swift in there as well. So it's a classy, classy move, and they are moving clear, but a couple of the riders from Trinity, I don't think Trinity are represented, so they're doing a little bit of chasing. Walls in the white jersey rolls it through to the front. Another bit of a furtive glancing behind. I don't think that rider um, from Ribble well tight is going to do too much, uh, too much riding because, of course, he has Dan Bingham in front. I think, though, in that team, they should ride. 
they should run in this instance. I mean, not too hard, but they, they're going to have strength in numbers. They're going to have three rather than two. And just they're the way sure that Bingham's well, yeah. been looking on the climb, he's not looked one of the stronger ones. He's not the big, punchy fast rider. He's a, he's a time trialist. And I think having the likes of James Shaw in there, that's, that's a better chance for that team. So if I was in Ribble, I wouldn't try and play the card of going, we're not going to ride here. I was like, no, we're, we're going to ride and try and bring this group back so we've got you know, three more, two more people that could try and win this bike race rather than just one. Yeah, beat and hate it. So, a good point. There's a couple of ways to slice that one, but that is that is a good point. And uh, with great respect to Dan Bigham, he's clearly flying today. Um, but whether he'll be there in the last couple of laps battling out with the World Tour riders remains to be seen. But James Shaw from that team, on the other hand, definitely could be there or thereabouts fighting it out for a medal or even the win. He really is going that well, especially if he plays a shrewd tactical game. He's got to be smart. That is um, really, really important. He definitely could be bluffing, though. Um, we see him bing him, you know, on that climb. We might just be bluffing. We don't know. He might just be taking it easy on that climb, trying to lure us into a false sense of security as the, the TV motorbike there moves up to the front. But yeah, it's all very... It's get, coming very close, and I think within this group, there'll come a point where they come through the feed zone again now, and they've got Michael Gate again. The riders in this group, they know it's a group that's gone off the front. They know the riders are trying hard behind, and... There'll be an element within this group where they go, let's just remember that Michael Gates coming across, that it's not too far away, so they can they can probably jump across to it and reduce that group. Alfred Wright rolls to the front as we get back to the sharp end of this race and our breakaway, which is relaying very, very well. Six riders strong. Matt Holmes now accelerates from this group behind. He's had a great couple of seasons with Lotto Sudal. And as Adam mentioned at the top of the programme, took that magnificent victory. And pretty much his debut few uh, months at the World Tour level. Came across from Madison Genesis and then won atop Wollonga Hill, beating none other than Richie Port, the king of Wollonga Hill, breaking his six-win streak. And since then, Matt Holmes has gone on from strength to strength, ridden numerous Grand Tours. Um, and is a real key component part Very of that squad. Very close behind that chasing. It looks it's like closing Trinity up. Sport. Yeah, they are dragging this back. I mean, it's only about five or six seconds by the looks of things. Yeah, I think from this group, though, we are going to see the, you know, the full fireworks show. We're going to see the bonfire alight at the bottom of the climb. Then we're going to see the eruption of fireworks on this climb to be able to, for these riders to be able to jump across. I think, I'm not too sure, I don't know how they're feeling, but if I was in that group and I was the likes of Ethan Hayter, I would look at this and go, I'm close to that front group. I've got to get across to it. If I can get across to it, I have to go solo. How am I going to do that? Kapow! Indeed. You're going to need to, uh, yeah, jump away. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> I just went I'm to karate chop Matt's arm then going, kapow! <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of lost for words at, uh, at your descriptive there. But uh, no, the junction has been made. That group has brought back that uh, dangerous counter-attack. Joe Laverick there with a blue helmet just trying to shut this gap down. One of the riders from... Canyon DHB Sun God has gone clear. Laverick there, the only representative here from uh, Action Bergen-Tarman, is uh, got back in contact there. So uh, Lewis Askey is on his wheel. And this Mark little move again, sorry Matt, this little move again, I think that everyone's sort of realised it's coming back together, they all work together and then, you know, when they got onto that big main road on the bottom there, they sort of started looking at each other going, no, I don't want to commit to it, I want to hold on a little bit, I want to save a little bit of energy, but this now here is also playing into the hands of that group behind, taking feedbacks along, slowing down ever so slightly, not too much, but the group behind, they probably won't take feedbacks, this is an important part of the race room, so they don't want to be faffing around getting feedbacks on and trying to put them in the bottles and carrying more weight up Michael Gate and all that kind of jazz. Jazz. Uh, exactly. No, well, quite quite often I used to run a, a one-bottle strategy in the Lincoln Grand Prix, just get a bottle every lap. Yeah, it was a bit risky if you lost one, but generally the longest you'd ever be without a bottle is about 10 minutes anyway, so there's always plenty of opportunities to get a bottle. And on that climb, although it's only around a minute of effort, you need to make yourself, if you can, as light as possible. As this uh, chase group now, James Shaw on the right-hand side, just on the wheel of Ethan Hayter, who does look very, very comfortable indeed. You can just see, can't you, that everyone's trying to not be on the front but get themselves in the in the position. You can see when it sort of swells the bunch. That is, we always see when we always know it's going fast when it's in a long line, but it's generally when it's all bunched up like this, that's when it's going quicker because everyone wants to be at the front. The pace increases, and that's exactly what's kind of happening now. Riders coming to the front. Ethan Hater, Fred Wright with Mark Cavendish on his wheel. So just riders trying to get in position but trying not to waste energy doing so. 
I think this is going to be back together over the top of the climb. Not back together, but I think that riders are going to be um, jumping across to this group, a it's select quite, few. It's quite possible, because again, I, I think uh, the way that they've ridden this on the last couple of laps, they're still thinking, well, there's a long way to go. So next time through, they will see seven laps to go. So we're not even quite halfway. So um, really? halfway round this next lap will be halfway. So this, this time up, uh, last time through was eight to go. Um, next time up, it will be seven laps to go. So we've still got, uh, once we get halfway round this next lap, we'll uh, reach half distance. It's an odd number, 13 laps, equating to 103 miles, 166 kilometers. But the crowd has really swelled here you as see we climb Jake, the Michael Gate once more. You see Jake Stewart there, just, he was on the front last time, opened up that last bit of a gap. He's, He's sort of looking at the other riders now, going a bit easier. Once again, Ben Swift in the middle of the road, but letting Bingham do the pace setting. You can just see the phones out in the background filming the riders coming through, the, the cowbells being shaken. So I'm sure we're going to see them come into vision and are oh, we going to start to see attacks from these riders? This is the easiest part of the climb, the last little bit of respite, but kicks up to the left. And Dan McClay just dropping off a little bit, as you said. That little bit they've just gone over. It actually flattens ever so slightly. It's just, a, you just, the pressure just eases from the legs, but uh, this is really interesting here. Ethan Hayter, it just makes it look so easy. Look at the rider struggling behind. He's, he's almost breathing through his nose here. Bigham leading them through. Just round that corner there. Look at the concentration on the face of the defending champion, Ben Swift there. And Dan McClay just on the back there. So uh, yeah, these six riders still going through next time. As they just pass that lap ball, that will say seven laps to go now. But, I um, think we're going to see Hayter come through here. We're going to see him come through over the top, take a look over his shoulder and just keep going with it. There he goes, coming there through solo. So there we go. We, what we he thought just might off his wheel. He yeah. just literally, he didn't even get out the saddle, Adam. He just rode them off his wheel. I mean, look at the varying states. We see Steve Lampier going through there. Uh, Matt Walls dropped back a long way. He was looking there through, as well. yeah. So um, there's a few riders really, really starting to suffer here. Laverick just there with his mouth agape, gulping in the air. But um, we, 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 we thought about this. Look at this. This is an amazing ride um, uh, by Ethan Hayter. Could he make it three? A long way to go yet, but he's certainly put himself in the frame. As we see, one of the Canyon DHB riders with a little bit of a mechanical here. Yeah, a little bit of mechanical. It looked to be Ethan Hayter, that motorbike there, just sort of moving and maybe positioning himself so they can let Hayter through. I'm sure we're going to see him just cut. There he is. Look how quickly and easy was that. <laughs> we, 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 Fred Wright. We kind of predicted that. I mean, not because we, we're trying to predict what's going to happen in the race, but we just know how good he's going. And he yeah. made that look easy. Just did his, just rode his own race. Uh, sadly for... If we could get pictures to that front of that bike race again, no. that would be brilliant. The Canyon DHB rider here, not going Bus to be stop. in tension in the, in the race again. But I think Fred Wright, just knowing that this is the moment, knowing that he has to get across to this. I think he's got Connor Swift on his wheel there, trying to come with him as well. So a select few rides, but you can see Swift. He'll be aware of Hayter getting on the back of it. And that group behind looks to be coming back, but only with three riders. So it's Fred Wright, Lewis Askey, Connor Swift as well. And one rider, I can't make how it is, but... This will be the select group there now. Hater getting across with, with damage in the legs, yeah? That was amazing. He made that look so, so easy. Just crossed that 15, 20 second gap with ease. Didn't really even look, he looked like he could have gone a lot harder, but even jumping across the gap for Hater was completely measured, wasn't it? <laughs> Swifty I mean, looking going. Oh, I hope. How did you oh, get here? Oh, all right, Ethan. <laughs> He's looking across. I'm here, mate. Uh, thanks for waiting for me. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. So Swift, Ben Swift looks around, checks the gap. And there is a lot of daylight, a lot of looking around here, just reassessing the situation. That's pretty normal. Every looks like Cavendish is trying to come across the gap in a little group as well. So this is a key, key part of this race. Remember, seven laps to go. Halfway through this lap, we will be at half distance. Yeah, this group will be, unless you get across to this quickly, which is going to be a superhuman effort to do, unless you get across to this now, you are going to have to have something special like Ethan Hayter did to be able just to nip across to it as he did and still unbelievable really when you look at it, how he literally got across you know we saw him on the climb and he sort of looked back and sort of saw he had a bit of a gap accelerated and that shot we had him at the the finish he was you know he was 10 15 seconds in front of the that the riders chasing him so he's got and already on the front so he's as we know with ethan he's won the time trial already run the criterium already he's got clear intentions today what he's going to do and just seeing what he did there he's um He's looking... I bet yeah. Swift is thinking, oh, out of all the people to come across, Indeed. it's nice to have a teammate, but... Yeah, it's, uh, he's looking imperiously good, he really is. Um, you can just again, see generous. 
Sorry, Matt, you can just see Connor Swift just missing turns, Fred Wright missing turns. So the effort that took them, they're wanting to recover still, they're wanting to get a breath, they're wanting to just sit on a little bit and try and relax almost. The face of Fred Wright there, just teeth are gritted. And Hater, when you see him on the front, just it just looks like he's on a really fast chain gang that he's loving. He certainly does. He's enjoying it. He was all smiles the other day when he won the circuit race championships and uh, just the way that he took that at the last turn. Um, he's really uh, mining a rich, rich vein of form at the moment. But uh, the Ineos Grenadiers are the uh, only team now in this front group, if I'm right. No, then no, we've got two from Arkea Sanzi as well. And two from Group Armour. Yeah, well, yeah, we've got um, two from Group Armour. So is that, is that, is that Pidcock? Um, no, it's not. It's, it's uh, ASCII, isn't it? That's yeah, Jake, Jake Stewart and Askey, yeah. Yeah, Jake Stewart and Askey. Sorry, so Stuart, Stuart on the back, looking around and just about to get back in contact as Hayter gets on the front well, as well. Well, not quite there, yeah. He might have a problem. There were rear tyres. I wonder what happened there, because he, he looked good. That uh, surprised me. I think this just shows how hard they're actually riding. I can't make out if there's any, if he's got a problem or not there, but it looks to be like... He's struggling, isn't he? Front wheel or rear wheel look. If you look at his rear wheel, it looks to be going down by the things, but just bumping a little bit. Or the front I can't make out. He's not managing to get back on here, is he? He's, uh, he's going to make it, I think, but um, just the speed of it, it's a real, it gives you a massive impression of the effort it is just to stay out in front on, on your own in this race, just using the slipstream of that moto there, hauling his way through. You can get a sense of the immense, he's probably doing six, 700 watts trying to get across this gap now. Finally, that uh, the kind of resistance and his, his head dropped there, that was a big, big effort. I'm yeah. not too sure what happened there, whether somebody let the wheel go jumped him and left him out in no man's land which sometimes happens but um that's going to cost him dear a little bit later on but jake stewart back in at the fold of this group we have in front as the we riders, drop down burton village again the also riders in that group might not be aware of that we are because we can see it but if you could see that and you saw it happening then that you would take a little bit of motivation from it thinking oh there's one rider already suffering here we don't have to worry about him anymore really it looked to me like he had a puncture, but I don't think he has because he's going flat out down the descent. Yeah, well, he's, uh, he yeah he, he's, he's looking right as we just lose pictures temporarily. Showing us the, uh, the assembled crowds on the climb of the Michael Gate. We're heading into around six and a half laps to go. Next time through, it will be six laps to go for the field. And that's another one of these little meta views. We're looking at the video screen. We're commentating on the video screen in Lincoln. But no, it is a uh, magnificent race. It's been a wonderful few days racing. Ten national champions jerseys have been uh, are to be given out over the, the space of these uh, four or five days. The final two today. Remember, this is the men's elite championship, but incorporated into this race is the under-23 national road race championships as well. And what we saw in the women's race earlier on was a spectacular race. It was five for Georgie. Uh, who took the win there for Team DSM and took the under-23 title because only 21 um, and the senior title in the process and, and Josie Nelson took two silver medals as well so it really is a case of young riders to the fore. I think we also have to remember as well that when we talk about Ethan we look at him as a, a new British rider and he seems to be again Jake Stewart it just it's can't just work out what is what is quite going on at the minute. I think if he had a problem, we'd have, we'd have seen it, but just losing contact on the scent and fighting his way back again. He might, his legs might have just gone. You never know, but it is odd what we're seeing because he's, um, you can see the riders in the front, they're not struggling too much, but he is just shaking his head a little bit there yeah, and that's, sitting up by the looks I of things. I wonder if he's riding on a, on a softening tyre and that's what's making it hard. Um, and then he's just waiting because he's, this is really strange. Something's either he's blowing or there's something wrong and there's a softening tire. It doesn't look to be, his tires don't look to be softening to me. Um, again, just an illustration of how quick they're going on this flatter section. Gets onto the wheel of Askey, who'll be a teammate with him next year at the World Tour level. Uh, Askey, a very, very talented rider indeed, but maybe he's just struggling a little bit and just lost a little bit of concentration on one of those corners. Because if you, if you corner just a little bit slower than the, the riders in front, you can lose so much, especially given that crosswind. Yeah, definitely. As I was saying about Ethan Hayter there, is that he's, um, we have to remember at the Tour of, the Brit Tour of the Britain, Tour of Britain, he was um, he was fighting it out against literally the two best riders in the world, Wout van Aert and Julian Alaphilippe, and going toe-to-toe -to -toe yeah. with him. It's, um, I think the level he's at at the minute is just, it's, it's unbelievable, really. And I think if we put Wout van Aert into this race and Alaphilippe, you'd go, well, they're the clear favourites, obviously they're clear favourites, but we have to put Ethan in that category. 
because he's of that calibre now. He's that rider that he's been able to hold on to those riders in those difficult situations. So for me, he's just the way he nipped across to that gap. And I, I say nipped, he literally did just nip across of it. It was only 30 seconds and he was on the back of that group. Yeah, he's, he's quite incredible. When you look at the, um, like the big world tour, I mean, fourth in the uh, Bretagne Classic as well, which is a really renowned classic and almost kind of borderline kind of monument status, I guess. Winner of the Tour of Norway with two stages. Uh, winner of the Vuelta Andalusia, along with two stages. Uh, you know, a stage win in the Vuelta al Galve, second overall there. Uh, and the list goes on, a stage win in the Settimana Internazionale, Coppia Bartoli as well. So he's had a sensational season. Um, and the way he's looking at the moment, he's kept that form all the way through, which has been, it's not just the results though, Adam, it's the consistency of the form. The fact he's hit the ground running and kept it as well, did little bits of dips, but essentially, all the way through from February to October, he's been winning bike races. Yep, he has done. I think that is one of the, the key things with him is that we used to see back in the past the riders would enter races to, to get race fit almost. They're going to races to do training where that doesn't happen anymore. The riders that come into races are there to win it and it's always the consistent ones which are worth the weight in gold. Um, which Ethan is at the minute. You know, every race that he's going to, he's performing and he's doing brilliantly. And so he's, yeah, along with him and Pidcock it, within that team, I think they are, you know, the young riders which are going to be, you know, the next Geraint Thomases and, you know, the next Chris Frooms. And, you know, it, they are of that calibre. And if I was Sir Dave Brailsford, I'd be um, scrapping up that contract and writing them out a big, big number to try and secure them because they are the riders of the future in that team at the minute, I think. Yeah, I'm wondering if we'll see, although Ethan Hayter is contracted to the end of 2022, so there's a contract already in place for him. I think they'll be wanting to, uh, um, yeah, make sure they've got his services Hater for... Look, for sorry, yeah, yeah, did you see that? It looked like it, it, that was almost the thing you do if you're testing if you've got a soft tyre, wasn't yeah. it? Just banging the, the front or back. I mean, He did it, look behind as well on that flatter road, that narrow road. He kept looking where the car was and still sitting on the back. Maybe he does have the flat and just without the cars being able to come across, he's probably just waiting, waiting, waiting and hoping eventually that they do come and you can even see behind i don't know if there is a commissaire motorbike alongside them with them there should be and if there is he can signal to that but you can just see him chatting to to tanfield and maybe saying i've got a flat and he's like no come on you well it doesn't i mean i'm just looking at his will i know it's difficult to say but they are opening a gap now this is a good good move strong strong move fred wright just swinging to the back onto Look the how wheel short of the turns are as well yeah, now. Yeah. Well, they, they can afford to do that. They, they're shorter on the front, but quicker on the front, because there's, there's, that's, the, that's what you get when you have a bigger group. You can keep that pace a little bit higher, and you get more rest as well. It's just uh, it's the yeah. way it works, and everybody in this group so far is working equally. There's nobody really sit, that's seeming to uh, sit on as we look at uh, another former champion. I the think two cousins can. in this race that are the two former road race champions, defending champion on the back, Connor Swift, winner a couple of years ago. Um, just swinging off the front now as well. I think you'd have to start sitting on now, you know. I'd, I'd definitely be start trying to, to miss turns, sit on a little bit, just say it's not within my religion to start pulling on the front. I'm sorry, guys, I just can't do it. Um, and just try and miss some turns, save a bit of energy. It's a big enough group where there's enough riders in there which you can afford to, to miss a few turns, you know, and save your energy. But the likes of this man on the front on the right-hand side, I think he, um, by the looks of things and what we can take from it, he can probably afford to do double, triple the amount of turns and I think if you're a rider within that group I would try and force him to do that I would push him to do more I'd miss turns and I'd say no come on you have to do it you're the hot favorite you pull more than me you want this more than me so come on pull yeah. your weight a little bit it is uh, absolutely fascinating and there we go Dan McClay rolls through Dan Bigham on his wheel a few conversations a lot of chatter going on at the back here uh, with Eaton Hater but um, whatever the problem might have been he certainly is still rolling through. And his tyres don't look quite often, even from the pictures, you can actually see, can't you, when a tyre starts to soften. Um, he looks actually OK. The way he's uh, able to ride out the saddle with no problem at all. Um, but I, I've been in situations like that where you sometimes just bad legs. You think your tyres are going soft, and it's actually your legs that are going soft. This <laughs> story of my <laughs> career, that, Matt. Or, or, <laughs> or back when we used to just, back before disc brake, caliper brakes, you think, oh, my brakes got to be rubbing. You look back. I got off, but I think I might have said this before, but World Championships 1989, Chambéry, um, first time up the mountain, up the, 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 up the climb, I got off and spanned my back wheel and realised it just wasn't going very well. 
uh, it right. was it was true and uh, it wasn't touching so I just got back on the bike to chase but I was so psyched out by how yeah. hard it was I thought the brakes have got to be touching yeah but that was my first experience of riding the world championships and I thought well it's just hard yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I think that's all bike racing nowadays isn't it I, I think unless you're, that. unless you're absolutely flying you always have that doubt in your mind and this is the moment look hater there's, there's this little glance he does in a minute and look how rock steady he is on the bike just not moving looks back and then just just almost turns the gas on, realises he's got a tiny gap and thinks, right, now this is it. And the next shot we basically see of him is coming round this corner. And then the one after that, this is him now just coming round the corner. There he is within 10 seconds. And the next shot we get of him, he's literally just riding onto the back of the group. It's yeah. unbelievable. Really, really strong. And uh, they didn't overcook it either. It wasn't this big acceleration we often see riders when they jump across the gap. It's an all-in effort, but it was a really measured, just a, a slight increase of pace, which was enough to burn everybody else off, get him across the gap, and that provided the catalyst for the other riders to come across, including Connor Swift, who's just uh, thrown another bottle off. And uh, this gap is really starting to open up now. And, and this has settled down now because we're halfway through the race now, well over halfway, in fact. Um, still a long way to go. Still another five ascents, six ascents of the Michael Gates. These riders now are thinking, right, this is a pretty serious selection. Even the group behind is a lot smaller than it was. I've now got to think about the la latter part of the race. And we do need a point just to just just to take the foot off the gas, uh, keep enough momentum to keep that gap there, yeah. but really start moderating your effort and saving something for the end now. Yeah, I think as well, when you look at the teams that are in here, we spoke about at the start, you've got River well tight in there. They've only got one rider in this group, and I think it's, it's no disrespect to Bingham, but I think he would quite like strength in numbers towards the front. So if I was the River well tight director, and I'd say, look, lads, we've got to commit some riders. Some of you aren't going to win today, but we need to be able to bring, and I think the, the best rider for it is get on the front to get James Shaw back in, in contention with this. Let's actually give him a chance, because at the minute, they haven't got a chance at all of, of getting a result. But if they ride on the front, are able to bring James Shaw in, or at least bring it back to within touching distance, maybe on the next lap up the climb, you might be able to jump across. But I think for the British teams, they, um, they need to pull together a little bit and just try and, never mind just putting one rider in, but almost bring the whole race back and start again and not miss the move. Yeah, it is. Um, they've been riding well, but the fact they haven't got anybody in this front move is a little bit of a surprise. Um, they'll be trying to assess the situation, what they can do. But uh, also, the one thing that you, uh, whatever your tactics, if the legs aren't good collectively uh, on a course like this, this is no hiding place at all. And they clearly didn't have the firepower to go across with the riders that went across with uh, off the back of that little move by Ethan Hayter there. So there was an opportunity there, and there was riders fighting. There was a couple of riders from Trinity at or near the head of affairs as well, but they just did not have that extra bit of punch, that extra bit of bite needed as Harry Tanfield now moves clear. I think uh, partly in due to his uh, confident cornering, opened up a little bit of a gap. He's just going to find his own way up. Um, and you quite often find that riders pick the similar line every time, so he's riding on the right-hand side here, isn't he, as well? But uh, just looks just that little bit awkward, isn't he, shifting his weight around? Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Sorry, Matt. It's interesting that Askey on the front just looking like he's just pressing on a little bit and trying to make things hard for the riders. I think if I was him now, you've still got, coming through up to, up to line now, six laps to go. It's still a long, long way to go of this bike race. So I think for him, he needs to just think about this and go, oh, take a breath, cool down a little bit, save your energy. It's not the time to do this. We see Hater look, just when he just wants to come to front, all right, yeah, I'll go past you and I'm, I'm fine with it. And that's sort of, he's... He's pushed on a little bit as we see Bingham starting to stuff now. Jake Stewart, again, we've seen him suffering already, but look at Hater. And I think when you look at Askey, when he, he went hard on the bottom of the climb, and it, then he's suddenly gone over the, not over the top, but halfway up and realised, oh, God, this is quite hard. And then that's the point where, you know, Hater comes past him, and you've got to react to that again. If he didn't do that, he might have rode up slower. He'd have more in the tank to follow it. Um, so it's, it's almost opening up a, a can of worms for yourself this early on. Certainly is. Well, I don't think he was kidding. Was he number 50, Jake Stewart? I think that. I don't think he's going to get back on six laps, laps to go now. It's uh, the, field as well. Just yeah. Off the back ever so he's just starting to struggle. It's just it. What is? It's kind of strange. Or oh, this is a James Shaw trying to get across the gap. Now it's a big attack from James Shaw. This is another little group that uh, looks like Matt Walls at the back of that group. So another counter attack. We didn't see that one form from that from the main bunts, but James Shaw is now trying to get across this gap with one of the riders from SEG Racing. We'll just get confirmation of who, who that is with him. So Shaw has company in the form of Sean, Sean Rim, um, riding for SEG. 
Yeah, I think it's going to be a difficult ask now. I think the only way that these he'd be able to get across really is if these riders started just slowing down ever so slightly, looking at each other, not wanting to push on too much, and that would give the opportunity then for sure to get on board. But by the way these riders are riding, I think, you know, dispatching of, of a few riders there, Bingham and Stewart, Tamfield seem to be in a little bit of stress. Um, he'll probably do shorter turns now, knowing that he's suffering, knowing the speed they went up the last climb. So probably a rider that isn't going to commit too much to the front. Um, saying that, he's back on the front now, pushing on already. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a lad who knows how to suffer, that is for sure, and trying to do what he can. But that uh, last time up was clearly struggling a little bit. Hater just made it look so easy. That's, I don't think I've ever seen a rider in this race so, so comparatively different um, to everybody else. Everybody else really gives gives away the fact that they're suffering and having to really make an effort to haul the bike and their frame over the over the climb but Hayter was quite well he seemed to be just floating and really really in control it looked at any point now well on the climb he could have just gone but he doesn't need he doesn't want to do that yet of course that would be stupid as we see Mark Cavendish getting um, is in the convoy there uh, at least a minute and a half adrift don't think we'll be seeing Mark Cavendish at the front but uh, good to see him at the championships but uh, Clearly, from what I've seen there, it's not going to be his day today. No, I think with Cav, you know, he's, he's come here to win. He's not come here to get second or third. And I think when totally. the race goes away from you, that's it. Your motivation's gone. He's finished now. His season's probably done. So that's it, sadly, for Mark. But looking forward to next year. He's, uh, I don't know if he's sorted his contract yet or not, but got big fish to fry for next year. So it's um, yeah, not too much of a shame for Mark Cavendish, I don't think. Oh, not blimey. In this we see him here just towards the back and seemingly just sitting up. Um, but yeah, I think with, with Hayter, when, when I really do think about him, when we watched him on the Tour of Britain up that Great Orm climb, we had Alaphilippe, Michael Woods, Wout Van Aert sort of attacking all the way up here, and Hayter just stayed seated the whole way up it, just stuck to his own pace. And when you look at him here, it's, it's sort of like he's stuck to his own pace, but he's not responding to anyone. He's just he's dictating it of what he has to do, and just his body language. He's a very stiff rider in terms of he never moves his body at all under any circumstances. Doesn't give I've anything away, him. does he? No, so it's... It's hard to know how he's feeling, but just looking at him on that climb there, it was sort of like, oh, you finish your turn, OK, I'll go past sort of thing. It's almost like he's unaware of how strong he is. Yeah, it's a... It's a Must it's be a, nice. It's, it's a funny one, yeah, <laughs> by me. So there he is, dropping back a little bit. Ben Swift and Ethan Hayter, the two representatives from the Ineos Grenadiers in this front group. Two representatives also from Arkea Samzik teammates at the French second division team that's Dan McClay and Connor Swift Connor Swift the former champion Harry Tanfield just towards the back of this group that's it that's quite nice being offered if he needs any uh, any gels and we will see that won't we uh, some teams will combine the world tour teams if they have got a team car here uh, will no doubt make sure the other world tour riders are looked after for the exact reasons that you said there's there's quite a homespun feel, feel to the national championships and that's across the board every country is the same because they don't have the back of the big teams they're kind of a little bit isolated so they will collaborate in terms of uh, getting service yeah the world tour teams they used to um the world tour riders team in the Aust team sky back in the day they'd they'd send the bus to the races and all the the riders that weren't as many as there are now, really, but they were able to use the Ineos bus, they were able to use the showers, they were able, the swan years made food for them, used to get massage off of them as well, so they really helped out their other riders, and I think that was in the last four years, and Rod Ellingworth set that up, but before that, it was, the Nationals was like a get-together around the World Championship, so making everyone aware of the world, riding together, building that, that team sort of bonding up between the British riders that might go to, to the world, so Team Sky back then, which was heavily involved with British cycling, I think still is to a, to a certain extent, made that happen um, to try and make the difference to go into the races like the World Championship. No, you're certainly right. It's a, it's a wonderful event. But uh, it looks as if uh, Lewis Askey has a team car there, the FDG team car. And, uh, Connor Swift just uh, having a little bit of a word as the FDG team car moves up to Askey. Uh, going to be riding at world tour level next year a real talent uh, bit of a surprise to see jake stewart be dropped from this group but i don't think we'll be seeing him again and uh, just looked to be suffering a little bit was in all sorts of turmoil earlier on but uh again he's a rider that uh, has been riding well all year and it's uh, for a lot of riders because of the how late this race is it's just hard to keep that form this deep into the season isn't it oh, he's uh, taking his chain rings off i think that's hollywood by the looks of things so he's both chain rings, little ring and big ring there, just falling off his crank, sadly. So he's, um, Damien Clayton, apologies. 
it's really, no, powerful. Unless uh, some bolts have... I don't know. I don't want to predict anything. I don't want to, you know, um, talk about equipment failures that I'm not sure of. But that, I've never seen a rider holding all of his chain rings and walking up a climb. That's very, very strange. Yeah. It, yeah, I don't think I've seen that before either. It's um, a shame for him also, being <laughs> departing a bike race because of that. I think he was one of the original attackers, at, maybe the very first attacker of the bike race. Yeah, that's very strange. Never seen that before. But uh, at least he's OK. And he's straight to the pits and uh, a hot shower. So, yeah, looks a little bit puzzled there, as are the rest of us, to be perfectly honest with it. So it looks like he's just going to shepherd his bike back. It's never much fun walking in uh, cycling cleats, but a very, very strange mechanical situation there, one of which I have never seen before in uh, my commentary career. And uh, I think you're the same, Adam. No, I haven't indeed, or within racing. I've never seen it happen before, but no. asking out on his own within this group, so a little bit more, oh, I'm going to say stress he'd be riding for himself anyway i think in this situation you don't really you don't ride against your teammates but you don't necessarily ride together you wouldn't chase them down but at the same time you'd um you'd let them go almost um you'd use it to your advantage if you could um, but now being on the only on his own he has to pay a little bit more attention as we see tamfield he's still pulling big big turns isn't he he's um considering he was just distant at the top of that climb you'd think he'd try and save a bit of energy a little bit more, pull shorter turns maybe. I'm wondering if uh, Harry is still looking, I know he's looking for a contract for next year, I mean his team, we don't know what's going to be happening to Quebec and Next Hash as they're, they're now known next year. They've uh, not managed to meet the first deadline for the World Tour registration. Uh, he's just trying to put on a show I think, you know, he's, he's clearly riding very well in the, in the Criterium Championships, the Circuit Race Championships the other day. And he is a rider always, I think even when he starts to suffer, uh, if he's in a break, he'll always pull through until he explodes when he's a rider that's, and he's clearly in good form as well. He performed well in some crits, in some commesses, should I say, in Belgium recently, a couple of podium spots. So clearly in good form. And he's just one of those riders that would just keep riding and riding and riding. Um, maybe not um, tactically fantastic in that regard. And sometimes you look at riders and think, well, if he just backed off a little bit, just thought about that situation. Um, but, but on... But on the other hand, to have riders that you, you can mould the other way, it's it's better to have somebody that's a big, big engine that's willing to work and, and learning along the way than just somebody who's got no engine and just, you know, it's uh, all about the tactics, I guess. But uh, he's certainly a rider that gives it 100%. And the other riders in this group would be more than happy to have him along for the ride as well. Oh, yeah, if they can keep him in here and doing the turns he's been doing, then, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Fantastic for those riders within that. But... As you said, Matt, you're just that point where you just think, oh, I've, I've suffered a bit up that last climb there. That's the hardest part of the course. So maybe just back just off a back, little bit. Sit the back just, for yeah. a mile or two. Yeah. And give yourself a bit of a rest, just get rest. some food down. Yep, exactly. Um, I think we're going to see a little bit more of that. Lewis Askey, as I just missed a turn as well. Uh, one of the youngest riders in this group. Uh, Askey, only 20 years of age. Um, but a fair play to Sam Watson, a rider we don't know much about riding in the green jersey there of Team Inspired. He's been away since the gun, well, not since the gun, since the opening lap when he went away with Dan Bigham. Dan Bigham has now dropped back. Um, we haven't got a time check recently for you, but the fact that we've got all of the team cars in the gap now, Adam, suggests this gap is uh, well over a minute. Yeah, this is definitely not coming back. We've seen James Shaw trying to bridge across. We've not seen anything of him since, and we didn't see anything in the background from those pictures. So, um, yeah, it's going to be difficult for, for any riders to come back in contention now. See the Team GB car coming up. That's got the, the bikes on from Matt Walls there. Or Fred Wright just going to get some assistance. I believe it might be Matt Bramier in there in the team car. We'll be able to have a little close look. Yeah, it is Matt Bramier there in the team car, just saying, calm down, maybe. Look at Ethan. He knows exactly what he's doing. Fred, he's ridden the Tour de France, being a part of... Just trying to listen in to try and hear what he's saying. Yeah, it is indeed uh, Matt Bramier in the team car there. It's quite a, an, an interesting one, isn't it? You've got the GB team manager. Um, but obviously helping out the World Tour pros, but uh, how do you give impartial advice? You've just got to be kind of neutral advice here, isn't it? Do you need anything? You can't give them ta uh, a tactical play, can you? Because they're all on different teams, um, which is a really interesting one. So I don't think he'll be giving them tactical advice here. As we look at this uh, interesting little chase group that's developed here, great riding by James Short. I think what's interesting within um we always used to sit down, as I mentioned, about doing those sort of little get-togethers with the team and the, the World Tour riders. We always said, 
on the on the team bus before, you know, Ineos as a team collectively they had their meeting, we weren't a part of it and you know the likes of Cav, Dowsett, um, Dan McClay, Scott Thwaites back then, you know, we'd all back then he's still racing, sorry Scott, um, but we'd always have that chat between us, just we wouldn't ride as a team, but we wouldn't ride against each other. And I think that was across the board with Ineos as well, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't try to ride to make each other's life harder until it came down to the crucial point. But at the same time we'd we'd always want to keep the jersey in, within a world tour team so it's it's just being aware of the situation but i think in this group now even with dan um dan mcclay there and connor swift they there'll become a point where one rider is stronger maybe and they'll say i'll try and help you a little bit the same with swift and ethan um a little bit but ultimately you know if, if ben goes up the road before ethan ethan can go you know what I'm fine with that, I'm fine with it. And then he yeah. can maybe make his move as he did before to try and jump across to Ben and then they fight out between them. But it's basically, if they are going to ride as individuals, it's not, if you're going to ride against the individuals, it's making sure at least one of you wins still. If neither of you win and you've been racing against each other, psh, ridiculous. Yep. Ollie Cookson there, the son of Brian, Brian yeah. Cookson. Yeah, Ollie Cookson, been the DS at this uh, squad for a couple of years now, having a, a, a word with his young liege. Yeah, and the coach there of Ben, Ben Swift and Ethan Hayter in there, Connor, he's sat in the car, analysing probably. These riders might get on board, you know. They could, did, a moment ago, this is uh, James Short from uh, Rivel Welltype and uh, Sean Flynn from uh, SEG Racing, they do appear to be closing the gap. There's more of a relaxed atmosphere in this front group. They know they've got a good gap. They know that the race is, uh, is really fractured behind. Every time we go up the Michael Gate, the buncher thins out. Although this is a Matt Holmes. Well, 20 seconds it is for the chasers and the bunch a little bit further down. It looked from that shot, the bunch hadn't actually turned left on to Long Lays Road. There was oh, still, but there's a been an attack, attack off the front, yep. So uh, short. Maybe it's Tanfield. Yep, Tanfield trying to get that gap before the climb. Yeah, he's Give worried about it, isn't he? <laughs> And also, he's the kind of rider, even if you kind of... We've seen riders before get go clear on this circuit lose time on the climb but extend it on the flat sections riders who haven't got the confidence on the climb and i think that's exactly what we're seeing here we know how good a time trial as tanfield is but this is an interesting little duo getting across the gap and they i think they might get in contact let's have a little look at the gap in front yeah they've yeah, really far, really closed yeah. this up haven't they brilliant ride this this is basically almost a full lapse effort done so when they get onto onto michael gate again they can see the riders ahead of them it's just about judging their effort and not trying to if they've got the legs to sprint across but they need to be aware of the riders in front that they might um, push on a little bit more so if you're going to push on and maybe distance another rider um, his compatriot there and do it solo it might be become harder so it's just sticking to your guns and sort of knowing your own effort really and judging what the riders in front are going to do as the chase group behind still chasing it's Charlie Tanfield on the front they're still trying to bring this race back a little bit but these guys are just in the feed zone and those guys are not quite under the bridge yet so still a good minute and a half i'd say behind this group here well this is a charlie tanfield has just accelerated away from this uh, small group of riders in good form matt holmes there alexander richardson as well richardson just talking to a couple of the riders from the swift pro carbon uh, team just tell them to calm down not panic a little bit and matt holmes bringing back tanfield up this a uh, little drag and the other tanfield well, he's a romping away at the top. So looking very, very smooth here. Very powerful rider. For a tall lad, he gets very, very aero. Local fan club there for Ross Lamb as well on the right-hand side. <laughs> it's good to see him doing this, so he's just getting ahead of it. As though Ethan Hayter just keeping a check on things and just bringing it back in a little bit. It'll be interesting to see if Ethan there jumped across on his own to that, or if he... No, he didn't. He's brought it all back together. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure... Is Tanfield is one of those riders you just do not want to give him too much headway. You don't want to relax too much. You can sense the fatigue now in these riders' legs. Eight riders out in front, two riders coming across the gap. Just the composition of this group as we drop down uh, into Yarborough Road and commence the climb of the Michael Gate very shortly. Two riders from our care, Sam's it, Connor Swift and Dan McClay. Sam Watson in the green of Team Inspired. This is James Shaw coming across the gap along with Sean Flynn. I think when, sorry Matt, I think when you look at Sam Watson as well, he's doing a, a heck of a ride so far. He's been in that original breakaway there with Bingham and now he's still in this group and if we look at all the riders in here, all these teams ride the Tour de France. Yeah. If I was him, I'd be like, look guys, this is a treat for me to be in this group. Yeah. I, I deserve to be in here, but at the same time, 
you guys are going to have to do the majority of the work. And I'm just going to sit here. So they, they, and they, I think at this point, they'll be acutely aware that he's been away all day, and they won't actually, if he thinks about this. And this is where um, you need a little bit of advice from a DS if you can. Just say, look, relax. You're not going to be expected to work here. These riders um, will use you. But if you sit on the back, they're certainly not going to have a row with you, especially at this late stage. Um, and they, I don't think they'll see him as a, as a major threat. They'll be happy that he works on the flat, but if he gets if he gets dropped, it will just be instantly forgotten. So he can use that to his advantage, can't he? Yeah, definitely. I think if he misses a few turns here and there or just goes easy a little bit when he's pulling through or, you know, just keeps putting his hand up to say he's getting a little bit of food and that might be just having a little bit of a chat with the director, that just misses out a few turns that he can do and ultimately just try and save himself for as long as he can in this race. It's um, He doesn't have any expectations so far from anyone. What he's doing so far is, is absolutely brilliant. He's got his own expectation of what he wants to do. And I think, you know, getting to the finish and getting on the podium is massively one of them. And let's not forget the under-23 national jersey is there, which he... He oh, definitely. He's going to go for, obviously. Um, so, yeah, James Shaw, though, not far away. Yeah, looks like they're about 15 to 20 seconds behind. James Shaw with Sean Flint. This is Lewis Askey of uh, the under 23 FDG squad. Now, look at the face there of, the, uh, well, of Ethan Hater in a uh, third or fourth row. Again, not paying me at all. And, uh, it is. Connor, sorry, Dan McClay, sorry, Connor Swift is actually uh, following uh, Heskey, Askey around that corner, left and right, classic kind of side-by-side -side drag strip up this climb, urged on by the crowd here in Lincoln. Wonderful atmosphere as the race slowly winds towards its climax. He's just backing things off a little bit. Fred Wright, fourth wheel, Connor Swift in fifth wheel, the champion a couple of years ago. Really important that these two measure this effort, uh, Adam. They've still got a good chance of getting over the top. Tanfield just starting to struggle. Look at his face. Desperation written on his face, but he's just managing to hold on by his coattails. No wonder he tried to go earlier on. Yeah, I think as well that climb was ridden a little bit easier from this front group. We saw Ryan's being dropped the last time up, still trying to whittle that group down because it was rather a large group. So just maybe just being happy with the situation. We saw Hayter just sitting in the middle of the road, Ben Swift just behind him as well. And not seem seemingly being in uh, an urgent rush show for I think for the group that time just riding relatively easy I'm going to say up the climb there that time yeah definitely and on the left hand side is uh, Alexandra Richardson this is one of the riders from the Swift Carbon there's a big big acceleration actually pretty impressive Matt Holmes from Lotto Sudal in the black and white kit just behind struggling to hold on to his wheel this is James Shaw and this Sean Flynn bit. yeah this is really hard really hard <laughs> although it looks slightly downhill it's just it's all still slightly dragging. It just drags ever so slightly up. So the recovery is non-existent at the top yeah. of this climb. It's just about keeping that same effort you did on the climb going all the way over the top and basically all the way until the descent, which is a good 4K, 5K. It's, it's just so strange. Most climbs, um, you do get a descent pretty much straight away, don't you? Uh, which is quite normal. So you're used to going into the red and having the opportunity to take a bit of a breath, but here that you, there isn't one. And that's why pacing on the climb is so crucial to enable you to carry that momentum over the top. So it's a it's a really complicated climb for 200 meter, 250 meters of cobbles. It's um, that the after effects, um, given the nature of this course, uh, are in play for a long time on this circuit, aren't they? Yeah, awful, absolutely <laughs> awful. Definitely. <laughs> There is really only a little bit of respite, and it's down through the that downhill later on, on that sort of um, that flatter road at the bottom, all the way till you start dragging up to the feed again. But with such a big group in there as well, it's um, you know you can just see Hater again, just easing off the. He back, lays missing. off, doesn't he? It always lays off the wheel a little bit. Yeah. It's straight. It's, it's, it's I think he gets riders in though. He, he sort of lets that gap go, and other riders are sort of they don't want to drift too far off the back, so he almost forces them to come in and do more work, which then enables him to get a little bit of an extra rest and. He's clever, clever, yeah. really. Yeah, he's um, quite idiosyncratic in the way that he that he, he rides. Just one thing that is quite clear, though, um, and not non-idiosyncratic, uh, is the fact that he looks so, so relaxed, so in control. Sean Flynn now on the front for ECG Racing, a rider we don't know too much about, but he uh, rides for the Dutch Continental team. He's looking good, 21 years of age. Did well in the recent circuit of the Ardennes International. 16th overall, a couple of, uh, well, three top 10s on stages two, three, and four, so clearly rides well uh, on the climbs, and also up there in the Ronde d'Isard as well, the really hilly race in France, uh, two placings inside the top 10. So clearly a solid rider, and on a very, very good day today, as is this man on our screen at the moment, Sam Watson from Team Inspired. Come on, Sam. 
I'm wanting him to do really well. I think being in this group of riders that he's in, he's doing absolutely brilliant at the minute. And I think he's, if he just plays his cards right and he misses some turns and he's able to stay on top of his nutrition, he's obviously got the legs because he's still in there. He's not been distanced on any of these laps going up the he climb. He hasn't even looked when they're too going much hard. in danger, is he, at all, uh, no. to be honest with you? I think it's the race, obviously, the longer it gets, it only gets harder and harder. So I think, you know, the riders, the likes of the ones that ride day in day out doing the stage races it won't affect them too much the distance uh, and the fatigue whereas sam it might do ever so slightly so if he can stay a little bit fresher it might enable him to get um maybe not just that under 23 national jersey but maybe on the podium as well yeah definitely it's a really, really good point and that's the advice that i think matt brammy would be giving him as well rather than actual tactics to kind of win the race it's just like okay you need to ride conservatively now nobody's going to look to you to do much of the work um, sit nice and tight in the wheels, maybe do the occasional turn, but uh, just back off and keep on eating and just see how far you can get into this race and just take your chances. But if it's going to stay in that group, he now needs to ride really, really smartly as the gap starts to come down. You this is a horrible, horrible chase. You can almost feel the pain, can't you? Yeah, you can almost say as well, sorry, back to uh, Sam Watson there, is that you can say, you know, if he's sat on the back, you can say, look, lads, I've got a good chance within to win this under 23 years here. I just need to get to the finish as as far in front as I can. So by sitting on you guys, that enables me to do so. I'm not going to, you don't have to say I'm not going to contest the finish, but I'm just going to sit on and I've got the under 23 jersey to win. And that's what I'm doing right now by just missing a few turns and sitting on. I want to stay with you guys for as long as I can and just play that card forever and ever more. There's always that, there's a few riders that keep doing this, isn't there? Like jumping up and down, doing a little bouncing on the wheel and just checking if they've got a puncture. Just shows that the roads, as we said... Gripping. <laughs> gripping. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, the legs are starting to hurt and uh, they, the, the, the bike sometimes can deceive you. You, you, you try and think, oh, it's got to be something else. It can't just be in the legs, but ultimately on a course like this, we're, we're only, we've only done um, about 70, 80 k's, and already this field is just split to bits. The, the bunch, or the third group on the road, at 1 minute 30 seconds, and our two chasers, Flynn and Shaw, are around 20 seconds. As we look at Sam Watson again, looks pretty composed. Askey there having a bit of a stretch. Another rider who'll be battling for the under-23 jersey as well. He's got a message there from uh, Magnus Baxter saying he had a flat, so he did raise his hand there, and we saw him bounce on his back wheel a bit, so maybe a rear flat tyre there for him, which is... Uh, on that descent, it's not ideal timing, but they do have the team cars behind, luckily, for them, so we'll be able to get um, a nice speedy change. Well, this is an interesting move. This uh, group seems to be so Griff Lewis in second wheel, Alexander Richardson on the front there for Alps and Phoenix. Meanwhile, a little bit further up the road, already well onto the descent. So this group is around a minute and 30 seconds, or they are a minute and 30 seconds behind. Several riders there from Canyon DHB Sun God as well. Lewis has a little look at Richardson. So an interesting a composition, two riders from Swift Carbon. Matt Holmes also in this group. And then just behind is another clutch of about 10 or 15 riders. This race is spread all over uh, the uh, outskirts of Lincoln here. We knew that it would, uh, something like this will happen. But with the relatively small amount of climbing in this race, it's just the severity of the climbing and the fact there's no recovery. It's, a, it's such a unique race in so many ways, isn't it? You look at it on paper, you think, oh, it's only a short climb, and um, we're only only got seven ascents but this race has detonated yeah and it's as you said before Matt it's detonated quickly but it's also it changes so quickly yes the dynamic of it it changes so so quickly and James Shaw here and his, his compatriot is doing an absolutely phenomenal ride to be able to get across to these guys it's just when they get across how much it's actually taken out of them bridging across this gap but showing both of them their class here and being able to uh, to ride across to it it's a um, brilliant brilliant ride yeah, they are going to make contact. That is superb, but how much has it taken out of them? So the two riders that have got across, and they're imminently, they should come uh, past our camera on the inside. Yeah, be it just a few seconds' time. They'll shut that gap now. One last push, and they'll be on in the slipstream. And I'd imagine they'll uh, maybe take 1,500 metres, 2 k's of rest before starting to work. But a good, That's good bit of bridging lap. lap. At least a lap. <laughs> maybe two laps. <laughs> yeah. Maybe two laps. If you could just give us a push up Michael Gate as well, that'd be absolutely lovely, Lance. Remember chasing in this race on numerous occasions and, and chase, getting across a gap right at the bottom of Michael Gate and getting dropped again. It's, yeah, it's, it's just typical, isn't yeah. it? You know, you chase, a, chase for a lap and then just get punted. That's the nature of this course. But now an opportunity for these two riders. Shaw in the blue with the red helmet there of Ribble World Tight and Sean Flynn of SEG Racing, the Dutch Conti team. 
I think it'll be interesting now with a little bit of a bigger group. Only two riders, um, but what they do after this now. Coming into Michael Gate again, I think that's that's where we've seen the attacks so far. Well, it's not actually. We've seen the attacks all over the course and not necessarily on Michael Gate, but I think now deeper into the race where you can make a, a difference a little bit easier. I think we might see a little bit of pressure being applied at the front up Michael Gate just to get rid of a few riders, maybe try and drop a few off the likes of Tanfield, who's been suffering. He might start to come round a little bit, we're not sure yet, but I definitely don't think that front group on the road there is riding too hard either. No, I think they're all sort of crystal cranking a little bit. Yeah, they're, they're keeping that momentum, they'll have information about the chasing group behind. Now this group do seem to be pushing on pretty well, although it's quite deceptive, quite often riders that are a bit further behind, because they're chasing, there is more of an, a sense of urgency, yeah, although quite trip. often they're not actually uh, moving at the same speed. So Matt Brammy now stops behind to make sure as quickly as can, they can service uh, Sam Watson of Team Inspired. Now, is he going to get a full bike change? I probably doubt it. Probably going to get a wheel change. Uh, there's a couple of arguments going on. Griff Lewis there having a bit of a word with a couple of the riders just towards the back of this group. The Welshman not happy with some of the Canyon DHB Sungle riders. But I do think at this stage in the race, there's going to be a lot of riders, Adam, who just cannot do anything. They're just, like, suffering. Even though they're in a reasonably good position in the race, quite often they're hanging on for grim death. Yep, they are indeed, and it's ultimately when they get there as well. Um, the closer they get to them, the riders that are sitting on, they might be thinking, I might be able to jump across to this, I might be able to make that effort, I can't. These riders are putting in such big effort, surely they can't keep doing this tempo until the end. They want to get as close as they can, but by doing so, it, it means you have to ride harder on the front, and when you get there, how long can you keep doing it for? So maybe the riders are just thinking, if we can get within 10, 15 seconds, we might have a chance to jump across, but... You just never really know how everyone's feeling. As you said, Matt, some riders might be on the knees. Totally. Well, another rider that's uh, under 23 is Fred Wright as well. So there's a few under 23s in this uh, front group. So Fred Wright, Lewis Askey, um, Sean Flint. It's a worry there for Watson as, as well there that, that had that puncture. Sometimes they will not have a spare bike just to jump onto. Yeah. So sometimes it can just be a, a wheel change. Um, which with disc brakes, we all know, is not the quickest in the world. And with that group just behind them, they might say to the, the team cars, get back up there quickly, immediately. You might not get any assistance from the team car as well, which during that situation, it doesn't help. You go Connor Taylor, the coach of Owen Duel, Ben Swift as Tamfield. He's to just fight his way to get that gel. Ooh, oh, big reach out, big long gel. Arms there, yeah. Nice little gentle sling and back onto it. It's also, although, I mean, it's, it's interesting that we see, we don't see in any other races apart from the national championships, this kind of coordination, this agreement between um, the, the teams. Other people might be looking at it incredulously. Well, why do the Ineos Grenadiers want to help that rider? And in fact, when you think about it, it's like, yeah, keep him fueled because he can help our riders out in front as well. So there exactly, is, yeah. there's a kind of, not a hidden meaning, but there's a multi-layered, as well as just, it's, it's a sportsman-like, given the situation that uh, Tamford hasn't got any backup. Yeah. But actually, it helps keep the whole breakaway afloat, doesn't it? So why wouldn't they want to help anybody out? Yeah, exactly, exactly that. And this is the joy of, you know, going through that feed zone as well. Having your team car behind now, you don't have to faff about in the team zone. You don't have, in the feed zone, sorry, you don't have to move over to the side of the road. You don't have to grab a bag or a bottle, put it over your shoulder, the musette, whatever it might be. You can just literally nip back to the team car, get your food on board, carry on as usual. I'm surprised it's carrying two bottles though. As you discussed earlier, Matt. Yeah, always a one-bottle strategy for the Lincoln Grand Prix for me. Um, and like I said, even if one bounces out or you lose one, you're never too far away from getting one, either at the side of the road or from the team car. Uh, just to save... Uh, maybe I was a little bit ahead of my time for marginal gains, or whether it was just common sense. I don't really want to carry a, a full bottle e ten times up the Michael Gate, to be honest with you. Bit so of that both. Was a bit, bit of both. both. Yeah, bit of both. Bit of both. Always a one-bottle strategy for this race. Uh, meanwhile, I love the one bottle strategy, it's brilliant. It's quite good, isn't it? it does, I mean, it does make your bike a lot lighter. It's as simple as that, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not going to say I did or I didn't do this, but it was in a race in California and it went up really to high to altitude. So it was a good, basically like a 60k climb. And, you know, I might have done this, I might not have done it, but I might have asked for a few empty bottles on my way back up from the team car just to get a little bit of assistance, maybe. <laughs> I didn't get them, You've but retired I asked. now, mate. You've retired now. <laughs> I, I think the statute of limitations is gone um, to, to penalise you for that. But uh, thank you very much for your honest, honest insight. Uh, not um, that might be happening now. We just do not know. We don't know. We do not know. But what we do know is that this group are moving pretty Can't nicely now. I just said that. Sorry. <laughs> so, well, I'll, I mean, you said it, mate. I'm, um, there's not much I can do now to mitigate that. You've just told um, 
pretty much everybody watching this race. Anyway, moving back, Ben Swift. And there is um, a man that could make history here in British cycling. He will be, if he does manage to pull off this win, he'll be the first rider to win all three national titles at elite male level. The time trial, he's already bagged that on Thursday. Amazing win the other day, thrilling win, tight victory. Only came through in the last 25 metres to uh, beat Harry Tanfield in the Elite Circuit Race Championships on the same finish line that we'll see today at the top of the Michael Gates. And the way he's riding at the moment, um, well, I know who my favourite is right now. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, it, it, it is Ethan Hayter. He's just looking so, so good and looking very easy on the climb. And just just the, the way he just turns, that he, he pedals quite a large gear, doesn't he? just rolls it round, just moves up and down, hardly yeah. changing cadence. There's no it's big a, acceleration, it's like, is there? Like, 80, like 75, 80 RPM, really unusual, but massively efficient yeah. um, um, style that he has. Yeah, he has indeed. He's... Uh... He's efficient, massively efficient. No big accelerations. As you see, Leo Hayter just trying to get back into some sort of contention. Um, obviously, the brother yes. of Ethan Hayter. Um, but Sam, Sam is back in that breakaway there from uh, from Team Inspire. Sam Watson. So he's made his way back in after that puncture. These riders aren't too far behind now. This chasing group. This is a Jacob Scott. 52, 52. seconds. They've, they've closed the best part of 45 seconds. About 5k ago, it was a minute and a half. Um, and there's a real visible sense of urgency, and actually, they're visibly quicker. Connor Swift here, flicks his elbow, Harry Tanfield, Quebec at Assos, rolls through, um, freshly gelled up from the Ineos team car, and then we've got Fred Wright moving through as well. Had a great few seasons um, with uh, Bahrain victorious, as they're now known, and then a rider that we've not seen too often is flying. Uh, Sean Flynn there, 21 years of age as well. James Short looking good, though. We know he's moving on to pastures new next year. We understand it's a World Tour team. I don't think we're obliged to uh, announce that just yet, but certainly deserves it. A lot of calls for his promotion again. But remember, a couple of years ago, he did spend a couple of years at Lotto Sudal. has already been at World Tour level. And very much like you, Adam, you know, you've been at World Tour level, back down to Conti level in the UK, back up again back down to pro content, back yeah. up to world tour level. It, it can be around. done, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you've, yeah. you've moved uh, to a few teams. But, I uh, think the, the good thing with that is, is he's stuck with it, you know, after a, a few quiet years and difficult years, especially when COVID came round within the UK, it, racing wasn't easy to do so. So every race he did, he really had to make the most of it and really showcase himself, which he's done brilliantly. He's got himself back into world tour and his opportunity is there for him once again. And I'm sure, you know, being in that situation, he will give his utmost best to do everything he can to stay in there for as long as he can once again. Yeah, a little uh, counter-attack group here. As I said, we've got uh, Leah Hater in there from the, the T DSM development team and uh, Oscar only as well. As we get back to the aforementioned uh, Ethan Hater sits towards the back of this group. 43 seconds it is to the chasers. Um, there's a distinct possibility that that group might get on, which will make it quite interesting, but I'm going to be really honest with you, even if that group gets across, even if that group does get across, I can't see a race-winning threat coming from that move. But it, what it will do is force some proper attacks from this group because it's just too unwieldy. It's just it will not move along particularly efficiently. Um, and getting to 10 riders here, it's starting to be on the slightly big side, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. And you just notice that Ethan Hayter was sat at the back, moved up to, to make sure he's more towards the front. So he wants to be at the front for a reason, Ben Swift. Casually just sat on the on the back of the group, but I think just that indication there of Hater maybe moving up towards the front. I don't think he needs to worry about positioning too much, but maybe just thinking that he wants to push on. They've got wind of another group coming across. Maybe a, a couple of riders coming into that group he's not happy with, so he wants to try and reduce the group a little bit. Ben Swift again now moving up towards the front. I think when the, the big World Tour do, riders do this, with the likes of Hater and Swift, if you're Watson, you need to be aware of that. You need to respond to it. You probably need to think, they're moving up this is not so normal i probably need to be aware of this and move up with them just in case you can respond to it yeah you, i mean riders will be looking around and wary of what other riders are doing now as a connor swift takes the left hand side the familiar right hand side is the option favored by harry tanfield from quebec and next hash and in the middle of your screen um pedaling actually quite a nice fluid gear that was a ben swift but ethan hater just dropping back not panicking at all you get the sense he's just holding back here don't you Sat on the wheel of uh, Sean Flint, still in the mix and looking pretty good. Sam Watson there for Team Inspired. James Shaw out of the saddle on at the right-hand side. But Connor Swift pressing on here. This is an impressive little move. Askey trying to follow. Fred Wright following too. And uh, Ben Swift uh, moving across the gap there. 
as the back of this second group, they've definitely closed up a fair bit here, Adam. Yeah, I think there as well, Hato is just sort of watching it and seeing what the other riders to do to respond to it. Just looking at them, maybe forcing them to do the work a little bit. I think he's confident within himself that he can just nip across to it, but almost forcing those other riders to make that that effort rather than him doing it and just generally just get um, a bit of a judge on how they're feeling. Yeah, it's, it's quite cool. I mean, real cool, calm and collected. You know that Tanfield is suffering a bit, but still was more than happy to let Tanfield shut this gap down. Connor Swift leads the former champion. Four laps to go now in the Men's Elite National Road Race Championships here in Lincoln. Still difficult to try and predict who is going to take this title. And nobody got dropped that, that time up as the group that's uh, chasing behind, the man at the back of this group, that's uh, Henry Lawton, riding for the under-23 AG2R Citroën team. And there's another couple of riders just rolling through here. Swift Carbon representing with two riders, Griff Lewis there, Matt Holmes riding in second, with Alexander Richardson there in the blue. Other Alpes and Felix. So interesting situation there, you can just see a sense Look at the riders' faces here, you know, they're really uh, starting to suffer. And again, this isn't the longest race in the world at all. It's just so, so attritional. These last four laps are going to be very, very uh, painful. Yeah, they are indeed. And this is without any attacks coming from this front group yet. And I think what that group was doing back there, there wasn't a big acceleration on the on the climb. They were just trying to keep it all together. So as this group's doing, just use all the riders as, as best they can to collectively try and bring this group back. So if they try and do it alone, it's a much greater effort that they necessarily if they did get across it's a lot more energy they'll have to use and instead of staying within a group and as you said before matt out of a 20 23 minute lap just waiting for 30 seconds whatever it might be it's, it's nothing that you're going to gain from working in a massive group totally save a bit of energy yourself keep the momentum of the group going as another little group crosses the line four-man group containing the brother of ethan hater leo hater running for the dsm development team there is hater number two just dropping off that wheel a little bit, picking a slightly different line than Fred Wright, cutting the apex. Just rolling that gear around very, very efficiently indeed. And Fred Wright just closes that gap. And drifting back, and that's uh, Dan McClay drifting back a little bit. Yeah, you really do, getting a sense that uh, some of these riders are getting, starting to feel very, very tired indeed. But I have been really impressed by Sam Watson here of Team Inspired. Still doing a bit of the pacemaking, still taking his turn at the front, and this is the chase group uh, behind. Another ride actually just testing the pressure of his tyres there on the back. It looked like it was, uh, it was indeed Griff Lewis of the Ribble Well Tight Pro Cycling Team. But he actually doesn't need to do any work in this group, and uh, if I was him, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do any, any work at all, because you've got uh, James Shaw in the front. So Griff, good ride by him though. But he clearly, I wonder if he has got a slow puncher. That did look like the tyre was giving slightly. A lot of punctures, and you can never think about that. If you get a puncture, it happens, but it's happening quite often uh, from what we've seen. Another one, maybe just we've yeah, seen it so often where it just keeps bobbing up and down a little, maybe a little slow puncture, maybe just the little impact puncture on the cobbles there. And a lot of guys, if they're using tubeless as well, they might have just lost a little bit of sealant um, from there. So who knows? But roughly now 38 seconds behind and i've got four laps to go is that three laps to go coming through? Four, four laps four to go, laps to go. so roughly four laps to go yeah 55 50k to go as connor swift puts in a dig on the front now trying to split things up a bit tamfield responding to it swift also fred wright and this is this is playing into ben swift's hands right now that ethan hater has to sit back and for ethan it, it is kind of frustrating that he's like i want to be a part of that and the riders are going to look at me to do it i can't do it and he can almost if this comes back together he can get a free ride across to it sorry it's not it's dan mcclay that's putting that dig um yeah. so for ethan you know it's just about if he is going to attack he has to go across to that either on his own or with someone that they are not worried about which out of this group rather difficult well that is a very very interesting move it's uh, fred wright ben swift Dan McClay and Harry Tanfield have gone clear and they're opening up a gap very, very quickly indeed. Now, this is interesting. Ethan Hayter happy that he's got a man in front, but he's going to be thinking about this situation. He's certainly not going to be able to close a minute on his own, you wouldn't imagine, as we see the group a little bit further back down the road, still relaying very, very well. So there's a real efficiency and a real workmanlike spirit in this group. This Matt is, Holmes uh, just uh, overlaps a little bit. This is exactly what Ethan sort of wouldn't want to happen. Totally. Yeah. Just that wasn't really what he wanted, was it, at all? No, not at all. And it's, it's that situation now where I'm sure he's confident in his own ability to be able to jump across on the climb. We saw him do that before as Askey goes on the attack now. And they'll have to respond to it straight away, and they do so. But, you know, if 
if you're going to jump across to this, you need to forget about Swift on the back and Hater and just work together and just try and bring it back collectively because ultimately what else is going to happen if the riders think about it? There's only two riders that are going to attack from this group and that's the two on the back there, Hater and Connor Swift. And to be able to get across, they might work together to get across, but they have to jump with it. So for the other riders, they are going to have to be confident enough to follow. No, definitely. And that's so, maybe before they get caught, Matt. Sorry. Ex exactly. No, it's a, it's a fascinating scenario that's playing out as we look at a little bit further down the road. Alexander Richardson, Matt Holmes, and also in this group from AG2 Art, that's uh, Henry Lawton amongst others. Sorry about a brief uh, little bit of a picture breakup. And this is another group on the road as well. So this is a group that's getting across to that group. So this is like group number four <laughs> on the road. There's groups everywhere. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. It's like Bay where you just never stop. Just keep going. You never know what might happen. Yeah, I think that was Group 4. Yeah, so you just, just keep on plugging away, as you, as you say. So much can change in this race. Uh, and if you capitulate on this circuit as well, you can lose time very, very quickly indeed and start picking up places rapidly uh, because this group has a lot of momentum as we head into our four laps to go. Next time through, it will be three. So well under 50 kilometres to go now. This is a, a big chase group. So that front group is now split in half. So a good riding there by the Inos Grenadiers and Arkea Samzik to put two riders out in front. Certainly wasn't uh, wasn't what I expected to happen. Not that I kind of know, but I certainly it's quite an early move to go clear. But it's a really really interesting one, isn't it? And interesting for Dan McClay to do so. Um, he might not be feeling good. He might not be happy with the riders in there. So he might have thought, I need to split this group up. I need to try and get clear. And the riders he's taken with him once again. Uh, Harry Tanfield going in there. We, we saw him before just losing distance a little bit, but as you said, Matt, just keeps plugging away, trying to get himself in there, and that's exactly what he's doing, just looking for those opportunities for almost a little bit of sliding room almost. Yeah. Because as, we, as we've said and as we've seen that in this group now, four is stronger than three or two or one, so keeping him in that group, riding at a pace where he can keep up with on Michael Gate and being able to use him on the rest of the course is so much more important than just spitting him out for no reason. Oh, totally. But there becomes a limit with that. Three laps to go coming into the finish this time. That's become a time where they go, OK, actually, we don't need them anymore. We've got three laps to go, lads. And also, if, if they, even if they, they get a lap, they get a gap of about 30, 40 seconds on the group behind, because was, there was no cohesion there, not with the likes of Ethan Hayter and, and Connor Swift sat on. That group is going nowhere. They may, in fact, get reabsorbed, but that is, I think, when Ethan Hayter... If Ethan Hayter wants to win this, he'll be happy that they've got one rider up the road, but Hayter will want to try and jump across the gap and I think you'll have to do it on the next lap before the gap goes out too far for even him to yeah. bridge across, because that is a strong, strong move. And, you know, Hayter, although he's flying at the moment, he will have his limits, and he's going to have to make a real calculation about how... Way, if he wants to win this, at some point, he's got to go clear on his own and try and bridge across the yeah. gap. And I think as well, I don't think Michael Gate is long enough to do so, so it wouldn't surprise me if he attacked beforehand going through that feed. We've seen him just through the feed, bending round that right-hand corner and going up a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me if he just accelerated through that feed, up that track, got that gap to 10 seconds recovered slightly on that downhill and then was able to bridge across at the top of Michael Gate and then try and recover rather than keep the pace going all over the top but that is within the, the greatest of situations but as you said Matt that's the the gap to those front four riders has to be small enough to be able to do so and they have to judge that and be able to work within that hater has to look at that and assess it he might have to jump before it he might have to try and just sort of do a little playful attack to try and encourage the riders a little bit to make sure that gap doesn't go too far. Just do a little half-hearted turn on the front where a little sneaky attack which just brings them down ever so slightly, just reduces the gap by five seconds, four seconds. Yeah, just a playful little move there, just to, um, without like smoke and mirrors, just uh, not actually doing any real damage, but keeping them within striking distances is, is what that would do in effect, isn't it? So we've got around three and a half laps to go of the men's elite and under 23 national road race championships so ending a great week of national championship racing two more jerseys up for grabs the elite men's and the under 23s and we have four men clear it's been a very interesting intriguing race a race of attrition in difficult weather conditions but we do have four men out in front and you're seeing them now dan mcclay of arcare samsung is there ben swift the defending champion in fact of team ineos Harry Tanfield of Quebec, next hash, and then Fred Wright of Bahrain, victorious. So a very, very strong group. But yeah, I, I, I certainly, this, this is a, I think the most interesting play here for me is the Dan McClay one that, that, that you uh, 
that you alluded to a few moments ago, because although we haven't been able to read much about uh, who's the strongest of the two, I would have thought that this course would suit. Yeah, this is the chase group about to catch up the group with their Ethan Hater in it. Yeah, that is a big gap now, isn't it? It's probably 20, 25 seconds to those front four riders. So throughout that, you know, you look, if you look at the James Shaw who rode across to it, you think you've made this big effort to get in this group. Now you're in this group, but yet you're letting the race go away from you again. You need to, those four riders need to work together. If they don't, the race is just literally riding away from them, unless they are confident enough that they can follow the attacks of Connor Swift and Ethan Hayter. If they are confident, brilliant, but if not, you literally they're just letting the race ride away from them right now which is ultimately what none of them want including Hayther and Swift no totally well, Fred Wright leads and one of the only under 23 riders in this uh, front group rolling that big year round. had a great season so far has uh, Fred Wright really impressed good ride as well by uh, by Dan McClay kind of clearly a kind of a, a clearly massively talented rider but on this sort of parkour I would have thought that it, was, it would have suited um, Connor Swift a little bit more. But this is what happens in national championships. Yeah. Although you'll talk to each other, quite often there will be attacks just made on instinct. When you just go. Of course, Will, yeah. And I think it's, as we spoke about, Matt, is you ride your own race at the nationals. You don't... Totally. You don't try and think, right, I'm going to do this to benefit Connor. You, no, I'm doing this to benefit himself. And he is doing that. It's just very interesting that I think out of this group, we've seen Tamfield suffer already. Swift was been out the front for a long time a lot longer than all the other riders so for me now it's we don't know how each of these riders are feeling and how they're going to react on the climb if you put say hater in here you'd say well he's the out and out favorite but all of them have had different roles in this race and all have ended up in this front group very differently uh, which is going to affect all of them differently but you have to say the the rider throughout all of this which is probably ridden it with the the most minimum effort i'm going to say he's probably swift although he's been out the front a long time solo he's he's always been in that right place at the right time and he might have had to spend more energy doing so um but he's not had to chase anything he's always been at the front of affairs yeah he's been in the position he was one of the first riders to attack actually in, in the race which was quite surprising he managed to go clear but he's been a real protagonist so far clearly looking very strong we know he can go the distance as well if you look at some of his best results they are in the really hard quite often bad weather conditions races uh, he's the type of rider that can put out a really, really high average power for four, five, six hours. One of the kind of few riders that can do that. And he's looking good. He's ridden a, a tactically very shrewd race. And he knows that they've still got another option behind. If he were to falter, depending on the gap, of course, Ethan Hayter isn't too far behind. But they are, I do believe, about to be joined by that chase group containing Alexander Richardson. Not just Here they yet. are. Not just yet. So hey, uh, Swift even just rolling through a little bit there. And the other riders now, you see Sam Watson, he's probably thinking, oh, I can't keep going through, I'm going to be able to hang on to this. And that's also one of the parts in that group that they know they have to ride, but they know the attack is going to come. So they don't want to ride too much, they want to be able to respond to the attack, but they're in um, a no-win situation almost. <laughs> it's really difficult to know what to do. It's, it's a tough one, it really is. The junction, I think, is going to be made before the bottom of the climb. They're Prediction. moving really, really quickly. There they are, there. the gap falls short again by the camera angle here. But this second group, the third group, should I say, on the road, with several riders from DHB Canyon, look like they will perhaps make contact. And I think they will. They're moving pretty quickly here. So this opens the race up again. But the selections that we've seen have all gone, primarily all gone on the climb. So you would imagine, if it's true to form, that the riders in the next group in front would still be stronger than these. It's, re it's a really yeah. strange situation. But of course, not all of the, um, the amount of time they spend on the Michael Gate is relatively small compared to the rest of the course. So it's about thinking, if you don't get on well with the Michael Gate, you've got to think, how can, I, how can I win this bike race or do well in this bike race and taking the Michael Gate out of the equation, accepting you're going to suffer and get dropped, where else do I make gains on this course? That's the way you've got to think, isn't yeah. it? It wouldn't surprise me if Hayter attacked, as I mentioned, threw this feed zone up ahead a little bit. Even if he took riders with him and made it difficult, if they could follow him, brilliant. But I think he knows that he's got the engine to attack up here, put the pace down really hard, make riders suffer, do the whole descent and then do Michael Gate as well on the front and be able to drop riders at the top of Michael Gate. So it wouldn't surprise me if that happened at the same time. It wouldn't surprise me if he just lit it up at the bottom of Michael Gate and 
try to nip across to that gap, but things change now. Later on in the race, riders are more fatigued. We're talking about Ethan Hater as though he's a motorbike. Um, he's still a human. He's just, from what we've seen so far in his previous results and performances throughout the year, we're expecting him to do something massive. We just see another little lad on the left-hand side there trying to keep up with the peloton. That was good to see. There you go, 45 seconds. Leaders um, have 35 seconds over the chase and 45 seconds over the chase group when they're about to uh, merge, to be perfectly honest with you. I think the time gap was a little bit late. So this race is still delicately poised, isn't it? Only 45 seconds in it. Fascinating stuff. Next time through, they will have three laps to go. The two riders in the white jerseys in that chasing group, by the way, just identified those, both from Swift Carbon Pro Cycling. That's Ross Lamb and Joss Whitehead as we get a reminder of our leading four. And very shortly, they will commence their, uh, they'll go through with three laps to go. Just at the back there, Harry Tanfield put himself in a good position here. We've seen him suffer a little bit on the climb, but putting himself in front uh, will mitigate that a little bit. Ben Swift, the defending champion, being in that red, white and blue jersey for the last two and a half years, I can tell you he's going to want to win it again, but importantly for the Indian Grenadiers, they want to either they just want to keep it in-house, don't they? Yep, um, yeah, And uh, they just want to give themselves options. Fred Wright, of course, has got his own plans. Dan McClay, of course, will want to win it. Everybody wants to win that jersey. That They're is for sure. They're a long way behind. Wow. They're really a long way behind. And there's no emphasis in that front group now. That group that's caught up, this is their They're time slow, for recovery. They're slow now, aren't they? Yeah, of course they will, yeah. And the likes of James Hill, you can see Connor Swift, just a little bit of a gap off the front, you know, not, not trying to... Not trying to attack, just trying to keep that gap just close enough, but it's just, I think, they all know what's coming this lap. They all have to know what's coming, and the riders within this group, they, for the likes of Hater and Swift, they don't want to just ride up this climb and bring that whole group with them. They don't need that, because Hater won't ride with them. Um, I think for him, he, he has to jump across, the same with Swift. Um, the other riders will be happy to work all together to try and bring this back, but for those two, they can't let that happen. I'll try and set a clock at the top of this climb to see exactly what the gap is between our first four riders and that rather large chasing group. Now, the sun, I think, has started to poke its head out. Great colour here on this climb of the Michael Gate. Just over 200 metres long, average gradient of 11%, but uh, pictures, I believe, according to Hannah earlier on, of a 26% at its steepest. It is a tough, tough climb. Urged on by this guy, a great shot here, that low camera angle, Fred right in the centre of your screen, picking the line in the middle on the pave. Dan McClay on the left-hand side, just picking his way along, making sure he doesn't grind his pedals. Ben Swift just behind him, and on the right-hand side, Harry Townfield. That's the line that he's picked throughout the day. But Fred Wright looks pretty good here. Yeah, Fred Wright looks good. Dan McClay also just just sort of matching him for his pace, not needing to go faster, but ultimately as well, a lot of these runners might not be able to go faster. The fatigue will start to set in now, doing this climb over and over again. It's not like settling into a rhythm. These guys will be 500 watts up this climb each and every time. So it's, <laughs> you do that for a minute, each lap it is it's take a lot. Its top, yeah, isn't it? yeah. It's going to definitely take its top. And the last few laps, sometimes just getting up the climbs hard enough, isn't it? Literally just getting over the climb, let alone controlling your speed and having the ability to accelerate. Fred Wright. Three laps to go, four riders in front now. Let me just put a rudimentary clock uh, on this one. So just going through the start of the feed zone there. Hater is right in the middle of the screen there, not responding to it. Askey on the front. So Hater is not really looking like he's trying to attack this group. He's happy with the situation, he's happy to follow. Connor Swift just behind him a little bit, but just see there, just the riders that were in that group previously before that attack happened there, they're still in there, so Samuel Watson as well doing a brilliant ride to be able to still keep up, but Askey just trying to bring that gap out a little bit, Hater just behind. I'm, I'm intrigued that Hater didn't attack to that. Yeah, I thought he might go, but uh, he's just following Askey, who's having a race of his life here as well, but it's great riding by Sam Watson. I've got my clock still ticking, 40 seconds has gone by, Askey crosses the line. The original riders from that breakaway are back in another breakaway behind. <laughs> they are indeed. Well, I thought that's what might happen, because we've got the strongest have come to the front. It's around 51 seconds, no, 52 seconds. So Askey back with Sam Watson, Ethan Hayter on his wheel, and also Connor Swift. So it is pretty much a very similar permutation. I thought that might be the case, even though the riders get back on the flat. If you're not climbing well on the Michael Gate, it's very, very rare that you see riders come around again, it's pretty it's pretty much a constant. If you're suffering on the climb all day, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. And I think what's interesting now is just with a group of four of them, 
don't forget, they've still got two teammates in the group. Connor Swift has got a teammate. Ethan Haight has got a teammate in that group. But with a smaller group, they might contribute to helping a little bit. They might say, OK, just with four of us, we'll help a little bit. We'll try and bring the gap down a little bit. We're not going to ride till we bring them back, but we'll help you reduce that gap until we deem deem it's small enough or big enough. But you can just see the gap, the gap. how quickly it's opened up. But yeah. these riders, they have to push on. If they get caught again, it's definitely not going to happen for them. They need to bring the gap down and I think for the likes of Hater, bring it down just enough which he's comfortable with jumping to. To me, it looked like um, Hater was going to ride, but Connor Swift wasn't going to ride. I don't think Connor Swift is going to want to try and bring Hater across the gap to try and, well, undermine any chance of Dan McClay winning this race. So uh, Connor Swift, I think, is the only rider that I, I think will not ride in that group, but I think Hater will. Uh, because he's just so confident about winning this bike race and wants to win it. Um, so there we go. Well, Connor Swift saying that is currently in second position. Again, this is the national championships. Team team tactics aren't don't quite play out quite the same as they do in a normal road race. And I thought that might be the case, but Connor Swift is happy at the moment to um, bring himself back into the picture. But more importantly, arguably the strongest man in the race, and that is Ethan Hayser. Yeah, I think so, and it's a difficult one, isn't it? Just two of them chatting together, and I, I'm sure what they're probably thinking is, let's let's try and get as close as we can, which doesn't enable those other riders to jump across, but enables us to still be in with a chance as well. And Aski, obviously, lighting it up at Michael Gate there and pushing on over the top and extending that gap and getting these four rides in a group again. And they're obviously, um, they want to keep this for themselves, as I've said, just within touching distance. And for these riders, they'll just... I think they'll want to stay together for as long as they can and maybe a, a lap to go they might try something but ultimately you know if it's one against two or two against two it's it is become a very cat and mouse situation then but i do believe unless unless you've really got the legs to go solo which i don't think any of them really have they'll just try and keep it together for as long as they can and then just battle it out probably on the last lap indeed well they are all working. Connor Swift sat in second position here. A little flick of the elbow from young Sam Watson of Team Inspired. And he is inspired today. This has been a tremendously impressive performance by the young man. Looking very, very good indeed. Back to the front. This looks like the forearm of Mr. Dan Buckley. It's looking like he's suffering now. I can tell you what, from uh, our combined experience in this race, although it isn't the longest race out there, it is one of the most physically demanding. It really is. It has it all. It's just uh, it's only a, a few sections of the road that aren't really dead. I mean, it's not the greatest road surface. The back straight is pretty is, is pretty nice, but it's just this lack of recovery after the micro. I think that's the critical point, isn't it? the climb itself? But there's just no recovery at all. You do what you you kind of do. You slowly over the period of about five minutes ease your way back into something uh, approaching recovery, but it's not instant like you get on a normal descent. Yeah, exactly. That is you sort of have to ease yourself into recovery almost. It's sort of like, I'm going to still keep riding really, really hard, but I'm hoping that I do recover yeah, ever so slightly. It's like over-under efforts, isn't it? Yeah. You, you're maxed out, but then you've got to keep on top riding at threshold. Yeah. Uh, you've just got to keep going, and then that gradually just eases, eases, eases for that descent. As the Ines Grenadiers team car just uh, shifts up the road, I think I'm going to try and set another time. It was 52 seconds at the top of the climb. I think as well there's Sam Watson. I've just had a, a message of Jamie Brown on social media and he was saying to me that Sam Watson is going to Group Armour FDJ Continental team next year. So oh, great stuff. Very, very good rider indeed. And with Askey, almost a teammate. Almost. Almost. Yeah, almost. But he has impressed today, especially. I mean, remember, he was out in front with Dan Bigham. I mean, it seems like an eternity ago, the first opening couple of laps, not just in lap that, that main breakaway. Yeah, lap two, he was out in front. And a real protagonist and looking very, very good as we head back to our leading quartet. 38 of miles an hour then as well down there. Going very, very quickly indeed. I keep saying I'm going to set a, uh, a timer on this just to give us a sense of how their progression is. I'll wait till we get to the main road because that's a really key point, I think. This is back to the chasing group, which is fragmented again. It is a case pretty much of as you were. This group fought hard to get back in contact. But the only difference is, is that James Shaw has dropped back and it looks like there's another rider trying to get across the gap as well in between groups one, well, in between groups two and three. Yeah, that is roughly, I think, as, as it said on the thing, 51 seconds. I think it is still roughly around that. Might have reduced to 45, but it's still um, a big enough gap to... Um, 
to stay until the finish, I believe. But within this race, when the Nationals was held here, uh, when Peter Kenyuk won, it changed very, very quickly. Mark Cavendish jumped across with two laps to go, was able to get himself on the podium still. So as we've seen throughout this race, things can change oh so quickly in this race. So it is, it's not over until it's over. Until it's over, no, definitely. We've seen big leads tumble. Saw a lead of um, 15, 20 seconds tumbling earlier on. Uh, Tacey was away for drops on the final climb of the marker gate and her um, her lead, her 15 seconds lead, was, was snuffed out in very, very short order indeed. And all it takes is somebody who's feeling really good and then fatigue, to just general fatigue to set in to the front group and we can see some gaps really start to shut down. And the key um, area for anybody trying to get across the gap is on the, on the marker gate and then significantly just across the top. And I think there's only one rider in this race that can do it individually and he sat at the back there, Ethan Hayter. Unless... He's not feeling um, quite the same as we, we think he is. I mean, we've seen his performances in there. No, I, I, Let's I, keep I'm just, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we don't know. But he's, uh, he cannot let this, let this gap go out too far. For even a man in uh, the form of his life, it's going to be very, very difficult to cross it solo. But there, 48 seconds it was. So they actually have taken back around four or five seconds. I think something interesting to note as well is that that team Ineos car there supporting Ben Swift at the front. If um, Hayter has a problem now, he hasn't got any service. He's got neutral service, which, as we all know, is it's brilliant it's and it's very handy, but it's neutral. It's um, It can ruin your race. So another reason that Ben Swift reacted as quickly as he did to that situation, getting himself in front. There's not just the reason of being in front of the bike race and giving himself the best opportunity, but he's also got the, the best and main support there from his team as well. Yeah, teams are generally only allowed. There'll, there'll be neutral service at the side of the road, but on a circuit this big, that's... Uh not very, uh, not very handy unless you happen to puncture or have a mechanical right opposite. So well, there you go. That is quite an interesting one uh, and could play out. We've seen several riders puncture. And when we get these wet conditions, a lot of the uh, the silt and the grip washes off the side of the road. And even with the, the quality of tyres these days, they're generally wide, uh, running a wider profile rim, a wider tyre, running slightly less pressure. So far less punches than we used to get in, in racing but still on days like this the tires are going to pick up these little flints and these little bits of uh, little bits of glass that traditionally just stay at the side of the road and that's what i think why we've seen so many punches today yeah i think it does indeed and i think matt this will be a good time for the stopwatch on this roundabout maybe just um we're trying to just judge how far it is we can obviously see how far it is but it's um i've got my finger an poised exact time fred, gap fred wright Apex no. of the corner now, there we go, and the <laughs> clock is running. So hopefully our producer will uh, get a shot of the next group coming round that bend as they turn off uh, Burton Village, Burton Village Road onto the A57. We're now on a Salisbury Road. And this group working really well. A reminder of the composition of the men in front. Dan McClay is there. He's the man just at the back of this group running for Arkea Samzik. Ben Swift in second position. He is the current national champion, the defending national champion on that uh, rather space-age looking dogma. Uh, bike, Pinarello, the man on the front is Harry Tanfield, already a medalist in these championships a few days ago in the Elite Circuit Race Championships. And the man at the back of this group, 22 years of age and vying for the first under-23 rider, although I think you'll be thinking of things slightly bigger than that, the championship itself is Fred Wright of Bahrain victorious. The clock is ticking, hopefully we'll uh, look back to that little left-hander to see if we can get a sense of what the time is. Well, it's over a minute now, so we'll, uh, we might have to do a little bit of, um, I don't know, monkey maths, as I, I quite often do, which is just, there we go, 40 seconds, it's saying. So it's coming down. So it is coming down, which is quite intriguing. And they're well onto the main road. And this is uh, the chasing group. And uh, look who's got across the gap. Alexander Richardson has managed to get across the gap. Well, that's a good move. So Richardson flew across the gap. I could see one individual rider, former winner, remember, of the Lincoln Grand Prix a few years ago now. But Alexander Richardson has done a great job of getting across this gap. Now, what? how is this going to impact this group? I think Richardson will continue to ride. Askey on the front at the moment. And there it is, Alexander Richardson of Alpacin. Uh, Connor Swift eagerly riding as well. Ethan Hayter still wants to ride too. I think what Hayter is obviously asking Matt Brammy there in the, in the car there from Team GB is just asking them what is that time gap. Because obviously they don't ride with radios in this race. So just knowing the time gap, seeing how far it is, um, probably thinking do I need to push on more do I not need to push on more and just trying to 
get some information that can be crucial in this stage of the race without radios and we've seen it in so many races where it's got away from them but ultimately he knows they are in front and if he wants to win he has to catch them we've well, got around 20 miles to go now next time through it'll be two laps to go which equates to around 16 miles each of these laps just over eight miles which is uh, 13 k's so a relatively short distance compared to some of the other national championships but we talked about it at the top of the program the lincoln grand prix i don't think needs to be any longer a few years ago we uh, the lincoln grand prix was lengthened it's uh, went a little bit uh, longer than 13 laps and it just it didn't quite work out so the uh, the optimum distance of 13 laps has been kept for many 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 years now uh, as Richardson piles on the pressure in front. It's almost quite clever what Richardson's doing is that, you know, if they want to, I think that he'll want to keep this group together um, and try and bring this gap back on the flat. I think if they all ride up the climb as they have been doing fairly, fairly steadily, I'd say, um, not trying to attack each other up there. And if they stay together and bring the gap down on the flat, they ride harder on the flatter road rather than wait for the climb, that will give all of them a bigger chance um, whereas I, I think previously a lot of riders gone we're not chasing this on the flax we've got michael gate coming we need to be ready to go up that climb again whereas if he and all of them ride harder on the flat bring that gap down they can all work collectively together up the climb and be able to to get closer to them but just going out of sight now so that 40 seconds you know we've we've seen that gap come down in this race already quite quickly within you know 5k or whatever it might be it's um it's definitely not over yet. Well, this is uh, another little group that have just made contact with group number three on the road. So uh, that was group four that has now merged with group three. So we've got uh, the two groups up in front. Group number one with Dan McClay. Group number two with Connor Swift and the rest. And, then, and now Alexander Richardson. And then that group, which has been uh, joined by group four. So now we have three distinct groups on the road at the moment. There's a Connor Swift in group two takes his turn on the front member he has a teammate in front Dan McClay but given that this is the national championships he seems pretty willing to keep this group moving just to make sure that if something and also if something happens to Dan McClay in front he can, if he just doesn't ride and the gap opens up and Dan McClay gets dropped on the climb which is a distinct possibility uh, we haven't really seen Dan McClay perform on a, on a circuit like this he's more of a sprinter but he clearly can get over the climbs okay but on paper you'd favor Connor Swift on a circuit like this wouldn't you I think it's very difficult to say isn't it because I think I think seeing what Cavendish did round here, it's almost that we we do for we assume too much. I think yeah, I think we assume a little bit because we're so used to the traditional style of racing in terms of what we see the teams do, the way that we see them ride on the front, and we the way we see Dan McClay at the the front of affairs sprinting. We never really see him in the, these single day situations like this, but we have to remember that growing up and trying to turn pro that they had to do these one days they had to learn this course craft. they had really to do point, all this yeah. so they're all capable of doing it and i think within these one days you know it's it changes the dynamic completely um and i think some riders become more efficient in this group than what they would do what you'd expect from them you can just expect he's a sprint but he might excel in this situation he might be cleverer than the other riders he might be able to save more energy than the riders who knows but because we've not seen them in this situation doesn't mean that they're not used to it. They spent their whole childhood growing up with, with all this and learning their craft. And it's not by luck that they've been in this group or chance. Not at all. They oh, no. picked the moments to do so. And Dan McClay was the original one that started that group off. So he's got intentions to win today. Definitely. 55 seconds is, but that's a really, really good point. And, and many, isn't it? A nice interview online with Ben Swift before this race and, uh, and also with with Ethan Hayter and they, they both acknowledge that the British Road Championships is one of the hardest races to win because it's a it's a slogging match you know it generally splits up um, you spend a lot of time in the wind as opposed to riding on the continent when you're protected a lot more it's a different style of racing um, and ultimately all British pros at some point generally speaking have raced for at least a couple of years at junior or under 23 level in the yeah. UK and it's a very very different style of racing and you spend a lot of time in the wind and you get used to that don't you yeah um, you but it's a do. completely different style of racing completely different and adjusting to it and it's a lot more tactical it's not just your legs it's a lot of tactics are involved and for a lot of riders that might not be as astute as some riders it, you know they might be they might have huge engines but if they're not tactically aware and tactically astute and knowing of their surroundings and the situation the other riders it can 
it can be a problem for them. It can be, you know, frustrating as well, knowing that you've got this massive engine that you can knock out all these watts with, but you keep missing the moves and you're always on the back foot. It can become very frustrating. And as Ben Swift said, the, the Nationals is probably one of the hardest races of the year. I think 2016 was probably the hardest one. I think 1998 was uh, an e of equal standing as well. But uh, <laughs> moving on to the bottom of the climb, again, 55 seconds. It's uh, again that man on the front, Harry Tanfield of Quebec next to Ash. He's uh, ridden, yeah, you've got to take your hat off to Tanfield. He's got himself in a race winning position here. And if he gets it right, in that you just never know difficult to call this race at the moment and because the conditions here aren't what we normally see at all you cannot compare the british road championship to anything else especially on such an attritional challenging circuit like this but tanfield again always hugging that right hand line he's got that a lot more uh, seemingly a lot more dialed now fred right in the center that's what he's done all along swift has always taken the left hand side as has dan mcclay so there's a real pattern emerging and mcclay looking like he's maybe starting to suffer a little bit the rider, it looks as if Ben Swift and Fred Wright are in a half-wheeling match and Tanfield on the right-hand side doing his own thing. But this is where, it's this deep into the race, if you start to suffer, there's really not much you can do. You've just got to try and measure it and measure it, not put yourself in the red here. Yeah, definitely that. And I think just looking at the riders and the way they're positioned, they're almost watching each other going up the climb. And Fred Wright, he's never ridden that outside line so far. He's always gone up there in the middle. He doesn't want to run the risk. He's not comfortable totally. riding in the gutter. So yeah. he knows what he has to do. And ultimately, that's he's harder where he is. So he's putting in almost a harder effort, but a harder effort that he's comfortable with. So I think you have to look at that if you're Ben Swift, if you're Tanfield, if you're Dan McClay, and realise what he's doing is a harder effort. And he might be feeling quite spicy. You might indeed. Well, Ben Swift takes them through with uh, two laps to go. This is absolutely fascinating stuff here. This is the group behind. Connor Swift is the last man in that group. Lewis Askey is putting in a right ride, as is Sam Watson. Superb performance by Sam Watson, but look at uh, the, the comportment. Look at the way that Ethan Hayter is riding. Looks very, very relaxed. He looks as if he's like a coiled spring, really. Oh, and Connor Swift, you can just feel his legs are starting to buckle underneath. This is the penultimate ascent of the Michael Gate. Next time up, it will be for the win. But Swift looks like he's in all sorts of trouble here. Yeah, he's, he's not comfortable, is he? And this is the point you hate now. Just doing that seated acceleration again, a bit of the gear. Look at the face on Askey. The gap's just opening up ever so slightly. It's Watson now just being distanced ever so slightly. But Connor just looking like he's running out of legs. And this is a point now where you want that recovery. And this is a point where Hater will go. He'll turn on the put on the pressure a little bit, try and gap those riders and reduce that group again, which he is doing beautifully. He is doing It's one minute, bang on one minute. I took the timing just across the line there from uh, Swift to Hater. Two laps to go here for Connor Swift. Meanwhile, up in front is his teammate Dan McClay. He's still looking good, rolling that uh, big gear round, just thinking about what is the plan. Ben Swift takes his turn on the front, looks still very, very composed to Swifty, but he loves these hard, difficult races. And, and just back to the point of how difficult the national championships is in terms of power delivery generally speaking out of all the races in the year mark cavendish has said something similar generally it's the nationals where you have the higher average normalized power yeah. because you just on if you want to win it you've got to be at the front and generally that means forcing the splits getting in breakaways and working and grafting so you've got this really really high average and normalized powers yeah you definitely do indeed and i think when you look at hater and how we spoke about him of reducing those spikes within that you have to imagine it as a graph and the less amount of spikes there are the less amount of big kicks in heart rate there are the the better you're going to be at the end of it so it's as you said matt it is all just about managing your effort and these these lads out the front are doing doing well so far and fred wright ben swift at the minute looking to be the stronger two on that climb within this breakaway but as we've seen tamfield do before just escaping at those moments sort of probably looked upon as maybe the li little bit of a weaker rider in the group maybe so the other riders might think if he attacks we don't need to worry about that but that's when it can get away from you so it's, I think it's fairly well matched, this group, uh, yeah. at the minute. And for these riders chasing behind, Ethan, again, won't want to push on too much, let's say. He'd contribute a little bit, as we spoke about before, but the likes of Askey and Richardson. Richardson is doing a brilliant ride he is. so far. He's just clawing his way slowly further and further and further up the, up the race. Well, he's the only rider from the initial group of, of that selection of 12 split came back split again reformed the only new rider really in the mix is alexander richardson so he clearly knows how to ride this race a former winner as we've, as we've mentioned on a few occasions and also great to see him back riding after that awful incident a few days ago in richmond park when he was out training 
really horrific incident and I'm just glad he's okay and up and riding but ASCII aggressive as well meanwhile back to the front of the race and as you said I, I do think weirdly that this group is pretty evenly matched I think there's some parts of the course that clearly favor Harry Tanfield it's a heavier rider but when he can really lay down that power and get into that aero position that's what he's really good at but maybe struggling on the climb so there's different so if one of these four riders wants to win they all do they're going to have to do it in four distinctly different ways and that's what makes this such a uh, an interesting proposition as we head into the last lap and a half yeah i definitely think it is indeed and i think if i was a rider in this breakaway now i'd be i'd be really looking at this man here fred wright thinking that he's ridden up the cobbles in the middle of them every time he's always been at the front really generally going up that climb so he is He's on great form, and I think, you know, for a rider that spends so much, most of his year as a domestic, being able to have that chance at getting a win, and importantly, a Nationals win, and getting that jersey, it's, uh, it's huge for him. I think for the likes of Hater here, maybe we're reading too much into it that he doesn't have the legs, or he's just not really been in this situation before where he's had a teammate up the road, and he's a maybe he's a little bit unsure of what to do. I think no radios as well. Yeah, looking around, there's... There's something about the look on his face that has changed. He looks, rather than he's suffering, he just looks a little bit anxious about, OK, what's the situation here? I've got Ben up front. Ben's the defending champion. I, I want the triple here, but I've got to be really careful about what I do and how I do it. But he's a national time trial champ, though. He, if he attacks on that climb right from the bottom and he goes and, OK, he might take a rider with him, but I don't think he will do, He's then just committed to his own effort. He's committed to his own result. And if he comes across to that group, Ben can't be angry with him for coming across solo. And also, no way. The, the, the way they could play, again, we're looking at different, so many different permutations here. But let's say we see the status quo remain the same until the foot of the Michael Gate next time up. Hater manages to go clear. You could argue that that gives a bit of a oh, oh, look oh, at oh, right going on the left-hand side because uh, Tanfield has gone long. We know Tanfield didn't really like the climb so much, so he's using that TT, that monster power that he's got to try and go clear. Big, big move by Tanfield. Clearly feeling very good, but knows his limitations, knows he's only got certain parts on the course with which to break free. Which we've seen on this course, the downhill has played such a big part in so we get the picture break, so we don't see all of the downhill, but when they come around the bottom, there's all these gaps opened up and we've seen Tamfield in the criterium, how well he's cornered, so maybe he's thinking, going into it, I'm just going to take maximal risk. Yeah, he's got, he's go got to try it. something. He's in, a, he's in a possible race winning situation yeah. here. Definitely. Swift back in with these guys now as well, sorry Matt. Yeah, no, Swift is back, as is Sam Watson. What a ride by the young lad in green there moving through. Looking at a, uh, a teammate, well, uh, an ex-teammate, because uh, Askey is moving up to World Tour level, essentially swapping places with young Sam Watson. It's a great riding by Watson, a really tenacious performance by him. Taking his turn on the front, flicks his elbow. Ethan Hayter rolls through, double champion. Time trial win on Thursday. Hayter looks across at his young counterpart. Don't know what was said, but meanwhile, this is group number three on the road. And that's uh, Charlie Tanfield just at the back, the brother of... Harry Tanfield had just launched a stinging attack um, on the approach to the Burton Village descent. So this, this is the, uh, yeah, the second chasing group after our leaders. This is a uh, group number two. Again, apologies for the picture break up here as we head out on uh, to this. Status uh, quo. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much stayed the same as in this time gap here. They've gone through that uh, difficult series of corners. Uh, pictures spring back into uh, sharp life. And what's ben, ben Swift thinking here? I wonder what, I just wonder what, I'm fascinated at this stage in a race, what's going through his head, what is his plan? Is he thinking about just watching and waiting because he knows he's quite an explosive rider? Um, I would suggest that, or is he just a little bit nervous here? We, we know he can take the punishment of a race like this. He's done it on numerous occasions, and he's got that wealth of experience as well. He's got age on his side, experience on his side. He's mature like a fine wine as Swifty, isn't he? He's hard yeah. as nails, so we'll love this but he, he, he's got to be thinking about the way he's going to win this, because I think he'll be a little bit worried about the riders around, especially on the climb, Fred Wright. Yeah, I think knowing Ben quite well and the way that he races, he can almost become too keen. I've, I've been in race with him before, the Nationals uh, is a good example, where he's almost too keen and he's almost too, not confident, but he's too willing almost. Um, so it doesn't look to be at the minute, but I think with Ben, he can get maybe a little bit overexcited, but if I was in this group now, I'd be thinking that Fred Wright is probably the strongest. The other two, they'll try and get on the road and try and try and isolate, try and put the pressure on Fred 
try and leave all the responsibility on Fred to chase things down a little bit, to move with them, say, the race is up for grabs here, mate, you want it, you've got to go and get it, and just call his bluff as much as he can, as much as he can, and I think if, if that is the case and Fred is the strongest, as I said, just put all the emphasis on him, put all the responsibility on him to close them gaps down and try and just keep yourself that little bit fresher and take take away that pressure a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, Dan, he might try and attack. Um, and I think if he does attack, he's got to take a rider with him um, and then just see how it goes, really. But I think for the likes of Fred, I think out of all that group, he's probably the happiest to let it come back to all together going into the bottom of Michael Gate, and I think the Tanfields are probably the least happiest for Dan, who probably want to escape with the likes of only Tanfield, because the other two are probably stronger than him. And for Ben, as I said, you've just got to put all that responsibility onto Fred. Yeah, definitely. There's um, lots of different permutations here. And then, of course, the other one is the, the element of surprise, doing something that the other riders will completely not expect as well. That's, that's, that can play out. We often see riders who are with the, the favoured sprinters going going long because they're not sure of their own ability sometimes. It's a it's a confidence thing here, isn't it? Riders get really worried because when you've got a certain set of attributes and people are, as you know are saying he's going to win the sprint, he's going to win this sprint, you often see riders from a small group go long because that, that burden is sometimes overwhelming, isn't it? So um, it, the, the, the psychological aspect of coming into a race with a, a big, big title at stake here is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Some riders can cope with that pressure better than others. Yeah, you definitely can indeed, and I think it's just... I think it is more about... They, these riders have been, for most of this race, all together now, so they'll have seen how each of them are riding, they'll see the lines they're taking, etc., etc., so they'll learn each lap a little bit more about that rider, the riders that they're with within that group, and be able to know their, their abilities and be able to know what to worry about necessarily, what not to worry about. And as I said before, I think each of them are, are aware of each and every other rider um, and knowing their attributes really and just being able to as I said take advantage of their own situation really and I think that's necessarily for Ben I think looking at this group on the road that you've got the two you've got Fred and Ben and I think they're probably the two strongest riders and I think as I said for Ben just put that responsibility all onto Fred Wright throw him that Throw in the title to lose, basically. Yeah, yeah. You look to him to chase, chase down any potential moves. And this is the chase group behind five riders uh, pursuing for. There is the sign for the city of Lincoln. Can Ben Swift do? Can he add another title? If he does, that will be mightily impressive and impressive. The last rider, or the second rider in recent years from the Ineos Grenadiers, formerly Sky, to do it. Peter Kenyak done it back to back years. 2014 and 2015, I think it yeah, was. Correct, yeah. I think that's the way to look at it. I think for for Ben and the other riders, they they have to be willing to lose this race in order to win this now. Yeah. No, definitely. What can Ethan Hayter do? Can he do something extraordinary on this final lap? But if he's if he if he wants to win this race, he has got to keep contributing to the pace making, keep this pace high, and then do something sensational. I do think he's got the beating of the rest of these riders in this group. He's held back a little bit on the climb, but when he really does turn it on, it's impressive. Yeah, I just I don't know what he's thinking. Yeah, I just he, if he doesn't go this time up, uh, he's not going to win. Uh, no. it's, it's as simple as that. He has to go to Co Co yeah. clear. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think I don't think he, he needs to try and do something to get across this gap. Yeah, um, maybe that will actually give take the pressure off Ben a little bit if he hears that. That he's coming across, he may say to the others, "Well, you keep riding because we've got two options now." But, yeah, I, but exactly, I also, yeah. but I also think Ben, if he's feeling good, he's going to want to win himself yeah. as well. So, will he really want to sit on and risk that? You know, it's it, there's so many different things at play here. Yeah, uh, and exactly. ultimately, it, and ultimately, in the national championships, you've got teammates wanting to beat each other as well. You yeah. cannot move away from that fact. It, it is unique in in, uh, in its in its dimension. Now. Yeah, I think with both sides of that, as as I just said that they need to be willing to lose this in order to exactly. win it and I think exactly. that's especially for Ben the, the situation you said if Hater then is able to go clear and try to bridge his gap Ben has the joy of then going I've got a rider coming I can just sit on the back of it which then might lead to Ethan getting on and being the stronger rider of two and maybe beating them but if he doesn't get back on Ben's had a free ride so there's so many situations so many different ways to look at things but if I was Ethan he's left it right down until this last lap to be able to do something he could have done it the last lap he might have been with them now and the dynamic could have changed completely 
Um, but for where he is now, he can see that gap. That's it a is big, big enormous. Gap. Yeah, it's uh, still, I would imagine, hovering over a minute. Next time I get a significant landmark, we'll do one of our little time checks. As Harry Tanfield rolls through the front. It's been a great race so far, a nutritional affair, as we expected. This is the British Men's Elite Road Race Championships and also the Lincoln Grand Prix as well. As we see an attack from Alex Peters here. This is group number three on the road. So we've got our four leaders, our five chasers, and then this group, that it, which are just turning in, so they are a couple of minutes behind. The second chase group being led by Alex Peters here. They just turned off the A57 on to Long Lays Road, so they are well, well behind. And they, they look pretty fatigued as well, as does everybody here, as does Dan McClay takes his turn on the front. The four riders in front, Dan McClay in the red for Arkea Samzik. Ben Swift, the defending champion for the Ineos Grenadiers, riding with number one on his back in P2. Harry Tanfield is there for Quebec next time. She's had a good couple of days in this national championships, a, me a medalist the other day in the circuit race championships, and Fred Wright just rolling through in uh, position number three there with number 10 on his back, the young 22-year-old, um, looking like he's in, in the position at the very, very least to win the under-23 award, but uh, given the class of Fred Wright, the rarefied level that he rides at, he's going to be thinking about the title and nothing else. Yep. Definitely, and I think that's the way he has to think about it. I'm just so intrigued to know what is going to happen in this group. A little bit of cat and mouse going through there between Askey saying, no, you've got to pull through a little bit. A little bit strange pulling off from third wheel unless he's going to go get drinks. But Connor Swift, he's obviously just trying to hang on for as long as he can. But yeah. seemingly on that last climb, just losing contact ever so slightly, managing to ride himself back on. But yeah. Again, again Connor is such a generous rider. Though. Even though he's suffering, he'll still roll through. I mean, yeah. And also at this level in the national championships, Everybody's taking a pound in, haven't they? Everybody is yeah, on the yeah. ropes in their own way. Even the riders that are strong are still suffering in their own way. They've just got a little bit left, but they're yeah. all going to be suffering and they all want to maintain and they end up with a decent top 10 position. First time I've seen Ethan Hayter maybe show a little bit of a fatigue there, puffed his cheeks out, or maybe that's a, a bit of a, a resigned sigh that the, the national championships is moving away from him, perhaps. Yeah, it's very possible indeed. And I think also for, for the likes of Ben now maybe knowing that uh, in the back of his head that Ethan is going to try something, it's then again getting in front of that. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if Fred Wright and Ben attacked together, maybe up this climb and then went clear again. So if Ethan was able to, to jump across and get clear and made it to these two, then he'd have to attack Tanfield and McClay from that group again. That's if that does happen. There's so many different scenarios you can look at, but <laughs> I think great, for Ethan, it? ultimately, he has to go. Yeah. He's got to try it, unless it, he might just be on his last legs or we're expecting way too much from him. Exactly. I don't think so. No, I, think he's still, I think he's still looking good. And any opportunity to rest up as well, riders will take. They've got a decent lead. I've set the clock. The rider, this is group number two. Great riding again by Sam Watson of Team Inspired in the green. They've still got a long way to go to the top of this drag. It gets pretty steep. It's like 7 or 8% at the top there. It just ratchets up gradually. It's like a mini ramp test, this drag, isn't it? It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody really, really talks about it in this race, but I think it's one of the, the toughest parts, especially when your legs are tired. And the thing is, you know, at the back of your mind, you've got this climb and then the descent, then the Michael Gate itself. This is just a little taste to just to really make the legs sting. The clock is still ticking, Adam. It's uh, yeah. Watson still on the front and it's stopping at 57 seconds. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a doable gap. Don't forget they will, if they're all together, they will play cat and mouse a little bit, so the speed will go out of that front group ever so slightly. Um, so that gap will come down just through that cat and mouse slightly, ever so slightly, maybe 10, 15 seconds. But for these guys, I'm just intrigued to know what's going to happen here. Who's got the legs, who's not got the legs? Each lap they do, the legs are going to be weaker and weaker and weaker, and we expect things of them. We talk about what they can do, but ultimately we don't know how they're feeling. We certainly don't. This is the penultimate time up the fearsome climb of the Michael Gate. This is the final race in the British Championships of 2021. We've been treated to some magnificent racing on the streets and the countryside of Lincoln. And going on at the right-hand side from this leading break is Harry Tanfield. Tanfield is looking really, really good. I don't think that Dan McClay can respond, but the man that can on the right-hand side is Fred Wright. Didn't want to let Tanfield go too much. I think McClay is really starting to struggle for the first time. McClay is out of the saddle and Ben Swift Pedaling, really twiddling that gear to try and pursue Fred Wright. We thought they were the two strongest riders. Wright looks exceptionally good 
very quick across this midsection. Then they swing left and the road kicks up again. McClay is really starting to pedal squares. You can really feel for the lad here. Rounds that corner. The cobbles get even worse on this section here. Right surges. Swift is on his wheel. Townfield still fights, gritting his teeth around that corner. And look at the pain of poor Dan McClay here. Yeah, it's awful. And this is what we spoke about, wasn't it? These two going up the road on this climb, getting rid of the other two. So it's just a, a two-man cat and mouse battle. I think with these two together now, they're not going to work too well together. And knowing Tanfield, the rider that he is, he will get his way back to them. He's a strong enough rider to be able to do so. And you can just see them within sight a little bit. He's a, naturally a little bit more of a time challenge, so more used to that power. As we see Hater again just not doing anything. I just don't think he's got the legs that we're expecting him to have. I don't think, I don't think he clearly can't respond. I think he's just starting to fade a little bit. He's had a magnificent season so far, but if he's got something there, he's doing it now. He's, he paces this climbing. It's very, very interesting. Just See the way he just drifted right and carried that momentum, sat down. It's a very strange but remarkably effective here way of is. climbing. Look, he's here going is. now, but he's going here. Look at the way that Askey's having to fight. Richardson fighting also. I think that's game over almost for Sam Watson, but what a ride it's been by the man in green. He blows and puffs around the corner, but powering through is Ethan Hayter. That almost effortless style of the man from the Ineos Grenadiers, a double champion already. What can he do? He's got uh, Askey with him, visibly contrasting in style, but to no less determined in effort. We have three riders out in front now. What a race this has been, Adam. I do love the Lincoln Grand Prix. Unbelievable stuff. Unbelievable stuff. But why didn't Hater go from the bottom of the climb? Why didn't he ignite those burnies? He's obviously feeling good. The acceleration he made there was absolutely unbelievable. And just seated and just being able to put those riders under pressure. But he's only done it on the last 20 seconds of the climb why didn't he go from the bottom why didn't he dig into this gap earlier he's just waited for me on that climb too long and if he has those riders with him again they're just going to look to him and say you're going to have to do this mate i can't contribute with you we know that you're stronger with me but if he went alone he could just settle into his rhythm let's not forget he's national time trial champion he's more than capable of riding alone yep definitely very very interesting situation Although we think we need to start setting some more rudimentary clocks at him just to get a sense of the drama here, what is unfolding in front of us. Just a reminder of the three riders in front, if you've just joined us, this is the final lap of the Men's Elite British Road Race Championships. It's been back after a year's absence. The rider on your screen leading for the Inos Grenadiers is the defending road race champion, Ben Swift. On his wheel, Fred Wright of Bahrain victorious and riding in third spot in the white of Quebec. And next hash is Harry Tanfield. They are the three riders out in front. They, at the moment, are the riders in the gold, silver and the bronze position. And one of them, at the moment, looks like they could be pulling on that beautiful jersey for the next 12 months. But what is happening behind? What are grounds are the next two riders made up? Askey and Hater. Yeah, and I think for Hater as well, the, the one person that you don't want to bring into this situation is Askey. Each and every time up that climb, he's been attacking, good, he's been at the front of it, yeah, he's been able to respond to attack. So I say out of all those riders that was in that group with, he's the one that you don't want to bring there. And Ethan leaving it late up that climb, almost riding to his power too much instead of just going for it. That's one ride you have to get rid of. You bring him into the fold with these guys, by the looks of things, he's absolutely flying. Yep, that was interesting. It's almost as if you rode the, the climb overly measured. We shall see. This will all unfold very, very shortly indeed. Hater rolls to the front. Two completely different styles. Hater rolling around about 80 RPM. Askey behind riding at about 90, uh, 90, 100 RPM. Should have set the clock. It's still around 45, 50 seconds though. I do think they are running out of tarmac to try and get across this gap. Yeah, I think it is going to be a difficult ask for them. But Hater, I think that he's still got plenty plenty within himself still to be able to bridge his gap and let's not forget these three riders will cat and mouse ever so slightly they'll start to miss turns a little bit they'll start to play a little bit on the last climb it's the last climb it's the man who's got the legs but beforehand it's the tactics that are involved in it and for Ethan that that plays into his advantages as well as Askey's and there needs to become a point that become in touching distance with this that Ethan goes sorry mate I can't do it I can't just take away this ride from Ben. He can't speak to Ben. He might, ben might not be confident in the way that he's feeling. I can, he can't speak for him, but judging by it in the situation that he's in, he must think, I can't just come into this and steal this from him because he might believe he's going to win. And it's the difficult, difficult part of having a teammate in there and knowing what to do. Exactly. And the fact that Ben is still riding on the front and chasing behind is, is his teammate. But we've got one rider in fourth position still. He's actually doing a solid rider. He's not that far off them. Estimate that to be about 15 or 20 seconds. This is Dan McClay from Arkea Samzik. 
is riding in fourth position on this road. The riders spread all over this beautiful Lincolnshire countryside. Such a difficult, attritional, here challenging go, race. Go. Oh, big, big movie. Wow, and that one up really nicely. They don't want to give him too much of a gap, that's for sure. But uh, Ben Swift didn't even need to force Fred Wright to chase. Wright was straight on his wheel. Yeah, and that's the exact same place that Tanfield did it last time. The lap beforehand, he attacked in exactly the same place. So as we've seen him up the climb, every lap so far, riding on that left-hand side of it, attacking in exactly the same place again. And Fred Wright getting on that ever, ever so quickly there. There was no hesitation, just jumped straight away with it. And look at him, looking over his shoulder, waiting to see if Ben attacks. I think there's a certain right out of all of these riders here, not to take anything away necessarily from the others, but see, the rider that, that to me senses or feels the most confident is Fred Wright. Yeah. I just feel it. I don't know what, what it is. It's intangible. Just the way he's covering the moves immediately, not taking any chances. Didn't even look across the bend to shut the gap. Yeah. And that sends a strong message. I can bring him back and I'm also going to win this race. You saw me put you in nearly in a box on that climb last time up. Unless exactly. Ben is hiding something, you know, shaking his legs out here, coming into this last lap here. But for me, could be wrong but Fred Wright just seems to have that little bit of an edge at the moment yeah I think I'm with you there I think he just looks to be that little bit of the stronger out of these three riders but you never know things might change going into this last lap the, the way that you feel that knowing that you're on the last lap and the extra bit that you can dig up this climb might be significant to, to how deep you can go so I think you're right, Matt. He does look the stronger out of the three of them, but it's a national championship. There's a jersey up for grabs. He gets to wear for a whole year, so the motivation you have might be, might be able to just take you over the limit a little bit more. It's amazing that the. I, I just love that. that when riders are really under pressure on this climb, you can read so much. How much just to fight, just to get the body and the bike over the top of that climb, and then you've just got to get on top. No rest at all. That's what makes this race so difficult. That's why it doesn't need to be 250 kilometers. Go on, imagine if it was. Go on, blimey, you'd have no finishes. Anyway, three riders out in front, heading back out to the furthest point on the circuit, onto the A57. Harry Tanfield leads. He's been cornering so, so well over the last few days. A great bike handler. Gets super, super aero. And meanwhile, Dan McClay isn't out of the mix either. I think this will be a good indication of where the others are behind. Ethan Hayter and Askey, when, if they catch Dan McClay, we know that he's quite close. We've not seen the shot of him yet. We'll know ultimately how far they're behind when we see the shot of him. But I think knowing how much ground they're making up and then seeing them maybe catch McClay is knowing they're coming quickly. And that can maybe change the way that this is ridden at the front. It could also help. I mean, the fact that uh, McClay's in the middle or maybe like a third of the distance across that gap and based on our previous estimates, it's also a little carrot for Hater and Askey to see as well. So uh, we always talk about that dangling carrot, that little bit of a, of a, of a, a carrot in front. It's massively important because you can see that differential. You can see when you're losing ground, but more importantly, you can see when you're gaining and you gain morale from that as you just go through... Uh, I can't remember what we and Hannah called it earlier on. Was it a GB straight, we call that? Britain, Great Britain straight. Nice. That's very straight. Great name for the road, but yeah, it'd be great to get these shots of uh, to Hater to see where he is. I do believe that he's going to be fought out between those three riders at the front there, and deservingly so, you know, Ben Swift on, on the attack from lap three, Tanfield yep. the previous lap, and then um, Fred Wright coming across with Ethan Hater in that group that, that eventually all came together. But Dan's still holding on, you know, and when they play cat and mouse a little bit, you never know what might happen, but Dan is just trying to hold on for as long as he can and stick to his guns in his own his own effort at the minute yeah definitely he's just got to just got to keep on rolling and hope uh, for exactly the reasons that you say 16 seconds behind is uh, dan mcclay it's such a hard place to be there if you're dan mcclay knowing that you're so close to the front and knowing that you're just out the middle close medals. to the win but you're probably not going to get the win and it's it's kind of when you're in this position now you're like what does fourth place mean in this situation well, if i get back on that. yeah exactly i mean really all things being equal based on what we've seen so far they're just the, the, the evidence and the way he rode that last climb, if he does get back on again, unless he breaks free, he's going to get dropped again on the climb. As you said, so that makes it psychologically challenging. It's not as if he's made a tactical error and he's stronger and he's getting across the gap to try and win this. He's actually onto a little bit of a loser. So it's an unenviable position that Dan McClay finds himself in at the, the moment. The worst position, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, taking nothing away from him, he's done a great, great ride. And it's Brilliant, another facet yeah. that we've never really seen to Dan um, because of the way that, he's normally, that he normally rides as Harry Tanfield takes a look over his shoulder. A proud he's Yorkshire. He's got man. to attack before, and doesn't he? He's again. got to try he knows something again. I think he knows that these two are a little bit stronger on the climb, maybe. Um, so he's got to attack again, and it's just when he does that, and if he's able to get that gap and that distance. But he's, um, I 
think for Ben it's all just a, a case of just going up that climb and trying to hang on to Fred Wright and maybe get the better of him at the top. But judging on the last climb, Fred's definitely got maybe a little bit fresher legs. Ben did come back to him on the top of that climb. And when you come onto that concrete section, the top right-hand corner, and Hater, as we talked about, not too far behind. They're closing. They are closing. Askey and Hater. Well, on this bit of road here when we swing left, I didn't put the clock on them. I'm going to put the clock on them in a moment. But uh, it's got there we go. Seconds, yeah, well, you can, see, you can just see. You can actually see they're closing. So 16 seconds from the front group to Dan McClay. And I'd would, I would say these are at about 30 seconds up. There is Dan McClay. And just up in front is the car behind our three leaders. So this is closing up. Hater there having a little bit of a word. I think he wants his team car to come up here. Sure, There's an indication. Too late to get all that. No. Nope. So he's gone up. straight up to Swift now. Asking for some assistance. I'm intrigued to know what it is, but they are definitely making ground on Dan McClay there. And it becomes a point where. He wants some advice here, doesn't he, as well? What do I do? What's the gap? What's what do we do here? Do I work? Oh, he's asking the riders that are in the front, I think. Who's in the front? McClay, Swift. Not McClay. McClay's in front of him. Tanfield, sorry. Well, that's it, because the lack of him. There's no radios here, as we meant before, so there's a very limited information that these riders are dropping into the slipstream, the vortex created by the accelerating car driven by the National Road Endurance coach, Matt Bramier. So Hater on the front. Look at the effortless way. He's probably on the 11 there, rolling it around, but looking at the look at the, the differential in the effort behind for Askey just to hold on his wheel. He's really having to fight, isn't it? Again, he makes it look so, so oh, Tanfield easy. Tanfield goes again, look. Wow, the big move by Tanfield. We know how much power he can generate. But straight on his wheel again is Fred Wright. Fred Wright from London is equal to it. He glances around just to make sure where Ben Swift is. He needs to shut that gap pretty soon. You don't want to leave Harry Tanfield <laughs> hanging out it's because he will, he will break you, won't he? Oh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And there we go, they're caught in the clay, so they are not far behind them now. Well, for Askey and for Hater, they've just got to commit to it, especially for Askey. That he knows that Ethan, what he's going to do on that climb, he knows at the bottom of it, he will have to go. I really hope he doesn't wait until that last 20 metres again. <laughs> Well, let's just uh, put a clock on it on this uh, corner. They turn back in to Long Lays Road. They're within the last uh, three and a half miles. You can just see up ahead the the plateau. It is the situation, the location for our seconds, start so finishing. Like down. Yeah, 24 seconds. It is coming down significantly. This this is traditionally the place where we've seen riders start to cat and mouse, just to give themselves a little bit of a breath, because they'll know they're going to go very, very, very deep this last time up yeah. the Michael Gates. So this is where they will slow. And it's, a, it's the last opportunity, I think, for Hater to get across with Askey now. Yeah, and I think also Ben might be saying, I've got, I've got Hater coming. Exactly. Hater, yeah, I'm sitting on, I'm sorry, lads. I'm wondering if that's why Brammy has gone across the gap, not to tell him what to do, but just to pass on that information, because it again... It gives him an opportunity. Exactly, yeah. he's got an excuse now. Hater's coming across. Askey so willing to do some riding here, and I think with greatest of respect to Dan McClay, he's happy to have a couple of wheels to sit on because he's had a torrid time on the last lap. Um, Tanfield moves to the front, and, and yep, this is it. They're playing the team card here, which they're perfectly entitled to do. Uh, ben Swift trying to save that little bit of energy because he has got Ethan Hayter coming across the gap now. So a real fascinating tactical play. This race is not over, and given the terrain that's still got to come, it's the type of terrain where if a group eases up on the front, they're not going to be carrying a lot of momentum, so it's easy to eat up the ground pretty fast. Yeah, very easy indeed. And the way that, you know, we always look at Hayter, and it doesn't look like he's going fast at all, but look at how far he is down his cassette. He's in a big gear. He's not moving at all, but just the way that Askey's rock and rolling his shoulders, even Dan McClay rocking and rolling his shoulders a little bit. He's pushing on, and it wouldn't surprise me if they did catch them before the bottom of Michael Gate, and then... <laughs> we shall see. This is what a race we've been yeah. treated to. Um, just stop that clock at the moment. So it's getting a bit cat and mousey here. Yeah. This I long think open Tanfield stretch now. Will start to attack again. He's given the responsibility to Swift here, saying, "You know what? I'm going to sit here. I'm not. I know I'm not going to beat you two up this climb. So I'm just going to sit on. I'll try and attack again, but I'm going to force it. And there he goes. The attack's gone again by Tanfield, followed directly again by Fred Wright. Swift jumping on the back again, playing into Swift's hands once again, being able to sit on the back a little bit. But Tanfield. He's not done yet, look. Every attack he makes, he still carries on with it until they get right on the wheel, but he hurts them even more and more and more and more each time that he does this and ex keeps extending it. That little one-metre gap, you know, at this point in the race, slightly going uphill, it hurts. 32 miles an hour they were going through there. They're slightly uphill. And slightly uphill, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you've got to take your hat off to Harry Tanford. He's ridden a very, very aggressive race. He knows he's certainly, to a degree, compared 
to Ben Swift and to Fred Wright, a little bit limited on the climb. He's got one option, and that's to break clear and win alone. Uh, but it's very difficult when you've got two riders. But interestingly, Ben Swift has never, hasn't shut down the gap once at all. This is this very intriguing chase behind. 26 seconds, so it's holding steady here. In fact, maybe a couple of seconds have just been shaved off as Askey hits the front. Just on his wheel is Dan McClay from Arkea Samzik. And Wouldn't the double champion me. behind Hater. Wouldn't surprise me if Hater went early, and I mean early, early, like going up through this point on now. This where drag, they are, yeah. yeah. On the drag, you've just got to give everything you can to the finish. If he doesn't try that and he gets away from those riders on Michael Gate and he's in within 10 or 3 seconds, 5 seconds, catch him on the line, he'll always have that regret of, I should have tried a little bit sooner. But in just the riders, just gone around that corner now, so they are close, but at the minute, unless they unless they attack, unless they push on even more, I don't think they're going to get them. So they're going to roll down this hill a little bit of cat and mouse. They're not going to roll too much quicker than on the climb. It's just eyeballs out all the way to the finishes. McClay is just distance from these two riders, Askey and Hater. Yeah, Askey and uh, Hater just putting a little bit too much pressure down. And if you just look up ahead, there is the team car. So they just behind the close. riders. They've just gone over the top, though, so I'll just put a, a little bit of a gap on this one because they've just slowed right Swift over the top there. All right. Now? Tanfield well, this is interesting. The mouse, I think. Well, right's gone. Askey attacks. Well, there's no mistake about the amount of effort that Askey is putting in all over the bike. Absolutely stamping on the, the pedals with real ferocity here, rounding the top, desperately trying to find something to bring them back into contention. Straight over the top is Ethan Hayter, still sensing there is a small chance. 18 seconds it is now, Adam. We're coming into the final kilometre of the British Road Race Championships, and still we've got this jersey I up for grabs. I think they're going to catch him before the bottom. I think they are. These lot are playing too much. Hayter's on the front. Doesn't look like he's flat out, but that style of Hayter is very deceiving. I think when they come down here, they are going to be going 10, 15 miles an hour quicker than them around the corners. And I think if Hayter starts at the bottom, it is going to be very, very difficult. But just in front, maybe not catch him at the bottom. But these guys are going to have to go flat out right from the bottom of the climb to, to get a medal. These riders will cat and mouse still, Matt. They are still playing a little bit. Fred right on the front, Swift checking his shoulder. Tanfield starts to react. Tanfield goes on the left-hand side. We've got around 400 metres to go. A couple of hundred metres behind is the express train of these two riders, Ethan Hayter and also Lewis Askey. Le left now, 400 metres to go, and that we will know who the British elite road race champion is. But look at the speed of Hayter on the lower slopes of this climb. This is an absolute thriller, Adam. We're on the slope, we're on the cobbles, we're on the pave, the stones, for the final time. And right goes on the left-hand side. Right, it's gone right from the bottom there. Swift has to respond. So does Tamfield, but on the cobbles both from Swift sitting on the outside, indicating he's got better legs. Has, Tam has uh, Fred Wright gone too early? Swift responds now. Hater's gone as well. Hater's gone as well. He's left Askey for dust, but uh, it's Ben Swift. And another acceleration by Fred Wright. Fred Wright goes on the left hand side. I think he's cracked. Swift, Swift goes again. It's Nick and Nick coming in to this final little left hander. Swift goes again. It's it. That side by side. It's a drag strip race here in Lincoln. What a sensational race we've been treated to here. Over the final, the penultimate stretch of cobbles. Swift takes a link. He takes another in a huge gear back temporarily on to the tarmac. The round the corner. Swift still in front. I think he's broken right. Swift will be taking title number two. Ben Swift backs it up. Ben Swift again is the winner of the British Elite Men's Road Race title here in Lincoln. What an absolutely sensational ride that was by Ben Swift. A beautiful, beautiful win in a sensational, wonderful race. Can't talk, I'm praying a bit. Well, this sport is powerful. It's emotional. This is such a savagely difficult race. And look at that, Ben Swift, one of the most popular and likeable characters you're ever possible to meet in British cycling, takes the title. But what a battle, what a fight Fred Wright put up. With halfway up, they both almost had three kind of sprint seats and three separate accelerations, but at the end it was just that belief, wasn't it? He fought all the way to the end with every single sinew of his body, and he'll be wearing that jersey for another 12 months. Yeah, absolutely unbelievable by Ben now. I think the previous laps I was I was sort of questioning Ben and his, his way that he was responding to things in the saddle, but he knew what he had to do, getting getting himself into that second position on the climb and you know, just not giving up all the way to the top. And the gear that he was rolling around was absolutely phenomenal. And we talked about, didn't we, Matt, that extra little bit of something that you can give just going over the top. And, yeah, I'm so, so chuffed for him. So, so chuffed for Ben. Yeah.
who looks absolutely delighted. No news of uh, a contract for them yet. I think that's uh, Ross Dowling now, another former road race champion. Big, big, close friends with Ben Swift. In fact, I think they both went out for a cafe ride again. I think Ross is close to tears there as well. Well, that was nothing short of magnificent. Every edition of the Lincoln Grand Prix gives us uh, something special. And there is Russ getting on the action. That was a brilliant move. We've had magnificent racing across the week, though. The time trials were sensational. The circuit races were wonderful. One of both... Uh, well, just talk us through these last few metres, because this was immense, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, this was it. You can see the gear that Ben is in. Fred Wright has to sit down. It was at this point where he just realised Ben might have it. They come round the corner, a little bit of seated round that corner. Fred's on his wheel, and it's just this bit here. Ben sits in the saddle, accelerates the smaller gear, out the saddle again, and an enormous gear, and Fred knows by now he's beaten. Ben knows he's got it, and... Just a single punch to the air. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> brilliant stuff. As fair as you like, though, that was... I've used that analogy before. That was basically just taking chunks out of each other that climb, weren't they? I mean, uh, the, the British cycling at its very, very best in um, one of the most iconic and most loved locations in the country for cycling as well. Yeah. A wonderful, wonderful race. Had some great winners over the year. And um, we'll get a... Of course, there's still quite a few riders to finish on this circuit. Each one of them has had their own personal battle on this uh, very, very difficult course. But I tell you what, that was an absolute thriller. Hater as well, I think, got third. Did he get third? I think that was sensational. <laughs> oh, blimey. I mean, there you go, but uh, very generous. I mean, he, it's no, there's no point in even kind of dissecting it even more. But did, did he leave it late? Did he not? It, it, the race has been won. And, uh, yeah. and, it, was, and it was done in the, in the boldest, bravest fashion. We talked about the importance of riding this race on the offensive, taking risks, you know, expending a, a, a lot of energy, you know. And, and he did it. Your fortune often favours the brave and one of the bravest riders in the race and one of the most likeable riders in the race. He's taken his second title. I think really when you look at Ben's ride today as well, he was never on the back foot. He was always in the perfect position. He was. He never put a foot wrong the whole race, even coming into the finish, let Fred Wright respond to the attacks, just sitting on the back a little bit. He played it to perfection. Um, and, yeah, I'm just so, so happy for him. I couldn't help but get a bit emotional when he crossed the line. It's, it's an emotional sport, Adam. Um, shed a tear on many occasions in bike races. Um, he, he's he's just, man. Yeah, he's, he's just... Dad. There we go. Special moment there. Uh, that is brilliant. That's, uh, he couldn't probably have had a more popular winner. Really wonderful stuff. An immense battle. I think we'll be watching that on replay. Or well, Ben Wilk and the rest of the Ineos Grenadiers as well. And just fans of the sport. So it's going to be three years. He's uh, been in that jersey for two and a half years. And there'll be another year in the jersey as well for Ben Swift. So a wonderful, wonderful ride. And you've got to um, take your, your hat off to Fred Wright. You know, about 12 years, Ben's, uh, Ben's junior but really put up a fight, looked really sharp, but Ben had just something deep, didn't he? To reach deep into that suitcase of courage and find something very, very special. And um, you could all, but, I mean, the, the, the so amount of power he was putting through and as a result, the amount of pain he was feeling, he just found something very, very special. Hoofing a ridiculously large gear, it was like weight threatening around that final corner. Every single sinew of his body uh, would have been that, would have been aching and on fire, and that is what it means uh, to the assembled crowd here. Ben Swift wins title number two, wearing number one. So what a as well. We talked about we always get a beautiful atmosphere, an electric atmosphere here in the centre of Lincoln, and uh, this edition of the Lincoln Grand Prix incorporating the British Road Championships has certainly not disappointed. A big thank you again to um, Rafa the Lincoln Grand Prix and the local authorities for putting this race on over the last few days as uh, riders continue to fight their way up the climb. It was one of the riders from the Briggs uh, Clancy team, and that was uh, Alistair Slater, just finishing through. I think riders will be finishing uh, for the next few minutes. There we go, let's... Uh, Congratulations, yeah. Uh, Apologies, it's not his old man that I thought it was. Looked a bit young, didn't relative. <laughs> But, yeah. Close to home for Ben as well. Not far away from where he lives in Sheffield, so I'm sure he'll have all his, his fans there, his, his uh, family, his supporters, the people have been with him throughout his whole career. So, 
having them there as well will um, be extra special. And his two sons, which is beautiful, of course. Just going to enjoy another year in that jersey. He's had a fair sort of injuries over the last couple of years as well as Ben Swift. So this uh, late stage of his career um, been rewarded. This uh, consistency has indeed been rewarded. So Ben Swift, 33 years of age now, from uh, relatively nearby Rotherham. He's coming to form really nicely and clearly targeted this event. Uh, well, he's made it his own over the last few seasons, of course. It's, uh, didn't have the British Championships last year. Great to have it back. I think that's Leo Hayter there, and the brother of Ethan so Hayter. And as soon as we do get an official result, result, we will uh, get that to you as well. But uh, a great race, and a real, I think it's fair to say, Adam, a classic edition of the British Road Championships. Yeah, it was indeed, and I think it was, with with any race that it is, we're always trying to analyse and trying to, to sum up what might happen. And I think, you know, even myself, I was, I was worried that Ben wouldn't be able to do it. I think Fred Wright looked stronger on the climb each time, but I think that that when you really do think about it, that's just Ben being very clever about it, not giving anything away, doing totally. minimum as he can by staying at the front of the race and he was just he was just able to, to dig deeper there, got into that bottom corner there, that left hander first. And I think from then on, if you're going to make an acceleration, it's going to take so much out of you to get past someone on that steep that you have to do it before and Ben was aware of that and just absolutely nailed it tactically the whole day. It's line choice as well. In the last few metres, we all know, it's so technical, this running. Even if you can steal just a length, the amount of power it would take um, to actually pass somebody that late. I mean, so all those little, those small elements when you do break it down are important. And, and um, it's really easy for the red mist to descend. You're in a lot of pain. Um, you're in a lot of pain. So clearly, yeah, almost subconsciously, and the, and the best riders... They do it innately, don't they? There's nowhere to place themselves at those critical moments. And Ben Rode on the left-hand side took that left, first left-hand corner and just shaved a little bit of distance off. Just those small things, got that lead, held it. Although, yeah, it's that acceleration out of that corner when you get back onto that tarmac stretch there. He's been able to almost sit down, change up and be able to accelerate again. And Ben was able to do that in a slightly smaller gear, accelerated then back into the enormous gear, accelerated. And by that point, I think that Fred Wright knew um, and Ben knew that he won it. And yeah, it's just absolutely brilliant by Ben. I think when you really dissect the race, you look back from right at the start, he was attacking from the word go. He was always on the on the front foot of the race. He was always making sure he was ahead of ahead of the action, really, ahead yeah. of the chase, ahead of the drama behind. He put himself on that front foot and. You know, he, he just made his day hard, but he made it the easiest for him as well. Thrilled for him, absolutely thrilled. Yeah, great entertainment, great race. And um, from what you said, what we can also draw from that set of conclusions, Adam, is the fact that uh, Ben was hungry for it as well. There was just no ever, there was a real clarity to his ride. There was never any doubt. On the, on, on the front foot from the off, knowing how this race often pans out, knowing you cannot race it from behind. And if you do, it's always going to be a really, really tall order. Um, from an investment perspective, it's going to take a lot more energy, but um, that way you, you just, you're in for a long day on the side and a lot of suffering, but it's the way to ride this race. And that was a real demonstration of how you win um, this race. Yep. <laughs> it was just uh, a real pure definition of what it takes to win the Lincoln Grand Prix. And in the process, of course, the National Road Race Championships. Yeah. So, did he, uh, sorry, Mark, go no, on. no, just have a little look back. Seems an awful long time ago, doesn't it? It's around four hours ago now. That initial breakaway from uh, Dan Bigham. And also we need to take our hat off as well to Sam Watson from Team Inspired who went along for the ride with Dan Bigham. They spent a couple of uh, laps in front, opened up a lead of around a minute. And then it was Ben Swift that came across with, uh, with several other riders, including Dan McClay at the back there. And we had a few riders who suffered a couple of unfortunate mechanicals, one of which we'd uh, never really seen before. And after the race came back together on a couple of occasions, and the 12 riders out in front at one point maximum, that's then split again. And then the penultimate time up the Michael Gate, we saw an acceleration by Fred Wright in the centre there, following that, uh, ha following Harry Tanfield. It really was a big surge of speed, and that uh, put paid to the chances of uh, a lot of other riders, but ultimately coming up there. Michael Gate for the final time. With a roar, it was Ben Swift who took the title. 
ultimately in quite emphatic style in front of an enthused crowd here. Absolutely loved this race. And what a way to end the British National Road Championships of 2021. So all that uh, leaves us to do, Adam, is to have a bit more podium time. We've got the under-23 jersey to be awarded. That will go to Fred Wright. And then the elite jersey, which will go to Ben Swift. And he's certainly going to enjoy this moment, isn't he? He is indeed, yeah. <laughs> few pints tonight. Yeah. I wonder if this is Ben's last race of the season. I'd imagine it would be. <laughs> I think it will straight be, Straight to yeah. the calf, uh, straight to the calf tomorrow in his newly minted jersey. Yeah, which he's already got a lot of. He's already got a fair <laughs> few, isn't he? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just thrilled to bit through him. I think it's, it's, it's not, um, it's really difficult actually, because Ben commentating on the race. We, we often commentate on race and everything, but He's been, I've been riding for him since I was five, so for me You're very close, mate, and I can yeah. see that, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a lovely lad. And I know when we spoke um, a couple of years ago about it, you, um, yeah, you basically, you're a similar age, aren't you? You know, so then you've raced together since year dot. And um, when, you, when you know what certain individuals have been through on a personal basis, sporting basis as well, but when you see uh, good people rewarded like this, it's a, it's a humbling experience, mate. So um, I get why it's powerful and emotional it is yeah it's brilliant i think i'm just absolutely overwhelmed and so so happy for him i think it's um the nationals is a special special race and just to be able to win it and the way that he won it all day and not putting a foot wrong but I, you know as well how much it means to oh, to oh one person God. so it's um, oh gosh i think that's why it kind of resonates a little bit um, yeah we know especially we know the feeling it gives you um, all the sacrifice time away from your family and stuff like that it all it sharpens your focus, doesn't it? And, um, but it allows you that real moment of sweetness. And that's what is one of the most special things about the sport that we all love, is, is the sacrifice you give. And, and through a rider's career, um, quite often there aren't that many moments of, of victory, of, of sweetness. But when they do come, they are very, very special indeed. And moments to save them. So look at the crowd here. It's going to be a real party atmosphere, I think, in uh, Lincoln this evening. As the, uh, the light slowly fades, there only so the brightness on this podium. We've got two uh, presentations, the under-23s and the Elite, and we'll get Sorry, to this as soon as possible, please, making, please, sure please, possible please, making sure the riders uh, have got some fresh, warm kit on and are looking shiny for the podium as the uh, chatter continues behind the scenes. Who has organised this race up? This year's size is in Emerson. Oh, we have to be in So I think the first award will be given. It's uh, in Emerson, the organiser of the Lincoln Grand Prix for many years. Um, he's taking the back seat now. So this is this is the uh, climbers competition. Uh, points awarded three, two, one every time up the Michael Gate. So Lewis Askey third in that uh, particular competition. In second place, Fred Wright of Bahrain Victorious. Fred Wright of Bahrain Victorious in second place. So we've got some mates uh, not too far away. He'll probably be down the pub later as well. And in third place. And the winner of the Brian Costello Michael Gate Award, Sam Watson of Team Inspired. And there we go. Sam Watson of Team Inspired takes the Brian Costello Award, the king of Michael Gate. And what a future this lad has. So a rider we don't, haven't seen too often on our screens. But a, a real showcase for him moving on to uh, essentially swapping places with Lewis Askey, moving to the Group Armour FDJ Conti team while Askey moves up to World Tour. Yeah, and wanting to probably keep that top podium step though. Indeed, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was your King of the Michael Gate Award. Michael Gate Award. Michael Gate Michael Gate Award. Of Team Inspired. Sam Watson. It's like a Swift is signing a few uh, autographs there. Well, we, we that. Brilliant. It's probably the, the closest Nationals he'll have to his home as well. Yeah. Rotherham's not too far away at all, is it? No, not at all. Brilliant. Family and friends around. I think it's his uncle, I think. I'm not too sure, but yeah. It's nice that he's got his family there. I'm not sure if his uh, if his sons will be there or not, and his and his wife. But looks like, sure like Tom Bonin has come. Uh, it looked a bit like Tom Bonin. Dominic. 
be sure it's not. But uh, now there'll be uh, photographs, selfies, and uh, autographs all around for Ben Smith. Uh, ben, ben Swift will be lapping this up. He's always got time for people, as Ben. I mean, there's not that many um, unlikable people in our sport, to be honest with you, mate. But he's one of the diamonds, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he really is. He really is as well. And I think what's what's nice with Ben as well is that, as we talked about in the show, that we you get to see how hard someone works, and Ben spends most of the year being a helper to other riders in aid, aiding them to get victories. Um, the likes of Ethan Hater and other riders as well, and just to. Uh, to see just that singular win that Ben's had this year, being the national championships, icing on the cake, so for all that work to, to come off, it's brilliant. Definitely. And he can just kick back now as well. No more racing this year. So here we go. This is the under-23 awards. So Leo Hayter in third place. So the Hayter family done very, very well. Leo Hayter, again, rode a very, very good race, a patient race, as we said before. If you keep on riding in this race, you can actually end up with a very good spot. And winner of the silver medal, Lewis Askey of Group Palma SDJ. Lewis Askey, the silver medal in the under-23 road race championships. Superb ride from him. Looked good all day. Again, a rider who really and rode boldly place, today. Your British cycling under-23 men's national road race champion. Under 23 road race champion is Fred Wright. Rides at world tour level, of course, but uh, still a young man at 22. So this, I feel, would be his last year. But, um, some compensation, of course, for finishing in the runner-up spot today. But uh, the lad from London gets a jersey, and what he did provide us with. That's the thing: the second place riders are oh, well, second place silver medal in, in the elite, but. Um, what, what he did was make Ben Swift's victory even better because of the battle that they had. So yeah. he played a massively important role. We thought he was been going to be the man to beat. He was because Ben had to fight yeah. tooth and nail, Pritz. He's got to take your hat off yeah. to this young man um, as well. Yeah, definitely. I think just through the, the way the race was ridden and what Fred did throughout the race and all the attacks, the chases coming from behind and just being three of them there and being hater even getting bronze, showing how close he actually got to it shows how hard they had to work through it throughout the whole day. It wasn't a case of just, you know, picking those moves and jumping in, and Ben had to make those moves. He had to follow the moves, as did Fred as well. Um, so, yeah, it was just a, a brilliantly, brilliantly won race, and a, I think especially for Ben, tactically almost perfect. Yes, certainly was. So champagne moment on the podium for the under-23 men's. The ninth of our British Championship jerseys awarded over the last few days, and the final one will be given in just a few moments time but uh, meanwhile it's a bouquets galore thrown into the crowd and we get some more bubbly and a rather smeared camera lens for our next set of awards it's gonna be a big cheer here that's for sure always gets a great crowd doesn't it regardless of the weather conditions the fans come from miles around to watch the lincoln grand prix don't they so it was a very well attended uh, race and that's what uh, it's the crowds that make this race as well first ridden raced way back in 1956 second time it's been incorporated into the british road championships but finally the moment is upon us Thank you for coming down and supporting the championships here today. Uh, and a big, big thank you to everybody who has made it happen. So we are going to move on. Quite rightly thanking the crowd for making the trip to uh, help elevate this race and really bring it alive because um, without the crowds at the side of the road anywhere, it, um, you know, cycling would be a hollow sport, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know. He's even won a Roubaix stone. Look, look at that. I know, that would be a straight <laughs> line. Lincolnshire, yeah. Lincolnshire stone. The medal and jersey will be presented by Bob Howden, OBE, President of British Cycling. So there's Bob Howden there, President of uh, British Cycling. Place, your winner of the bronze medal, Ethan Hayter. Of Ethan Hayter amazingly Indian. managed to pull another medal out. So it's two championship wins. But on this occasion in the road race, he's had to settle for the bronze after a superb race. Still an amazing record, really. 
and I'm sure, I think I'd happily bet now yeah, that at some point in the future he'll win this title. Of the silver medal, Fred Wright of Barry Victoria. Fred Wright already a jersey to his name. He won the under 23. He's going to have to settle for the silver medal in the elite title from London, applying his trade for Bahrain victorious. And in first place, your 2021 British Cycling Men's National Road Race Champion, Ben Swift of CBS Rotherham's finest, Ben Swift. Takes to the podium, handshakes all round from right and teammate Ethan Hayter. Ben Smith, Ben Swift, should I say. Oh, get me words all befuddled. Is your national champion. Back to back wins after a two year hiatus. And this will be the moment that uh, will be the sweetest. It's pulling on that beautiful jersey, which he will wear with pride for the next 12 months. Just come forward, lads, if you can. There we go. A warm round of applause from the assembled fans and members of the public here in the centre of Lincoln. So we just have a, a very important presentation by one man who has uh, stitched together four amazing days of competition. The Roy Hart Memorial Trophy, which dates back to the very beginning of the Lincoln Grand Prix and the Rafa Lincoln Gr oh, there we go. Grand Prix at Cobblestone. The Roy Hart Trophy, this was awarded back in 1956 happen. for the first winner of this race. It is uh, Dan Elmore presenting the prize. It's a real Sue rich heritage ben and Swift tradition, which that continues. Champion. And also big thanks um, to Rafa for helping finance and put this race on as well. And who's going to win the Cork Championships? Who's going to pop their cork first? That's the big question. It is Hater. Hater takes the win in the cork competition. Swift is second. And right, he struggles, but uh, gets across the line in third. Fun and games on the podium. Thanks. Brilliant stuff. Well, that rounds out a quite magnificent few days of racing. The British Championships is done and dusted, and there's that beautiful cobble trophy that Ben Swift will now own as the winner of the Lincoln Grand Prix. So he gets two races on his Palmares here, Adam. He gets the National Road Championships and a free race as well, the Lincoln Grand Prix added to the mix. I'd, I'd take really both of those, won. wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. No, it's fantastic to see, and it's good to see all the lads in uh, in high spirits as well. I think you know, right at the end of the season, although a lot, a lot of questions are asked why it was so late. It's still put on, and the lads now, especially Ben and the lads on the podium, can really let their hair down and celebrate this this properly. Which is rare to do these days. Yeah, you can properly kick back, can't it? It's very rare. Normally, the, the national championships are held at the end of June. And a lot of riders will carry those jerseys or the jer national championships on into the Tour de France, so no real chance to, to savour it. So the kind of different placement of the national champions this year will certainly allow Ben Swift to really savour that jersey, savour the moment and uh, let his hair down a little bit, enjoy some quality time with his family and friends before refocusing on uh, 2022. A good weekend's business, you think? Yeah, it's been an amazing uh, few days and... Um to finish with Swifty and my team keeping the title was amazing, yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good team effort in the end because when Ben got up the road in that group of four, you obviously had to sit back and wait for someone else to perhaps bridge the gap. Was it frustrating? No, it wasn't frustrating. We were close to coming back, actually, and we just didn't quite uh, make it in the end, but I really enjoyed today. It was always a good Lincoln GP. Yeah, and the final question to you as well. You came up really quick at the end, obviously took, uh, took Harry Tanfield before the line who was very disappointed with his performance in the end because he'd done a lot of work. But if you'd gone a bit earlier, do you think you might have been able to you know, run swiftly close? Maybe if we'd caught them, maybe if we'd caught them and it might have been a bit different. Um, <laughs> but we're in different circumstances. You know, I kind of sat back in that group a little bit more while I um, kind of had to. And we then had the swiftly could then follow and save his legs as much as possible, I think. And it uh, worked out in the end for us.
Really well done, Ethan. Uh, two jerseys and a bronze is a, is a, is a pretty good weekend's work. Uh, Fred, step in for us, uh, will you? Uh, Fred, right? Congratulations, silver Thank medal. You very much. Yeah, uh, disagreeing there, you would have, you would have held. No, I'm, on. Only, I'm only messing. I'm only messing. It were, you know, it was just all out on the, up that last climb. I was just desperately trying to trying to beat Swifty. I knew it was, but into that corner onto the tarmac, who was ever going to go into that was going to going to win. Like we were right neck and neck, but I just. Like I couldn't do anything. That was that was all I had. So. People might might not realise, but you and Ethan know each other of old, right? Uh, from yeah, well, racing we actually, on the track. We, we actually we actually live together. So oh, well, yeah, oh yeah. That even even better than I he's, expected. Uh, he's my landlord, basically. So. Is he really? Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, well, maybe for not for much longer if you beat him uh, <laughs> well, in the race. Yeah. Uh, congratulations to you, Fred. Hopefully, we've got Ben Swift here as well. Really well done to you. No, it was a really good race. I really enjoyed it. Crowds yeah. were amazing up that last climb. Yeah, just flat out racing all day, but yeah. Really. A bit gutted, but happy. happy well, with. maybe next time. Fred, thanks very much. Off-season time. <laughs> Off-season time. Ben, step in. Uh, massive congratulations. It's one thing winning that jersey once, but defending it successfully as you have done is phenomenal. Not been done very often. Pete Kenyuk, I think, was the last one to do it. So yeah. you must be chuffed a bit. No, over the moon. Uh, you know, I've come used to riding this jersey. Unfortunately, we never got to race last year, so I got a year for free. And hopefully today... Uh, I justified that extra year. Yeah, it was an incredible day. I think my form, you know, I've had a bit of a up and down year. Uh, real highlights, you know, I've had my second child in Harry. Uh, but in terms of personal results, and just didn't really go that well at the start of the year and mid-year. And it started to come together now. And to finish it off like this, yeah, I'm really happy. Today definitely was not for free. And I think experience told there. We saw you on the Michael Gate just trying to get the younger lads to ease off a little bit. There's no point blowing themselves up going up that climb because you've got to do it 13 times. Is that what the conversation was about most of the day? Yeah, I mean, uh, nationals, you've got to race from the front. And I think at first I went away with Ben Turner on lap three, I think it was. And I was like, oh, it's going to be a bit of a long day. And then came back. But as soon as you just keep moving off the front, and we had a really nice group with... Uh, six of us early doors and the guys were just riding a bit too hard but we knew that uh, Dan Bigham and Tamfield was really strong but they put them out of the back it's like just ease off yeah. use them as much as we can and Harry was well he was incredible today yeah. he was he was absolutely flying and he uh, he definitely kept the groups away but I think my experience you know just to gamble at times and just know when to press on and stuff like that so the decisive move was getting up the road with Harry, with Fred, with Dan McClay as well. Um, I know he was your teammate, but Ethan was the four man coming into this race. Did you know that you had to do it that way so he perhaps would have to sit back? No, I mean, it was always going to be difficult with just two of us. And I think Ethan, he's, I've, luckily I've worked with him quite a lot this year and I've seen how talented he is and how much of a, an outstanding year that he's had and what a career he's going to have in the future. It was a nice one to to keep this one off his shoulders. I know he had the other two, but, uh, you know, having a teammate like Ethan, who is by far probably the strongest guy in the race, and then my experience, I think we uh, we obviously worked pretty well together. And it was also just, just riding from the front, and once I knew that Ethan was coming across at the end, I could really just play that card. It's like, I'm not going to work because Ethan's come in and yeah, it worked out. And it's all about just committing up that final climb. I couldn't. I knew that Fred was at the side of me and we were just going toe to toe and it was just first to that corner and look like I got it and take the race in line. It was brilliant to watch. You look fantastic in the National Stripes, going to wear it for three years in total. Yeah. And that silver bike, by the way, that's a bit special. Yeah, that's definitely awesome. But just hold up the uh, hold up the cobble as well. This is what you get. Yeah. A, a special Lincoln cobble, a bit like Pyro Bay, probably a bit more special for you. Yeah, I just need to ride with Pyro Bay now, <laughs> the actual proper one. But no, it's, uh, it's good. And actually, quite funny, I went out yesterday with Russ, who's obviously the king of Lincoln. He won it four times, we had a bit of a chat, and his advice must have paid off. Oh, don't, don't let him claim credit <laughs> for this. It was all a you. A little bit, a tiny bit. It was bit. all you. Yeah. Ben, congratulations. Thank Good you to see very much. Thanks very much. Nice one. Brilliant stuff. Really lovely insight there from Ben Swift. So there's confirmation. Read through the top. To Ben Swift is your national champion riding for the team in Ineos Grenadiers. Fred Wright, second of Bahrain, victorious. Ethan Hayter rounding out the podium okay, there. So also from uh, Team Ineos. Then we have fourth, the Harry Tanfield of Quebec and Next Hash. Lewis Askey in fifth for Equipe Cyclist Continental Group Palmer F. Dijeux. Alexander Richardson, very solid ride by him in sixth for Alps and Phoenix. Dan McClay, seventh for Arkea Samzik. Leo Hayter, eighth for Development Team DSM. James Shaw, the first home from Ribble Worldsite Pro Cycling Team. 
and rounding out the top ten, having a cracking day out, Sam Watson of Team Inspired. Adam, last words from you before we uh, before we roll off. It's been a, a wonderful few days racing, capped off by uh, two great races, and the final race was one of the best male performances I think we've ever seen in the Lincoln Grand Prix. Nothing short of spectacular. Nothing short of spectacular as well, and a very, very worthy winner, a brilliant race to commentate on. So thank you very much, Matt. It's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. Thanks to all of you for listening. Thanks to Hannah Walker for commentating with me earlier on. But we will leave you with these wonderful images from Lincoln, and hopefully we'll see you next year. But for now, from me, Matt Stevens, and from Adam Blythe in Lincoln, it's goodbye and take care.